I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations, the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Order, would members please take their places? Order. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And on indulgence, uh, last Tuesday when the House came together, we spent our first moments talking about the loss of Brett Wood. Today, unfortunately, just a week later, we need to mark the fact that overnight we have lost two more of our defence personnel in Afghanistan. At this stage, their names haven't been released to the public. Uh, that is in accord with the wishes of their families. So at the appropriate time when their names are known, of course, we will have a condolence motion which honours them in full and honours the details of their service to the Australian nation. What we can say today, Mr Speaker, is that one man, an Australian Army officer, aged 27, lost his life when the helicopter he was in crashed. Five others were injured in that crash. They are in a satisfactory condition. He was not the pilot at the time, but he was a pilot, and he had been deployed in East Timor and also on Queensland Operation Flood Assist during the course of our very devastating summer when the work of the helicopters was just so important to Queensland communities in search and rescue, in evacuations and in ferrying supplies around. The second young man who lost his life lost it in a separate incident. He was 25 years old. He was at one of our forward patrol bases in the Chora Valley. He was on guard duty. He was there with an Afghan National Army soldier. And whilst the details are still not clear, it appears that the Afghan National Army soldier uh, shot and wounded the Australian soldier. And despite very prompt medical attention, he died from those wounds. The Afghan National Army soldier fled the scene and of course all steps are being taken to apprehend him and the incident will be fully investigated. I understand that many Australians hearing the details of the incident which are available to date would feel a sense of puzzlement about why something like this would happen, would be asking themselves, well, given we're there to help, what explains this, that an Afghan National Army soldier would shoot and kill an Australian soldier? I think many in our community probably feel a sense of anger as they hear this news. Uh, as people go through those uh, emotions, what I would say to the Australian community 
is we do need to fully investigate this incident before we draw conclusions and before we start speculating about what this means for the circumstances of our deployment in Afghanistan. But Mr Speaker, if I could conclude by saying the following two things. First and foremost today, whatever details we learn about the helicopter crash or about this shooting in the future, first and foremost today, our minds are on the two Australian families who have been required to face up to this news overnight and in the early hours of this morning. Uh, they are bearing a huge burden and all of our thoughts and all of our good wishes are with them. Secondly, Mr Speaker, whilst I understand on hard days like this one, the Australian community does uh, question uh, our involvement in Afghanistan. I think that's very natural and very understandable too. Uh, to Australian community members who are asking themselves that question, it is in our nation's interest to continue our deployment in Afghanistan, to see our mission through, to make sure that Afghanistan does not again become a safe haven for terrorist training. If we were to leave a vacuum there in the security circumstances, we know who would fill it, Mr Speaker, and it would be terrorists from around the world. So we do need to see our mission through. But today, of course, the burden of the cost uh, lies on our shoulders and the shoulders of the Australian nation. But first and foremost, it lies on the hearts of the families <coughs> who are grieving today, and our thoughts are with them. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I uh, rise to uh, support the remarks of the Prime Minister. On behalf of the uh, coalition, I offer condolences to uh, the families of the soldiers who have been killed, and uh, I express the coalition's uh, continuing support for the mission on which those soldiers were engaged. Um, as the Prime Minister said, uh, there will be a time to consider the circumstances uh, under which uh, these deaths uh, have taken place to draw the appropriate conclusions, but I think there are uh, two observations that are worth making at this point in time. Uh, first, Mr Speaker, there is no such thing as uh, casualty-free combat, uh, and regrettably, as long as our, our, our soldiers are in Afghanistan, uh, there will be uh, sad moments for our country uh, and sad moments, uh, obviously, for this parliament. Second point to make, Mr Speaker, is that uh, serious countries don't slip out from under their responsibilities, no matter how hard those responsibilities become. Our soldiers should not stay in Afghanistan a moment longer than is absolutely necessary, but it is necessary that they stay while there is a vital task that only they can perform. Order. As a mark of respect, I invite members to rise in their places. I thank the House. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I inform the House that the Assistant Treasurer will be absent from question time today as he is unwell. The Treasurer will answer questions on his behalf. Order. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, this question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer the Prime Minister to the latest version of the Garno report, in particular uh, page 17, where this statement is made. Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost of a carbon price. Let me repeat that, Mr Speaker. Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost of a carbon price. So I ask the Prime Minister how can she continue to maintain that her tax only makes big polluters pay? Yeah. The Prime Minister. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his reference to the Garno review, which Professor Garno gave me earlier today and about which he has been speaking at the National Press Club. I have the review in my hand. It's the product of seven months' work, and I think we should thank Order. Professor Garno for Order. it as an Australian parliament and as an Australian nation. I don't anticipate that Order. everybody will agree with every view put forward by Professor Garno, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't stop us actually uh, that shouldn't stop us actually thanking him uh, for his work and respecting him in his professionalism in doing it. Uh, now, in answer Order. to the Leader of the Opposition's question, uh, given he's talked about the question of cost, uh, yes, Professor Garno makes some observations about costs. There's one on page 77 of this report, and it uses the terminology direct action, as the Leader of the Opposition would use to refer to Order. his... Uh, refer to his policy. Uh, I would refer Order. to it as a policy in which polluters are subsidised. But Professor Garno says this, using direct action measures to achieve similar amount of emissions reduction would raise costs. Order. The Leader Order. of the Opposition may the be member interested for in these words. Would raise costs much more than carbon price but would not raise the revenue Order to offset the, or reduce the costs the in Prime any Minister of these will ways. Resume her place. Order. 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 The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition's question couldn't have been more specific. It quoted a sentence from the Garneau Review and it asked the Prime Minister how she could continue to maintain that only the biggest polluters would pay. After quoting from the Garneau Review, the Prime Minister is not even attempting order. to answer that question. I ask order. you to bring the her back to the question. The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. At the time the member approached the dispatch box, the Prime Minister was relating a further reference in the report to carbon pricing. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And you, uh, my, my point is basically this, that if you want to look at the Garneau review, then you should look at all of it. And what he does say, what he does Order. say about the measures Order. proposed by the Leader Order. of the Opposition is that they would raise costs much more than a carbon price, but would not raise the revenue to offset or reduce the cost in any of these ways. The costs might be covered by budgetary expenditure, but this affects who pays the costs, not whether the costs are there. Order. Other people's taxes have to rise to pay Order for expenditures for under direct action. So, Mr Speaker, what Professor Garno is putting there and what is a clear contrast between the policy the government stands for and the, the Leader of the Braden. Opposition's policy is we are putting the a member for price Sturt is on warned. carbon that big polluters would pay. The member we are for putting Braden a price on carbon that big polluters would pay. We've always been clear about that. Big polluters would pay the price member and for by paying that price they would have the incentives they need to act to reduce the carbon pollution that they emit. We have also been very clear with Australian families, and I said this when I first outlined the carbon pricing mechanism to the Australian community, that there will be price impacts that flow through to Australian households. And that's why we will use uh, the majority of the revenue raised from pricing carbon to assist Australian households with those uh, impacts to generously assist Australian families who need that assistance the most. And we will use the remainder of the revenue to protect Australian jobs and to fund programs which help our move to being a clean energy economy. As Professor Garno says, the Leader of the Opposition's plan is about putting costs directly onto the shoulders of Australian taxpayers, that is, onto the shoulders of Australian families, without any compensation at all. The 
Leader of the Opposition on a supplementary. Again, again, again to the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker. I mean, before the election, the Prime Minister said that there would be no carbon tax under the government I lead, and we know that that's wrong. Uh, now she says uh, that only the big polluters will pay, and we know Order. that's wrong because. The... Order. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Order. The Leader of the House on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question has to be just that a question. Order. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. The Leader of the Opposition. Order. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister was deceptive before the election. She said just a moment ago in her answer. She said just a moment ago in order. her answer that only. The big polluters will pay, but we have here on page 17 of the Gardner report the Australian households leader of the opposition will resume his seat. Order! Why are they so embarrassed about this question? Order! Order! The leader of the house will resume his seat. The Leader of the House on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It goes to standing orders and the standing order that requires no argument. We have had 36 seconds from the Leader of the Opposition and not a resemblance, not a resemblance. If we want, if we want to have the suspension of standing orders that we get every day at 10 to 3, order. so he can talk the for 10 leader minutes, of the House he should do so. Of order. But the question order. is out of order. Order! English expression may not have been my best subject at school, but it is true that there has not been yet a question mark. But the Leader of the Opposition has the call. It is an extremely long preamble, but he has the call. Order. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Given that the Prime Minister has been caught out yet again, this time by her own report, how can anyone believe anything that this Prime Minister says? Order. 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 The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And can I say to the Leader of the Opposition, just because you bellow things doesn't make them right. And once again, here we have the Leader of the Opposition deliberately, deliberately uh, not telling the truth to the Australian community. He's just, said, he's just said to me, your report. Order. The Prime Minister will resume her place. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. And the Prime Minister should withdraw the imputation against the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker. The order. 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 The expression used was an expression that's been allowed, and I simply say that I would hope that this exchange, both the question and the answer, is the end of the overly used debate in both questions and answers. As I've said before, the simplest matter that the House could do is to change the standing order so that there is no debate allowed in both questions and the answer. Having allowed the debate in the question, I've indicated before that that opens the door. The Prime Minister will now respond.
The Manager of Opposition Business on a further point of order. Mr Speaker, the phrase used by the Prime Minister is one that I and the member for Indi were only asked to withdraw just last, I think it was last Thursday, uh, and I'd ask you to ask the Prime Minister to withdraw because accusing somebody of deliberately not telling the truth is the same as accusing someone of being a liar. And I'd ask you to withdraw ask her to withdraw it. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. I am not I am not I have given my ruling. Order. Order. The member for Bennelong may be a newcomer, but he should be very careful, very careful in reflecting by way of interjection. Order. 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 The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And my very simple point was in his question to me, the Leader of the Opposition referred to this as my report. It is not my report. It is Professor Garno's report, and I believe he deserves the respect that should be shown to an expert who has acted, I believe, in the interests of the Australian nation by spending a very concentrated period putting this work together, and it is very good work. And I would recommend reading it to people who are interested in tackling climate change and interested in the facts about how we address climate change in this nation. But this is Professor Garno's report. We are a government that is always happy to accept and see the advice of experts. Then when you look at the advice of experts, you absorb it and you respond to it. Now I know actually seriously working through an issue is not the opposition's strong suit. But I do recommend to them that they seriously work through Professor Garno's report. And what they will find when they work through Professor Garno's report is it very, very clearly makes the case, as an economist, that the most efficient way of dealing with cutting carbon pollution is to put a price on carbon. And for people who say they are concerned about cost of living pressures on Australian families, this report very clearly makes the point that if you go down a different road, particularly the road that the Leader of the Opposition refers to as direct action but which is really about subsidising polluters, that that is a more costly road to go down. So if you care about the cost of living circumstances of Australians, you would reject that costly path and you would accept the advice of Professor Garno and many other economic experts that the cheapest way of cutting carbon pollution is to put a price on carbon. And clearly the member for Wentworth could assist the opposition in understanding that proposition. So it is the government's intention, as I have outlined time oh, and time before in this House, I've outlined again today and I am happy to outline further. Our intention <laughs> is to put a price on carbon from the 1st of July next year. That price on carbon will be paid by big polluters. Because they now have a price on carbon, they will innovate and they will change the way they work to create less carbon pollution. We will take a section of that revenue and assist Australian households. What that means is big polluters pay and Australian households get the assistance. The Leader of the Opposition's plan is to take more tax off Order. Australian families and give it to the big polluters in a plan we know will not work, courtesy of the words of the member for Wentworth. So I'd say to the Leader of the Opposition, rather than the fear campaign, rather than the cheap political points, actually read all of it think about it, move away from this path of negativity and actually try and make a contribution to this debate. Before calling the member for Robinson, I acknowledge 
that we have in the gallery the Honourable Jim Lloyd, a former member for Robinson <laughs> and a former minister for local government territories and roads. Order. So, I, I'm not the author of the timing, but anyway, the member for Robertson has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on the government's efforts to undertake vital reform in tackling climate change and delivering the national broadband network? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Robertson Order. for her question, Order. and I thank the member for Robertson for her high-quality advocacy of the needs and interests of her constituents in this Parliament. Now, the uh, member has has uh, directed to me a question which raises two important reform areas to keep our economy strong. We want Australians to have the benefits of a strong economy. We particularly want Australians to have the benefits of being able to get a job, which is why we are proud that 750,000 jobs have been created since the government was first elected, and we look forward to the creation of half a million more over the next couple of years. But keeping your economy strong always requires you to have a continuing reform agenda to keep walking the reform road. And we are engaged in reforms which are important to keeping our economy strong. Putting a price on carbon is important to keeping our economy strong and ensuring that we have got the clean energy jobs of the future. Last week I received the report of the Climate Commission, the critical decade. It said unambiguously the science was in. Today I received the report of Professor Garno, and he says in Member his Patangi. report unambiguously that pricing carbon is an economic reform where the benefits far outweigh the costs. He tells us a fixed price followed by a carbon trading scheme is the best path forward to reduce the dangers of climate change without damaging the, the prosperity of the Australian nation. He talks about how pricing carbon is the lowest cost way of tackling climate change and dealing with carbon pollution. Now, I know that those opposite dispute the science. They don't believe in climate change. I know they refuse to look at, in a serious way, the works of serious economists like Professor Garno, but that is what he finds. Then, of course, continuing to keep our economy strong also means we need to have access to the infrastructure that our competitor nations will have, and that is national broadband. That is national broadband that enables us to move information at the same speed that people are moving it in economies with which we compete. The construction of the NBN is only the first step in that reform journey to make sure that we have the productivity benefits that come with this new technology. That's why today the government released the Digital Economy Plan. It's a roadmap of how we'll build the digital economy, and a key part of it is how we will aim to be one of the top five OECD nations for the use and take-up of broadband by 2020. It also has important measures so that we will support small businesses and not-for-profit organisations in the first 40 communities to fully utilise the opportunities that the NBN brings. And we will also be investing in education to make sure that students, whether they be in schools or TAFEs or universities, have the full benefit of the national broadband network. In all of these reforms, whether it's climate change or the NBN, we'll focus on the facts, Mr Speaker. We won't allow ourselves to be distracted by the diversions, and we will always act in the national interest. Order, the member for North Sydney. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his own economic note of three days ago where he said, and I quote, only the biggest polluters, less than 1,000, will pay for the pollution they emit. Does the Treasurer agree with the Prime Minister that Ross Garno is, quote, a serious economist, and therefore does he agree with Professor Garno, who just said, and I quote, 
Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost of a carbon price. The order. Order. The question has been asked. Order. 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 The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think Mr. Garno has produced an excellent report, and of course, it is the policy of uh, this side of the house that the biggest polluters will pay the price on carbon, Mr. Order. Speaker. And of course, Order. we'll use every cent from that price paid Member to assist Gold, households please. and to assist industry, Mr. Speaker. And there couldn't be a clearer contrast with the other side. The other side, the other side, want to tax households to pay big polluters. That's the policy on that side of the house, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the authority for that is not Professor Garno; it's the member for Wentworth. The member for Wentworth, in his interview uh, last week, made the point that a direct action policy such as they have the is the policy you have when you're not serious about dealing seat. with climate. The Treasurer, resume his seat. The order. Order. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Treasurer has asked whether he agreed with either Professor Garno or the Prime Minister's statement that only the big polluters will pay. He wasn't asked anything about any member of the opposition, and I'd ask you to draw him back to the very straightforward question he was asked. Order. The Treasurer will directly relate the material he is using to the question. The Treasurer. Yes, Mr Speaker. Well, the government has a policy of a market-based mechanism. It's the most efficient mechanism. It's Order. the least cost mechanism. Order. And those on Order. the other side of the House, those Order. on the other side those of the House, those on my Speaker. left. Order. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Order. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, I know why they are so embarrassed, because the shadow treasurer used to have a policy for a market-based mechanism as well. He used to support the member for Wentworth on a market-based mechanism. The treasurer mechanism. returned to the question. Of course, question. we know when he changed his mind, it's when he put it on Order. Twitter and asked everybody to tell him Order. what his the convictions were, Mr Sydney. Speaker. Mr Speaker, so that we on this side of the House do support a market-based mechanism. A market-based mechanism, Order. Mr Speaker. Which will the price carbon of the for the 1,000 largest polluters and use the revenue to assist households. What they want to do is to increase the tax on average taxpayers and give the money to the biggest polluters, Mr. Speaker. We have not seen a serious policy from those on that side of the house in three and a half years, Mr. Speaker. Order. And the shadow treasurer. The Shadow the Treasurer, Treasurer will last year his put forward a proposal which Order. was found to have the biggest costing bundle Order. seen in political history. If the member for North be Sydney would just be quiet, he house. would have learnt that I asked the Treasurer to return to the question. But he is so noisy that he can't even hear anything else. The Treasurer will directly relate his remarks to the question, and those on my left will sit in silence. Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, those on that side of the House are so bereft of policy, there's nothing left for them to do but Order. to run baseless Order. scare campaigns, Mr Speaker, and that's what they're Order doing, the treasurer. question after treasurer. question. The member for Morton. Order. The member for Morton has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Will the minister update the House on the government's receipt of Professor Garno's update of his climate change review? How has the update been received, and what is the government's view? The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the uh, member for Morton for his question. And as the House has heard, of course, uh, Mr. Speaker, Professor Garno has today released his uh, final update into his study into climate change and how the government and the country should best respond to this important challenge. And Mr Speaker, Professor Garno's update makes it absolutely clear that climate change is occurring, that it's caused by human activity, and that it poses a serious risk to the prosperity and quality of life of all Australians. And for the benefit of the member for Tangney, 
he states the following in his report. Since 2008, advances in climate change science have broadly confirmed that the earth is warming, that human activity is the cause of it, and that the changes in the physical world are likely, if anything, to be more harmful than the earlier science had suggested. Now, of course, the quality of the contribution from the member for Tangney, of course, made last week in suggesting that there had been no warming in the last decade, despite the empirical evidence being emphatic that it was the warmest decade on record, is testament to the control of those opposite by the climate science deniers. And of course, we know the influence that Senator Order. Minchin has over the Leader of the Opposition in this respect. The views that Senator Garno has expressed on the climate science is based on expert oh. advice. It is consistent with advice received by the government from sources including the CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, the Climate Commission and the Australian Academy of Science. And any government taking its public policy responsibility seriously to act in the national interest must respond to this challenge. Mr Speaker, it will also come no surprise to the House, I think, or to economists generally, that anyone wanting to act on climate change, uh, that Professor Garneau's proposed solution to this challenge is a carbon price, of course, delivered through a market mechanism. Uh, in his words in the report, he says the following. Market-based approaches to mitigation can bring out the best in Australians and a return Order. to regulatory approaches the worst. And furthermore, Professor Garno had the following to say about the coalition's subsidies for polluters policy in his speech to the National Press Club today. He said the following. Direct action for reducing carbon emissions is likely to be immensely more expensive than a market approach. And in fact, went on to make the obvious, obvious observation about a subsidies policy, Order. that it is in the worst traditions of old protectionism, subsidies and anti-market philosophy. And that's exactly where the Leader of the Opposition sits. Subsidies for the big polluters, no revenue to assist households with the slug on taxes that they will be hit with. And of course, this is not a view that is that is shared by all of those who are associated with the Liberal Party. We know what the views of the member for Wentworth and many others are on the other side of the House. But we know too that former Prime Minister John Howard understands and respects the science, that he understands and respects the need for a market for mechanism, having taken a emissions trading scheme to the member election in 2007. We heard from Dr John Hewson yesterday. We heard from Dr Hewson that a market mechanism is the best position. We heard from Malcolm Fraser supporting a market mechanism to tackle this problem. You are lacking in the necessary responsibility as a public, holding a public political leadership position over this. It is time that the opposition and the leader of the opposition took this issue seriously and made a serious contribution and an effort Order. to this debate. Minister's time has expired. Order. 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 The member for Tangney. Order. Member for Melbourne Port. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer, refer her to page 77 of Professor Garneau's latest report, which says, and I quote, and I hope she listens carefully to this, every dollar of revenue from carbon pricing is collected from people. In the end, mostly households, ordinary Australians. Most of the costs will eventually be passed on to ordinary Australians. That's the quote from Professor Garneau. So I ask the Prime Minister, how can Order. she maintain Order. the pretense Order. How can she possibly Order. maintain the pretense that only a thousand big polluters will pay her toxic tax? Order. Order. Prime Minister has the call. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have the page of the Garno report that the leader of the opposition refers to, and it won't surprise anyone in this parliament to know that he is misrepresenting no. the force of oh, Professor again. Garno's words. Again. Misrepresenting the force of Professor Garno's words. Uh, when Order. you read these Order words, the when you read these words, try to understand them and digest them and think about them in the national interest, rather than trying to clip a few out to use for a petty political agenda. What you actually find when you read Professor Garno's words is this and this very clearly. Professor Garno, Professor Garno the is there uh, contrasting and comparing the costs for Australian households of two ways of pricing carbon. The way that the government is talking about by putting a price on carbon which businesses pay, or the way that the Leader of the Opposition is talking about through regulatory mechanisms. He is comparing and contrasting those two approaches. And he very, very clearly concludes the Leader of the Opposition can't rely on one sentence in this document and not use the force of every other sentence. He very, very clearly concludes that the mechanism the Leader of the Opposition is advocating is more costly for Australian households. So let me, uh, let me read, let me read the Order. quote. Using Order. direct action measures to achieve a similar amount of emissions reduction would Order. raise costs the much Prime more Minister than will carbon pricing. Resume her seat. The Prime Minister will resume her seat. Prime Minister. Order. Order the member for Morton. Order. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. It was a very simple question about who pays, big polluters or households. Order. And the truth is, it's order households. The of the That's the point. Will resume and she should be his directly seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Order. Having made his point of order, he then cannot proceed to debate. The Prime Minister is responding to the question, the Prime Minister. Thank you very much. And I refer to the section of the report that the Leader of the Opposition referred to, to ensure that rather than having it misrepresented in this place, people understand what Professor Garno is putting here. And what he puts very clearly, these are his exact words, using direct action measures to achieve a similar amount of emissions reduction Order. would raise costs much more than carbon pricing, but would not, but would Order. not raise the Order. revenue to offset or reduce Order. the costs in any of these ways. Order. The costs might be covered by budgetary expenditure, but this affects, affects who pays the costs, not whether the costs are there. Other people's taxes have to rise to pay for expenditures under direct action. Well, who are those other Order. people whose taxes Order. have to rise? Order. Well, they're probably better known to the Australian Order. community Order. as mums and dads with jobs who would need to pay the taxes that the opposition leader would need, the increased taxes he would need, in order to subsidise big polluters. What we have said consistently, and Professor Garno makes this point too, what we have said consistently is you put a price on carbon pollution. Big polluters pay that price. We've always been very clear indeed that there would be some price impacts, which is why we take revenue from pricing carbon and we generously assist households who need it the most. And I've said that many, many times before. The Leader of the Opposition may only have just heard it. A generously assist households who would need Order. that assistance the most. Member so the difference, here, the difference here is more tax for Australian families, no assistance, compared with a price on the biggest polluters and using that money to assist households. I suggest the Leader of the Opposition, instead of looking at the occasional word in Professor Garno's report, reads the whole lot. Order. The order. Order. The member for Morton yet again. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. Yes, Mr Speaker. Yesterday the Prime Minister said this price wouldn't Order. be paid by households. What? It would be paid what by the thousand the biggest businesses. What is the Leader of the Opposition asking? I seek leave 
I seek leave to table this document, which shows that the leave Prime Minister is, leave is not deceiving leave this is House. Not granted. Order. 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 Before giving the call to the member for Kennedy, I inform members that we have in the gallery this afternoon, Mr. Sergeant Day Ajavid, my apologies, Sergeant, the Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Minister for Further Education, Skills and Lifelong Learning in the UK and the MP for Bromsgrove. He is a guest here under the Special Visitors Program, and on behalf of members, I extend to him a very warm welcome. The member for Kennedy. Question without notice to Minister Burke. Could the minister assure the House of a more humane processing in the three South East Asian Meatworks media targeted yesterday? Could the minister further assure the House that we are not going to impose our religious beliefs and values on our neighbours? Is the minister aware that an estimated one third of Indonesia goes to bed hungry every night? That these people are not allowed to fish in our waters nor prawn farm our empty land? And since an ox processed in Australia costs $7,500, precluding purchase by any Indonesian. In light of this minister, wouldn't they be entitled to say, fair go, mate? Could the minister advise, since it will no longer pay to provide water and feed how our nature lovers intend to deal with cattle now dying, could the minister finally advise the House parading, these people parading as nature lovers to watch the order, worldwide nature program, National order, Geographic, as advertisement one of an animal ripping another to pieces? expired. <clears throat> Having, having, having given himself extra time by referring to the minister as Minister Burke, I give the call to the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities. But the minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Kennedy for the question uh, in my capacity here representing the Minister for Agriculture. Uh, I do appreciate the, the perspective and the concerns of the electorate of Kennedy uh, when anything relates to the live export industry. Uh, I've been with the member, f I, I've been the with the member for Kennedy, Kennedy uh, in Normanton and Cloncurry and met with uh, some, of the, some of the graziers and pastoralists there. Uh, it's a similar story across much of the north of Australia, going across through uh, the Northern Territory and into Western Australia. Uh, there are a large number of jobs, family businesses and Indigenous employment operations which are underpinned by very large pastoralist industries. It is also true that the, the reason that this debate has taken off in such a way uh, over the last 24 hours is the footage that was on television last night was just awful. Uh, and I felt that watching it. I'm sure every Australian felt that, and I'm sure every farmer felt that as well. Uh, I note the comments that have been made by the New South Wales Farmers Association already about the distress that many of them have felt, many of their members have felt, in seeing their own stock treated in the way that we saw at a number of establishments last night. The footage was only made available to the Minister for Agriculture shortly before that program went to air. In that time, a number of actions have been taken, and shortly before we went to question time, the Minister for Agriculture provided a detailed media conference where, where he went through the gravity of uh, what had been cited and also of the specific actions which he had already undertaken and the further actions which he has left the way open for. Uh, suffice to say that the establishments that have been involved and have been cited in that footage, those specific establishments, Australian farmers do expect that their stock will be treated better than that. The Australian people expect that animals originating from Australia will be treated better than that. And the actions taken thus far by the minister have centred on those specific establishments. The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. I refer him again to the words of Professor Garner in his report when he says, and I quote, in the long run, households will pay almost the entire carbon price as businesses pass carbon costs through 
to the users of their products. Will the Treasurer now admit that he has misled the Australian people just last Sunday when he said, and I quote, only the biggest polluters, less than 1,000, will pay for the pollution they emit? The order, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Yes, uh, Mr Speaker, what we've got is yet another example of just how shallow the shadow Treasurer is. Hey, by the day, he gets more hollow, Mr Speaker. We have been very clear about what we are doing in pricing carbon, Mr Speaker. And of course, the price is paid by the 1,000 largest producers, Mr Speaker. And of course, there will be price impacts, and that is why we have said every single cent, every single cent will go to households and will go to industries and will go to programs to drive renewable energy, Order. Mr Speaker. Every single cent will go in that direction. But of course, Mr Speaker, there is no credibility left on that side of the House, not when it comes to the Shadow Treasurer and, of course, not when it goes to the Leader of the Opposition. The Shadow Treasurer was once a believer in a price on carbon, but his situation has got so bad he now has to write performance appraisals for the Financial Review, Mr Speaker, saying how good he is because he's become a hollow man, Mr Speaker. There is no alternative the policy on that side of the House, response directly Mr. to the Speaker. question. What they do have is a policy they call direct action. And of course what that policy does is that it taxes consumers, it taxes households and gives the benefits to the biggest polluters, Mr Order. Speaker. The that's what Treasurer it does. Resume and that's his what place. So Treasurer, Treasurer resume his place. The member for North Sydney on a point of order. Again, Mr Speaker, it goes to relevance. The Treasurer was asked a simple question about his own words versus those of Professor Garner, not anything else. Order. The member for North Sydney yeah. resume his place. I've indicated that I would desire the Treasurer to relate his material to the question. And, oh, the Treasurer has finished. The member for Page. Order! 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 The member for Page. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities. Will the Minister please inform the House of the Government's response to recent reports of the appalling treatment of animals in abattoirs in Indonesia? Yeah. The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Page for the question. Uh, and acknowledge in similar terms to the job opportunities that I referred to across the north of Australia, uh, there are many members uh, on, on this side of the chamber and some, some over there as well with very significant meatworks within their electorates who are very conscious of wanting to make sure that we maximise opportunities for the processing and downstream processing jobs in Australia as well as the animal welfare concerns which were aired last night. Uh, and the member for Page has been pursuing these issues uh, very strongly for quite some time. As I said a moment ago, anyone who saw that footage last night uh, would have been horrified. The footage was just awful, and Australian farmers have been quite distressed by it as well. Shortly before question time, uh, Minister Ludwig, the Minister for Agriculture, put forward the initial response uh, on behalf of the government. As I say, he was presented with this footage shortly before the program went to air, uh, but shortly before question time was able to go through the responses which the Australian people would expect we would have to what has been presented overnight. First of all, to ask the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry to conduct an immediate investigation into the specifics of the footage. Next to announce that the government will appoint an independent reviewer to investigate the complete supply chain for live exports up to and including the point of slaughter. Next, to ask for himself to receive a briefing on the full range of legislative and regulatory options which are available to respond to issues concerned with animal welfare. In the interim, Minister Ludwig has asked for orders to enforce 
the suspension of live animal exports to the facilities which were identified uh, by the evidence which was broadcast last night. The minister will also add further facilities to the banned list in the future if required. He's implemented a moratorium on the installation of the restraint boxes that were seen being used in the footage. This will apply to the instalment of any new boxes with Commonwealth funds across all global markets. He's also asked the Chief Veterinary Office, Officer, the Chief Vet, to coordinate an independent scientific assessment of the restraint boxes which are under use in Indonesia. Following the completion of this work, the government will consider what further actions may be necessary. The government does share the legitimate concerns of the Australian community about animal welfare abuses and, and is taking the necessary action to investigate the, the footage. I thank the member for Page for raising the issue. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer confirm that under Professor Garneau's proposal, compensation for business will reduce from 35 per cent to 20 per cent over 10 years? How does the Treasurer expect struggling manufacturers to survive against overseas competitors who don't pay a carbon tax when the government is almost halving compensation Order. for Australian businesses? Order. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Well, Order. Order. The Treasurer has the call. It sounds like the member for Curtin wants to make a comeback as the shadow Treasurer, Mr Speaker. The treasurer. Treasurer. But anyway. Order. Order. Minister. Minister for Regents. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, as, um, as the Prime Minister has indicated, as the Minister for Climate Change has said, we think this is a very good report from Professor Garno. And it's a very important report, so there can be a thorough community debate about dealing with dangerous climate change Mem and its Member impact not just on our environment, but on our economy. And of course, it's a serious piece of work. And it's a serious piece of work which feeds into the work that the government is doing with the multi-party committee, with the business community and, of course, with the wider community. So we will take that on board as we go through developing the emissions trading scheme, Mr Speaker, based on the principles that have already been announced by Order. the Prime Minister and the Minister for Climate Change. But, of course, what we've got in here today is the pretense that somehow, somehow the government has already taken all those decisions. Well, we haven't. And what they want to do is to go out there and run a scare campaign. And why are they running a scare campaign? Because they're so acutely embarrassed about their lack of policy, Mr Speaker. There's no economic policy. They've been coming into this House calling for an election, despite the fact that their election policy from last year had a $10 billion hold in it, Mr Speaker. Treasurer, resume his seat. Order the Treasurer. Order. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I asked about struggling manufacturers who have to compete against overseas competitors who don't pay a carbon tax when the government has been advised to halve the compensation, almost halve the compensation to business over 10 years. Order. I asked the Treasurer to order. answer the, that question. The yeah. Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. Order! 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 Order the Leader of the Opposition. Order the Treasurer has not got the call. Treasurer! 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 Order! Order! Both the Treasurer and the Leader of the Opposition. Order the Member for Goldstein. Order the, the Treasurer can resume his seat whilst the House comes to order. Order the Leader of the Opposition, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Order, well, I'm happy to wait. Who, was that somebody inviting me to send them off? Um, the Treasurer has the call and he understands the requirements that he has to keep in mind in making his response. He's responding, the Treasurer. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, we take our responsibilities on this side of the House very seriously, <laughs> unlike those Order. opposite, Mr. Speaker. And we are going in a methodical way about producing a policy which deals with dangerous climate change and protects our economy for the future. Unlike those opposite, unlike those opposite who simply want to tax Australian families and hand the money Order. to large polluters, Mr. Speaker. Order. We've got a serious policy process in Order. train for the benefit Treasurer. of the country, Mr Speaker, and we're Treasurer. proud of what we're doing, Order. unlike those opposite who can only run a cheap scare campaign. The member for Greenway. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Given today is World No Tobacco Day, what support is the government receiving in its efforts to implement anti-tobacco measures, such as introducing plain packaging and reducing tobacco company influences? And what is the government's response? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Greenway for her question. People might have uh, heard the member for Greenway this morning talking about her earlier habit as a young woman, smoking and choosing the packet that was the most glamorous one, uh, and the fact that she's been able to quit that habit and now is supporting the introduction of plain packaging, a world first. Uh, I think on World No Tobacco Day, it's an appropriate time to congratulate all of those campaigners who for years and years have been calling on governments to take this action. And I'm very proud to be part of a government that is taking this action. And I want to congratulate the Leader of the Opposition. I know he doesn't normally like listening to me here at the dispatch box, uh, but, but, this, but this might be an occasion where he wants to. Order. Because I'd like to congratulate the Leader of the Opposition for finally declaring that he's going to do the right thing and that the Liberal Party will support this measure when it comes into the Parliament. But even more importantly, I want to congratulate the member for Moore, the member for Hasluck. I want to congratulate the member for Fairfax. There were many members on the Liberal Party backbench who finally brought the Leader of the Opposition to this position. It was against his instincts. His instincts are to say no. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it, but he has been forced to do it by the weight of evidence Order. that this is the right thing to do. The so member I am for pleased Cowan. that the Leader of the Opposition the has decided Bowman. to support this measure, and I want to congratulate him for Order. that. I do think on World No Tobacco Day there is a remaining habit that he needs to kick, and that is a habit that goes to the receipt of tobacco donations. Because I need to be able to, uh, I need to, be able to tell the House... Order! The House will come to order. The Minister for Health has the call. I want Minister. to report to the House that the uh, AMA last week. Order, presented... those on my left. Order. The... Order, the member for Chifley. Order. The Minister has the call. She should be heard in silence. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I wanted to report to the House that uh, on Friday last week the AMA presented its tobacco awards. And, uh, I'm pleased that our government was the recipient of one of those awards, but another government was the recipient. We shared the AMA award for tackling tobacco. And I want to uh, tell you that the AMA presented an award to a state government for their actions. And I want to give you a quote. And this quote says, I do not support receiving donations from tobacco companies. That's the position we had at the last state election, and it is the position we will maintain. Now, these comments from the West Australian Liberal Premier, Colin Barnett, earned him the award from the AMA for resisting the influences of big tobacco who are donating in large amounts to the Liberal and National Party. Far from being uh, embarrassed about this, the Leader of the Opposition went on television last week and said not only were people welcome to donate to the Liberal Party, but he would invite them to donate more. It seems that British American Tobacco giving 97 per cent of their donations to the Liberal Party is not enough, that they want 100 per cent of the donations from British American Tobacco. Obviously, we are delighted that the Liberal Party has seen what is the right thing to do. We want to congratulate the opposition for coming to their senses, and I personally would like to nominate 
British American Tobacco for a Guinness Book of Records award for an own goal. The only reason we've been talking so much about this for the last two weeks is because Mr Crow went out and gave an extraordinary press conference, which ultimately led to the Leader of the Opposition being so embarrassed that he's changed his position. The member for Macquarie. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer confirm that under Professor Garno's, Professor Garno's proposal, a typical single income family with two or three children and with one, one partner earning $80,000 per annum will get no compensation for the government's carbon tax? Order. 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 The House will come to order. The, that includes the Minister for Regions. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer, has I the I thank call. the member for Macquarie for that question because what she has said is entirely baseless. Entirely That'd baseless, be right. Mr. Speaker, because we have not completed the design of the scheme. So it's a continuation of the scare campaign that we're seeing from those opposite, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, they've been fond of uh, quoting Professor Garno, so I would just like to quote from page 77 of the report when he talks about the opposition's so called direct action option. He says this, other people's taxes have to rise to pay for expenditures under direct <coughs> action. In the long run, households will pay almost the entire carbon price as businesses pass carbon costs through to the users of their products. That's Mr Garner. Oh, the Mr. Garner's Treasurer of their so -called The Treasurer resume his seat. Has the Treasurer concluded? Order! Order! The House will come to order. The member for Blair. Thank you, Deputy Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House in today's balance of payment numbers and what they mean for the economic outlook? The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Blair for this very important question because. Today's balance of payments figures do show the very dramatic impact on both the economy and, of course, our exports of recent natural disasters, particularly in Queensland. It's appropriate that that question is asked by the member for Blair, and there are plenty of members on this side of the House whose communities were dramatically impacted, uh, not just the economic impact but the social impact, and, of course, many over there on the other side of the House in Queensland who felt the full brunt not just of the floods in Queensland, but also the impact of Cyclone Yazi in far north Queensland, but also the impact of the rains in Western Australia, in the northwest, and of course the bushfires in Victoria. So this was a traumatic time and a dramatic time uh, in our economy. Now the March quarter balance of payments show a sharp fall in export volumes in the first three months of this year. Export volumes fell by 8.7 per cent in the March quarter. This is the biggest quarterly fall in export, in export volumes in 37 years. This contributed to a widening in the current account deficit of $2.3 billion to $10.4 billion, representing 3 per cent of December quarter GDP. Now, of course, it's no surprise after those disasters that the biggest factor behind today's results was a very significant reduction in coal exports. Coal export volumes fell by $4.6 billion in the March quarter, which were down 26.8 per cent on the previous quarter. Now, of course, a large part of this lost coal production did occur in Queensland, with the Minerals Council estimating that 85 per cent of Queensland's coal mines suffered production losses in the quarter, mainly due to flooding. But, of course, there were also significant disruptions, particularly to rail. And of course, as I said before, we had cyclones and heavy rainfall in northwestern Australia earlier this year. Iron ore export volumes were down $1.3 billion, or 7.7 per cent less than the previous quarter. So, of course, the impact of the summer floods and the cyclones and, and the events in Western Australia will take a heavy toll on GDP growth in the March quarter. Overall, Net exports are expected to subtract around 2.4 percentage points from growth in the quarter. 
This is estimated to be the largest quarterly subtraction from GDP growth since records began in 1959. So, Mr Speaker, there has been a dramatic impact on our economy of these natural disasters, and it is somewhat larger than the Treasury initially estimated. But whatever the outcome for the national accounts, the one thing we are absolutely certain of is that the fundamentals of our economy are strong, Mr Speaker. We still have low unemployment at 4.9 per cent, lower than just about every other advanced economy. Strong job creation, over 700,000 jobs created since we came to office, and of course a record terms of trade and an unprecedented pipeline of investment. And that's why it's important to bring the budget back to surplus in 2012-13. That's why it's important to invest in our workforce to build a bigger and better trained workforce. Mr Speaker, this government is absolutely determined to get the, the fundamentals for right for our economy so we can turn our success into a stronger economy for all Australians. The member for Flinders. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Given that Professor Garno advocates an increase in petrol prices for households after year one of the carbon tax, will the Prime Minister rule out a new tax on petrol? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do genuinely thank the Shadow Minister for the opportunity to answer a further question about the Garno review, because I think it's very important for anyone who is watching Question Time today uh, to not fall for the false premises that are behind the opposition's question. Uh, the opposition is uh, mounting its Question Time. Uh, well, I, I, I certainly wouldn't use the word attack. I wouldn't use the word strategy. I must admit the word uh, would really escapes me. What, anyway, whatever this, uh, whatever this kind of shambolic display is, uh, what it's, uh, what it's uh, trying to do. Uh, number one, what the opposition is trying to do is it's trying to say uh, that Professor Garno's review is the government's policy. And uh, it says if the government doesn't agree with that proposition, somehow the government is walking away from Professor Garno. Of course, all of this analysis is a false premise and absolutely absurd, Mr Speaker. So let's be clear Order, about Professor Garno's work. Yes, Professor Garno was asked to update his earlier report. We are a government that thinks public policy is best informed when you invite experts to participate and to put forward their views. Professor Garno has put forward his views and I thank him very much for doing that. But of course the government will make the decisions about the final design of carbon pricing and we will work through the uh, multi-party climate change committee and our usual cabinet processes to do that. Now clearly I understand that those officers don't like Order. the public the policy Prime processes. Minister will resume her place. Order. The member for Flinders on Order. The Mem Minister for Families. The member for Flinders on a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On relevance, the question was whether or not the Prime Minister would rule out a new tax on petrol. Order. Order. The Prime Minister is aware of her responsibility to directly relate her remarks to the question. The Prime Minister. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Prime Minister. Uh, well, I was asked about a matter dealt with in Professor Garno's report, and I am, and I am clarifying Order. Uh, and dealing Order. with that. And I am definitely going to clarify Order. this point because of the game playing we are seeing from Order. the opposition today. Uh, of course, they don't want Australians to have a rational debate about climate change and carbon pricing, because in the face of a rational debate, their fear campaign runs off the rails. Professor Garno has put his views into the public domain and they actually deserve a considered public policy response from those opposite. Of course, they'll never get that because those opposite are climate change deniers and they are determined to run Order. a fear campaign. Order. What Order. we will do with Professor Garno's work is, of course, it is there to inform the public discussion. 
we will consider it deeply and the government will make decisions at the appropriate time and we will outline all of those decisions to the Australian people. But coming to the question Order. that I was asked, can I say this about cost of living and Australian households? The Leader of the Opposition has distorted, Order, today, the member for has distorted today words from a chapter of Professor Garno's work that is called Better Climate, Better Tax. That is, Professor Garno is talking about tax cuts. And what I can Order. certainly say to the House Order. today is as we work through designing household assistance and Order. carbon pricing, tax cuts are a serious option. Yeah, yeah. And to the Leader of the Opposition, I would say what that means is that he has decided to go to the next election uh, ripping assistance out order. of people's hands, taking money order. away the house from will come Australian to order. families. Of course, we understand the cost of living pressures order. on Those Australian families, and we will make the appropriate decisions to generously assist Australian order. families. Prime Minister's time has expired. Order. Order. The very patient member for Macon has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Home Affairs and Justice, and I ask him what action is the government taking to combat illegal and counterfeit tobacco in Australia, and is the minister aware of recent commentary about the size of the illegal tobacco trade in Australia, and what is the government's response? The Minister for Home Affairs and Justice. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the member for Macon for his question? A very good question on uh, World No Tobacco Day. It's a, um, it's a good question because I'd like to tell the House that Customs, through its own uh, very strong regime, has been detecting uh, illegal tobacco in this country for some time and indeed been prosecuting those involved in that very illicit trade. Mr. Speaker, uh, the government is committed to combating illegal. Uh, tobacco smuggling in this country. Uh, we work very closely with law enforcement agencies, with states and indeed beyond our shores. We work with intelligence agencies to ensure we detect uh, these transnational crimes. And a strong indication of the success uh, since 2007, uh, Mr Speaker, has been potential revenue losses of customs duty of more than $400 million has been prevented because of the confiscation uh, and detection of these illegal, illegal tobacco um, items, Mr. Speaker. Last year alone, Customs was involved in 10 separate uh, tobacco smuggling uh, cases, successfully prosecuting uh, those uh, cases, um, involving eight custodial sentences, 35 convictions, very hefty penalties and fines for those that have been involved uh, in that behaviour. Mr. Speaker, I raise those issues because the tobacco industry, I uh, purport for their own vested interests, have indicated that the problem is larger than it really is. Indeed, the tobacco industry has indicated that one in every, and in every six uh, smokers in this country consume illegal tobacco. That is a, an exaggerated claim, and indeed, to rely upon those claims, uh, they uh, base that on reports that have been paid for uh, by the tobacco industry, paid for by themselves. So, Mr. Speaker, not only, not only do they fund the Liberal Party, uh, they also fund self-serving research uh, to, to undermine the facts and indeed to substantiate bogus claims that are being made to scare the public, Mr. Speaker, and they are wrong. Indeed, according to the 2007 National Drug Strategy Household Survey, 0.2 per cent uh, have consumed uh, illegal tobacco for most of the time that they smoke. That is 0.2 per cent. The tobacco industry, Mr. Speaker, also asserts uh, that uh, plain packaging will lead to a huge increase in criminal offences. Now, that, of course, is not true. That is baseless. Um, the facts are that um, the illegal tobacco smugglers have had ready access to software technology 
to replicate uh, specific brand packaging for some years. Indeed, they have very sophisticated counterfeit items. Uh, so any transition from specific uh, brand packaging to plain packaging will not in any way, other than perhaps a negligible way, have an effect upon crime in this area. And that's a very important to note, given the scare campaign that's been running. Mr Speaker, um, we know plain packaging will remove the allure, the romance or the glamour that some people see in smoking. Indeed, it will, it will, decline, it will reduce the likelihood Mr. Speaker, of people, young people in particular, in becoming uh, addicts to this particular drug. Now, Mr. Speaker, of course, the, the Health Minister has applauded the efforts uh, of the opposition, and I do so too, uh, in coming to the party. Even if it is the case that the Leader of the Opposition came to the party kicking and screaming, I would like to commend the efforts of the Health Minister for her good walk. Work. Uh, the member for Moore, the member for Hasluck, those on the other side that knew that this was good public policy didn't do it because of their political interests, Mr Speaker, did it because this is good public policy and this government will continue to do that. And as we continue to do that, of course, Tony Abbott will remain the doctor now of Australian politics. Yeah. The le order, the leader of the Nationals. And my question is to the Prime Minister: Is the Prime Minister aware that the Labor Chief Minister in the Northern Territory wants a 50-year moratorium on the carbon tax? <laughs> the Labor Premier of Tasmania says the tax is not fair. The Labor Premier of Queensland says she understands people's fears about the carbon tax. And the Labor Premier of South Australia says he has deep concerns about the job losses as a result of the carbon tax. Can the Prime Minister name one Premier who is in favour of her carbon tax? Order! Order the House! Order the House will come to order. Order! Order! Order. Order. The Minister, Member for Goldstein. The Minister and the Member for Goldstein. Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the uh, Leader of the National Party for his question. And I'm very happy to name people who are in support of pricing carbon. Uh, for example, Order. there's former Prime Minister Order. Howard. For example, there's former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser. For example, there's former Liberal leader Malcolm Turnbull. For example, there's former Liberal leader Brendan Nelson. For example, there's Andrew Peacock, who took a cut in emissions to an election, and the list goes on and on. As I understand it, the, the Leader of the Opposition, Order. the Prime the Minister will resume her seat. Prime Minister has the call. She will be heard in silence. Prime Minister. Uh, the you. member for Hume is warned. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My understanding is that the Leader of the Opposition is the only living national Liberal leader in this country who is opposed to a price on carbon. 
the deputy leader of the opposition interjected. The member for North before, Sydney is. And warned. yes, it is. Yes, it is that the leader of the opposition has allowed his political negativity to mean that he has turned his back on the liberal tradition the of deputy leader of the opposition prime ministers is warned. like John Howard. Successful prime ministers like John Howard, they have walked away from that tradition because they are preferring the path of negativity Order. to putting an idea I in the nation's a general interest. warning. And then, of course, Mr. Speaker, I was asked about who I can name who supports carbon pricing. Let me actually. The member go. for Patterson is named. The Leader of the House. I move that the member be excused from the services of the House. Order. The question is the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Vision required. Vision required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. The ayes pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Fowler Tallis for the ayes, and the members for uh, Parks and Barker Tallis for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 71, no 72. The question is therefore negatived. And after question time, I will be taking the time to consider my position. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I move that this House has confidence in your speakership. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Order. 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 To be order. Order. The order. Order. The leader of the opposition would require leave. Well, Mr. To... Speaker, I seek leave uh, to move uh, that this house uh, has confidence in your speakership. Yeah. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Th the leader you. of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, members opposite uh, for the opportunity to move this motion and. I uh, may not detain the House for quite as long uh, as, uh, as I have on the clock, but, Mr Speaker, um, obviously uh, uh, we have been in uncharted and difficult parliamentary waters uh, ever since uh, the Parliament resumed after the last election. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, in the circumstances where the government uh, cannot uh, naturally command a majority, uh, the job of the Speakership is even more difficult than usual. Now, Mr Speaker, I want to say that under Difficult circumstances, 
you have done your job but with commendable impartiality uh, and with considerable forbearance. I know, Mr Speaker, that all members of this House from time to time try your patience. Uh, I, I know from time to time I do. I suspect from time to time the Prime Minister does. Uh, Mr Speaker, all of us in this House are trying to make political points, as we should, uh, given that this House's job uh, is to determine the great questions before uh, our nation. But, Mr Speaker, I don't think anyone on this side of the House has anything other than respect for the, diff for the job you do under difficult circumstances. And the last thing any of us would want to see uh, is you feel that you have been compromised in your ability to discharge uh, your office uh, by the vote that has just been taken. Whatever we on this side of the House think of a particular decision uh, that you might have just made, we do have deep and abiding confidence in your ability to run this House, Mr Speaker. I want to put it on the record that it is not the opinion of this side of the parliament uh, that anyone uh, could do a better job than you uh, in maintaining uh, the order and the discipline of this House. So you have discharged uh, your, your office very effectively uh, in the previous parliament. If I may say so, uh, Mr Speaker, you have done your job with even more dignity and more assurance and more command in the, in the more difficult circumstances of this parliament. As you know, Mr Speaker, uh, when there was some question uh, as to whether uh, the government would re-nominate you uh, in the uh, weeks after the election, uh, it was the position of the opposition of the coalition that you should be re-nominated, and nothing has changed in the intervening nine months uh, to alter that view of the opposition that you are by far and away uh, the best person uh, to take the chair, that you are by far and away uh, the best person to run what is inevitably a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, uh, to do a difficult job. Uh, in the circumstances of a hung parliament. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, uh, I really do uh, understand uh, how uh, uh, you would be feeling uh, at this present time. Um, you made a call. It was the best call uh, that you uh, could make in your judgment at that time. Uh, on this side of the House, we <coughs> respectfully disagreed with the call that you made. Uh, as it happened, uh, our judgment was backed by the House. But the fact that on this particular occasion, this solitary occasion, uh, your judgment uh, has not been supported by the House, please do not for a moment think that that indicates any want of confidence in your speakership. And that is why I am moving, I am moving this motion. Mr, Mr. Speaker, um, please, please um, do not judge uh, what is the appropriate thing to do uh, in the circumstances of this House by what might have been the appropriate thing to do in the circumstances of very different houses. This is, in this respect at least, genuinely a new paradigm. In this respect at least, it is genuinely a new paradigm. And please, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, do not add to the difficulties of this day by feeling that you cannot continue in the chair. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I rise to second the motion. And of course, Mr Speaker, the government has continuing confidence in you as the Speaker of this parliament. It's not, a, it's not an easy job. It's uh, definitely not an easy job in contested political circumstances uh, to deal with all of the things that come before you in this parliament. I understand that and the government understands that and the government understands that you make the best judgment calls you can at the time. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for moving this motion and I am uh, very pleased to second it. Can I say this though, Mr Speaker, we understand that there is a continuing obligation on members of this House, a continuing obligation not just to support this motion but to support your rulings as they are delivered to this parliament. That is an obligation that we will acquit on the government side. 
Can I say to you, Mr Speaker, I do believe you should take the combined view of me and the Leader of the Opposition on this occasion. I understand the precedents that have borne down on these things in the past, but this is a different circumstance, and I believe in this different circumstance, having heard from me and the Leader of the Opposition, you should act differently to speakers in the past. Uh, you should uh, uh, acknowledge that the House has made a decision on this occasion, but that should be the end of it. But I would say this to members of the House who are now presumably uh, behind the Leader of the Opposition and in the exercise of their own independent judgment about to support this confidence motion in you, that the reality is on future occasions not to find ourselves in this position uh, when we are called on to back your judgment in on a matter such as a naming, then the obligation falls on us to do Order. so. Uh, Mr Speaker, Order. that is not something that Order. should be second-guessed if, if people are going Order. to have confidence in the Order. Speaker. Uh, the, the, government has, the, government has in, the government in its conduct today has shown uh, full confidence in you by backing your judgment on the naming, and of course we back this motion now. And my words now, Mr. Speaker, are not directed to you, but they are directed to the opposition. Uh, to provide continuing confidence in the speaker, you need to provide continuing confidence in the speaker's rulings. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in terms of the vote that we've just had, as I think was very evident by my conduct at the dispatch box, I didn't hear you even name someone. The no noise was so great. I am not able to say, standing at this dispatch box, what you named them for. I couldn't hear that either uh, because the level of noise was so great. Uh, but of course, I exercised my vote and the government Order. exercised its vote the way that we did because to provide confidence to the Speaker requires providing confidence in individual rulings of the Speaker. And whether or not we are in a position to judge as individuals the circumstances of any individual ruling, we provided that confidence. That is the attitude that the government will continue to take to providing confidence in you. And I would ask members of the opposition to reflect on that for the future. As for today, Mr Speaker, we are where we are, and the Leader of the Opposition Order. has taken Order. the appropriate action, Order. given the way in which the uh, Opposition has cast its votes. Uh, in those circumstances, I think the Leader of the Opposition has done the right thing, which is why I am prepared to second the resolution Order. to confirm to you that the government has complete confidence in you continuing, and I believe, having heard from both me and the Leader of the Opposition, you should accept that display of confidence uh, in the full exercise of your good judgment on this matter. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The member for Lyme. Speaker, and I know there's a great deal of interest in this particular parliament, uh, in six particular members of uh, this parliament, and uh, in light of that, uh, it is worth putting on the record uh, the support in the full confidence of your continuing role uh, in, in the chair as Speaker. Uh, and it is important in this parliament uh, to, I think, uh, have some reflection and backing up the words of the previous Speaker, the Prime Minister, in consideration of the uh, place that naming has uh, in uh, the uh, full life of the 43rd Parliament, because the position that I just took, for example, is not without precedent. It's the same position I have taken before in regards naming, and that is, where possible, in my view, to defend a private member's rights within this chamber. You will see that consistently uh, in regards issues such as the gag, uh, in the full range of issues in, in regards uh, the rights of private members in this chamber. And if I don't hear or see a particular issue that leads to a member being named, uh, then uh, I would have difficulty doing anything else other than defending those members' rights. So my position uh, is not without precedent, but I don't think it then necessarily takes the next step in this 43rd parliament, which is incredibly tight, 
of leading to a lack of confidence in your position as Speaker of this chamber. So I appreciate the motion being moved. I think it is appropriate that we do clarify this, and I would hope, uh, as a consequence of that, we do see the House today once again express full confidence uh, in your ongoing role uh, as Speaker in this chamber. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I, I thank the House. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Uh, I think, uh, Mr Speaker, it might be an appropriate opportunity to ask that further questions be placed on the notice page. Order. Order. Before, order. I'm sorry to interrupt members, and this is totally unrelated to, to events. Um, it, it's my sad duty to inform the House of the death yesterday of an officer of the House of Representatives, Mr Peter Buckley. Peter joined the department on 8 September 1969 and was a member of staff upon, and, until his death, to the time of his death. A career of over 41 years made him the longest serving officer of the department. Nobody associated with the Australian parliament today has known life within this parliament without Peter. He was a good humoured, courageous, given his increasing physical limitations. He, uh, members, might remember Peter uh, as he zipped around the halls on his red electric scooter. This led to some of, of us, including myself, referring to him as Fangio. Peter was extremely well liked and well respected by all. Um, his work colleagues within the House Department have been greatly affected by the loss of such a loyal and cheerful colleague. Um, on behalf of the House, I extend sincere condolences to Peter's family and his many friends, especially uh, his work colleagues within the department. And I, as a mark of respect, I would ask members to rise in their places. I thank the House. Order. The member for Canning is indicating that he's got a question for me. Uh, the Deputy Leader and the Opposition, the member for Sturt. Sorry. The Mr. member for Canning. Mr Speaker, understanding Order 105B, um, I requested you write to the Minister for School, Education, Early Childhood and Youth, the Honourable Peter Garrett seek the reasons for the delay in responding to my questions on notice. Questions number 319 and 320 appear on the notice paper on the 24th, 24th of March 2011. Order. I will write to the minister as required. The, if there are no other questions for me, the member for Tangney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I rise for a personal explanation. Does the member claim to have been misrepresented? Most grievously. The member for Tangney. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Today, the Minister for Climate Change accused me of misleading the House by saying that global average temperatures had not increased in 10 years. I suggest the Minister go to the data of the, on global average temperatures Order. with a Hadley Centre Order. and do a linear regression further. Professor Will Stephan, head of the government's own climate change uh, or own climate change adviser, in an interview with Andrew Bolt, repeatedly refused to contradict Bolt's statement that the globe hadn't warmed in 10 years, despite but, uh, being invited the to do so. The member is now straying into debate. Order. I present the following order to generals 
performance audit reports for 2010-11, number 45, administration of the luxury car tax, and number 46, management of student visas. The Leader of the House. I move that the reports be made parliamentary papers. Order. The question is that the reports be made parliamentary papers. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the House. Mr. Doc Mr Speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. I move the House take note of document number two. Full details of the documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. Order. The question is that the House take note of the paper. The member for Cowper. I move the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the debate be adjourned and the adjourned debate be made an order of the day for the next day of sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. I have received a letter from the honourable member for Flinders proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the imminent risk to Australia of the government's decision to delegate the carbon tax to an unelected committee. I call upon those members who approve the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The member for Flinders. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, it has come to this. On a day when the Prime Minister proudly tells the Herald Sun that her contribution to helping the planet is to run the pool pump at least one hour less per day at the lodge, she refuses to rule out a petrol tax on the Australian people. Mr Speaker, it has come to this on a day when the Prime Minister also tells the Herald Sun that her contribution to protecting the planet is to buy local, fresh and in-season fruit and vegetables. When in residence at the lodge, and you can just imagine her down at Coles, Monica, pushing a trolley in the tracksuit pad before going back to what the uh, foreign minister politely called Bougainville, uh, that on a day when that is announced, the Prime Minister of Australia is contemplating an unelected citizens' assembly of one with maybe a few friends to determine Australia's taxation policy and the tax rates on petrol electricity, gas, groceries, automobiles and houses. So on this day, when the Prime Minister is happy to talk about running the pool pump for one hour less at the lodge, when she's happy to talk about a casual trip to Coles, Marnica to pick up a few uh, fresh fruit and vegetable items, she is contemplating an unelected citizens' assembly of one with maybe a few friends to determine the tax rates for electricity, petrol, gas, groceries, automobiles, housing and the cost of farming and food production in this country. That is what we are seeing in terms of the democratic deficit in this country on this day in this place. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, that is why this motion is important, because it is about the imminent threat to Australia, both in terms of our economic health <coughs> and also in terms of our democratic health. And there are two great democratic threats in the way in which the government is approaching this carbon tax. The first is about participation, because what we have seen is a principle which the government will not renounce of allowing unelected officials to set tax rates on the most basic essential items for this country. Call me nostalgic, Mr Deputy Speaker. But I seem to remember that the Boston Tea Party focused on the issue of taxation without representation. That small principle, that small principle of taxation without representation has a reasonable heritage in Western parliaments around the world. <clears throat> it was rejected 240 odd years ago. Uh, and it Wharton. has been rejected ever since, because what it is about is this. This government is unable to make a decision and form an agreement with its alliance partners and its puppet masters, the Greens. It cannot make a decision, so therefore it seeks to defer responsibility for the most basic decisions of taxation to an unelected committee, effectively a citizens' assembly of one or two or three, that can determine the tax rates that Australian families will pay for electricity, petrol, gas, groceries, houses and automobiles amongst many items. <clears throat> and what we see is an abrogation of responsibility, because the nature of governance, 
the purpose of a prime ministerial role, the task of a parliamentarian is to allow the people of Australia to have voice and role and responsibility in determining the rates of taxation of this nation and the impact on households so as they can determine, through their representatives, the effective rates that they will pay for the cost of goods and services, the effective rates that they will pay in taxation. We are at a critical and extraordinary moment in Australian political history, where an unelected body <coughs> has been proposed, a Prime Minister is refusing to rule out the creation of an unelected body with effective control over the taxation rates of essential services. <clears throat> As I say, for over 240 years, the Western world, Mr Deputy Speaker, has been somewhat suspicious of taxation without representation. But what we are seeing now is a government policy uh, which they are refusing to rule out of accepting, acknowledging, endorsing a committee which will effectively take power away and disenfranchise this parliament and disenfranchise the people of Australia over a fundamental decision. And the reason why, I just want to repeat this, the reason why is that the government has no authority. It is a government which is fundamentally lacking in authority, lacking in legitimacy and lacking in the capacity uh, to implement its own decisions. It is not in control of its own destiny. It is certainly not in control of the country. And so in order to resolve an internal alliance matter with the Greens, the ALP, the Government of Australia, the Prime Minister of Australia are contemplating ceding sovereignty over taxes to an unelected body. Sure. And that is what it has come to in this parliament on this day. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, we make it clear that this is an imminent threat to Australia. I make the point that the democratic deficit operates firstly in terms of participation and secondly in terms of truth. In, in terms of participation, the most fundamental, most fundamental right that an Australian citizen has is to make or break governments on the basis of the policies they take to an election. All members of this House will remember <coughs> that the government of today, led by the Prime Minister of today, went to the election with a statement on the Monday prior to the election that there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. That statement could not have been more categorical and was made in the context of an opposition campaign to say that there would be a carbon tax. It was not a casual statement. It was not a chance statement. This was the primary issue of the day because we foresaw that whatever happened in the House of Representatives, a deal would have to be done in the Senate which would bring on a carbon tax as a consequence of the relationship with the Greens. So it was foreseen, it was forewarned and it was uh, denied by the Prime Minister, as she then was, and the candidate seeking a mandate to carry out policies from the people of Australia. But it wasn't just once. On the day before the election, the Prime Minister said, and I quote on the front page of The Australian, I rule out a carbon tax. I rule out a carbon tax. And the question has to be, why did she say that? What was so much in objection about the term carbon tax? And the Prime Minister said that because she knew two things. Firstly, that the Australian public would not endorse her, would not endorse her government and would not allow her to form a prime ministerial uh, uh, approach, it would not allow her to form government if she advocated a carbon tax, because it conveyed to the Australian people the words that the emissions trading scheme would not, that they would pay, that they would pay in terms of higher electricity, petrol, gas, groceries, all of the essentials of life. It was an act of fundamental dishonesty on a critical issue, at a critical juncture, it was an act of betrayal of the Australian people because it was fundamentally dishonest, and every member of the government today knows it. The reason why the Prime Minister said, I rule out a carbon tax, is because she knew if she didn't, she would have lost the election. So she went to the election on a grand deception, a deception of the Australian people which goes right to the heart of legitimacy. And lest it be said, we always intended a carbon price. The government's policy in the weeks leading up to the election was, firstly, no carbon tax. 
<coughs> Secondly, a citizens' assembly to produce, and I remember the words clearly, a deep and lasting consensus. I suspect there has not been a deep and lasting consensus in favour of a carbon tax at this stage. And thirdly, my favourite of all of the policies, cash for clunkers. Now, cash for clunkers uh, had a half-life of about three hours before everybody realised it would produce emission savings at about $400 per tonne. But those were the official election policies. And the democratic deficit is real. There should be a chance for the Australian public to genuinely vote on who determines the taxes Australians face, who determines the circumstances under which they pay them, who determines what those taxes will be. And this government went to the election denying that there would be such a tax and should take the proposal for a tax to an election. Anything less than that will be a travesty of the democratic process, a betrayal of the Westminster system uh, and will be a simple insult to the ordinary working families of Australia who deserve to have the trust placed in them to make their own decisions about their own future. The second great democratic issue at stake in this debate right now, where it is proposed that unelected officials will be given the chance to levy taxation on Australian families, on Australian pensioners, on Australian farmers and on Australian small businesses, is the issue of truth. The government has told us that families will be no worse off. The government has told us that it's all some mythical thousand companies. And yet, let me quote from the Garno report today, Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost, the full cost of a carbon price. And elsewhere in the report, words to the effect of, in the long run, households will pay almost the entire carbon price as business passes through the cost. Those statements are both true. Those statements are both true. This system is designed to increase the cost of electricity. It is intended to increase the cost of electricity. Its sole purpose is to increase the cost of electricity, and it will do it. It will do it over and above any other effects, and we don't walk away from that, but it will increase the cost of electricity. And lest it be said that we are quoting our own material, Treasury's modelling has talked about an $863 increase in the cost of living for families under a $30 per per tonne carbon tax. And no matter where it starts, whatever gains they play in first year, the impact will be to rise every year. The Garno report today confirms that there is an escalator which will continue for many, many years. And so, petrol, six and a half cents a litre. And if they play an offset game in first year, what the Garno report also confirms, and which the Prime Minister would not deny today, is that petrol indexation is effectively back. Every year after year one, petrol will go up, petrol will go up, petrol will go up, and they cannot deny that, and they must rule out increasing the cost of petrol. Gas, 10 per cent. Groceries, 5 per cent, according to the Australian Food and Grocery Council. And then the impacts on business. The impacts on business are very simple. Let me give you an example, which I think sums it all up. The cost of an Australian-made car, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers, will increase by up to $412 per vehicle. The cost of a foreign vehicle from China, Japan or Korea will not change at all. How can it be that an Australian-made vehicle will increase by $412? There are members from South Australia in this chamber, and I would ask, do you think that it is acceptable that an Australian-made vehicle goes up by $412 whilst a foreign vehicle does not increase in price one dollar. And that goes to the heart of the flaws in this model and this approach. What they are saying is that we will increase the price of Australian-made goods while imported goods are not penalised. And again, lest it be said that this was our work, this is the work of PricewaterhouseCoopers. And PricewaterhouseCoopers builds on the findings of the National Farmers Federation, which only yesterday said that there would be a $36,000 increase at a $36 per tonne carbon price on a West Australian wheat farmer. The cost of food goes up, the profitability of farming goes down, but the cost of imports does not change. And that is the critical element which this government will not acknowledge. On this same day, the government has withheld the Productivity Commission report into the impacts uh, and approaches to dealing with carbon pricing in other countries. 
And the reason why is because they are ashamed of it and they want to release it out of the parliamentary session. So they are willing to, to leak the fact, as they did overnight, that they're happy to have a new citizens' assembly of one or two or three determined taxation rates, but they're not willing to release the work of the Productivity Commission in parliamentary session so as we can talk about the real action occurring, whether it's in China, the United States, uh, Japan or Canada, around the world. That is the democratic deficit that is occurring. And let me make it absolutely clear that the cost of a house, according to the Home uh, Housing Industry Association, will go up by $6,000. Against all of that background of electricity, petrol, gas, groceries, $863 a year, Australian-made cars going up by $412, whilst foreign cars from North Asia do not increase a dollar at all. What we see here is a plan for an advertising campaign, no plan to protect the Australian economy, a plan for unelected officials to determine the taxation rates in Australia. It is time for the Australian government to stand up for Australia, to reject this tax and to adopt a better way which won't drive up the cost of living Order. for Australian families. The Honourable yeah. Member's time has expired. I now call the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The member for Flinders has raised this matter today because the aspect that he fears most about this current debate is any independent voice on what the science of climate change means for Australia's efforts to reduce its own pollution. And what we have heard today is a ringing, a ringing independent voice that of Professor Ross Garno who is, and I repeat, an independent voice, and that's what the opposition can't stand about the report that he's released today. And I would add my thanks. I would add my thanks to those of the Prime Minister expressed earlier today in question time to Professor Garno for the continuing excellent service that Professor Garno has rendered to our nation over the course of his working life. This debate today is not about, as the topic that's been chosen for it by the member for Flinders might suggest, about the role of government. It is not about the role of parliament, which will continue to be the body that has responsibility and accountability for the legislation which it makes. It is grossly misleading for the member for Flinders to come into this House and make any suggestions about what the government is proposing to do in relation to the carbon price scheme that we will be, now, will be announcing in the middle of the year and introducing legislation for uh, later in the year. It is grossly misleading for him to have made the suggestions that he has made about what the government is proposing. The fact of the matter is, Deputy Speaker, is that the opposition are fundamentally opposed to any climate change policy which achieves the long-term reductions of pollution that we need to make. And as outlined in his recent interview on the 7.30 report, the member for Flinders has admitted that his polluter subsidy policy is only a temporary solution, which has nothing to offer Australians for the long-term adjustment which Australians, Australia needs to make. The Coalition's policy will not make a dent on Australia's emissions and fundamentally ignores the economic transformation which our nation needs to make. Far from being a long-term vision, Deputy Speaker, which is what one might expect from a mainstream political party, far from being a long-term vision, the Coalition's policy is a fig leaf. It's a fig leaf to convince the sceptics that sit opposite and make up a large proportion of the coalition parties. It's, those, it's a fig leaf to convince those sceptics that the, in proceeding with this direct action policy they have committed only to a pot of money that can be quickly reallocated and abandoned once they gain power. As outlined by Professor Garno today, direct action is immensely more expensive than a price on carbon. And I just want to state so as to make it clear what our policy is, a carbon price which we aim to introduce in this country is a price on pollution which will make dirty energy more expensive and clean energy like solar, gas and wind cheaper. The carbon price will apply only to the biggest polluters in our economy, less than 1,000, and they will be required to pay for every tonne 
of carbon pollution that they emit. It is the most effective and cheapest way for us to build a clean energy economy. And every single reputable economist has said that by, in comparison to the fig leaf of a direct action policy that the coalition has put forward, it is absolutely clear that putting a price on carbon, a market mechanism, is to be preferred. Now, I do need to make clear, Deputy Speaker, what the government's arrangements for the carbon price uh, might be. Uh, first, by making clear that those government, governance arrangements are currently still under consideration by the Multi-Party Climate Change Committee. There have been no decisions taken on aspects of governance, which are those that are raised by the matter of public importance raised by the member for Flinders here today. All details will be announced once the deliberations of the Multi-Party Climate Change Committee have been finalised. But it is apparent, Deputy Speaker, that it's necessary to, co to correct a complete misconception that has been advanced today by the member for Flinders, not about the government's proposal, not about what's been decided in the Multi-Party Climate Change Committee, but about Professor Garno's proposal for an independent committee. The independent committee, and I'm corrected by uh, the member for Murray, who says that Professor Garno, in his report, sorry, Farrah, the member for Farrah, I do apologise, by the member for Farrah, um, who says that Professor Garno in fact re recommended as part of his proposed governance structure for the carbon price scheme some three independent bodies, but the particular independent committee that the member for Flinders has directed his attention to is one which, in his imagination, was going to set the price. I need to make clear and I'd invite the member for Flinders to actually read Professor Garno's report before he next raises this, and perhaps other members opposite would, could read Professor Garno's report before they raise uh, these sorts of allegations. The independent committee, as proposed by Professor Garno, would not set the price. It is proposed that it would make recommendations on emissions reduction targets and that those emissions reduction targets would remain the prerogative of the government. The independent committee would not be setting the carbon price because under the emissions trading scheme, which we will be moving to after the fixed price period is completed, it would become a market price. And the independent committee would be making Deputy Speaker, the independent committee would be making recommendations. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Independent Parliament Committee has the call. would make recommendations to government and parliament concerning the implementation of targets under emissions trading. It would be up to the government and the parliament to respond to these recommendations. Now, despite Professor Garno making this crystal clear in black and white in his report, the coalition <coughs> has willfully misrepresented what he has proposed. We've heard it again just now from the member for Flinders. The member for Flinders seems to be suggesting that the entire carbon tax, including the carbon price and carbon pollution reduction targets, would be outsourced to unelected officials. Indeed, he's just used that phrase, uh, referring to unelected officials setting tax rates. That is a willful misleading of this parliament, Deputy Speaker, and it is not what Professor Garno has said today in his speech. It is not what he has said in his report nor in the summary of his report. And I just want to read to the House what, in fact, Professor Garno says, and I quote, some of the governance functions related to the scheme are by their nature the prerogative of government. These include decisions about establishing the scheme, setting the medium and long-term emissions reduction targets, deciding which sectors should be covered by the scheme, the broad principles for providing transitional assistance to emissions-intensive trade-exposed industries, and the principles governing the point at which the scheme should switch from a fixed to a floating price. And it's very clear uh, that Professor Garno goes on to say that the ultimate decision on recommendations to be put forward by the independent committee that he is proposing lies with the parliament. This is what he says, and I quote again, should the government wish to take an approach that differs from the independent committee's recommendations, it would be required by legislation to present to parliament the reasons for its alternative decision. This approach is similar to the arrangements for setting carbon budgets or national emissions reduction targets in the United Kingdom. That's right. 
This is the approach that is followed by the Conservative-led government in the United Kingdom, and that's of course why those opposite are so keen to misrepresent the proposal from Professor Garneau. And just by the way, Deputy Speaker, this is the same United Kingdom government led by the Conservative Party, which is continuing with the emissions trading scheme that has been established in the United Kingdom since 2002. It's the same Conservative-led government in the United Kingdom which just two weeks ago adopted the most ambitious emissions reduction targets of any developed country. And just to make it clear what those are, it's a pledge under the annual carbon budget adopted by the United Kingdom government to cut emissions from 1990 levels by 50 per cent by 2027. And it ought to be an embarrassment to those opposite that a Conservative-led United Kingdom government in a bipartisan fashion has simply continued with the emissions reductions policies of the former Labor government. It has continued with the scheme. It has indeed adopted more ambitious targets. And uh, the suggestion that I, which was made to us yesterday in this House that uh, the United Kingdom government has said that there's going to be a review in 2014 is simply appropriate, cautious government. It's the appropriate, cautious government that would be brought by our government to bear on any emissions trading arrangements that we introduce because the national interest must come first. That's, of course, why we are introducing an emissions trading scheme after a fixed price period. That's why we are moving to a carbon price, because it is in the national interest that we do so. The review update from Professor Garno could not have been clearer. In, this is the report that Professor Garno has released today. He said, making it clear, climate change is real, it is caused by human activity, and it poses a serious risk to the prosperity and quality of life for all Australians. He said, and I'll quote again from Professor Garno, since 2008, advances in climate change science have broadly confirmed that the earth is warming, that human activity is the cause of it, and that the changes in the physical world are likely, if anything, to be more harmful than the earlier science had suggested. It's a view that's based on the advice of expert climate scientists. It's consistent with the advice that the government's received from sources like the CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, the Climate Commission, and the Australian Academy of Science. And of course, just last week, the Climate Science released, the Climate Commission released its report uh, entitled The Critical Decade. Any serious government, indeed any serious political party, has a clear responsibility to act in the national interest and consequently cannot ignore advice of that kind. And only an opposition which is more concerned with its own political self-interest then the national interest would choose to ignore such advice. And I'll say again, as was said several times in answers in question time, Deputy Speaker, that Professor Garneau could not have made it clearer that the appropriate response to the challenge of climate change is a market-based mechanism. It is the introduction of a carbon price, and it is not the direct action or so-called direct action policy that those opposite seem to favour. This is what Professor Garneau said in his speech today about direct action. Direct action, I quote, direct action for reducing carbon emissions is likely to be immensely more expensive than a market approach. That's consistent with the views of all mainstream economists. It's consistent with the views of former Liberal leaders. And as has been accurately said, the only living leader, the only living leader of the Liberal Party, past and present, who does, not, who does not support a price on carbon. Our Downer, our Downer's, yes, Mr Downer, apparently has been brought. I haven't heard uh, from him. will but, restrain himself. But what has been made clear is call. that John Hewson favours a Members price on, on carbon. Right. Malcolm Fraser favours a price on carbon. Malcolm Turnbull, the member for Wentworth, favours a price on carbon and the former Prime Minister, John Howard, favours a price on carbon. And that ought to give a pretty clear message, one would think, to those opposite, that they are definitely proceeding on the wrong track with their direct action policy. I want to again commend Professor Garno for the great service that he has done to Australia with his update of his 2008 report in the report that he's released today. 
He made very clear points today, one of them being that the mainstream science, in the expectations of what will happen, to use Professor Garneau's phrase, if we let emissions rip, have become a bit more grim. And the second point, and it's a somewhat optimistic point that Professor Garneau made today, was that technology is advancing faster than expected. And he gave us the example, the take-up rate for electric cars. And the third important point that Professor Gano made today was that the case for action is stronger than a few years ago. We should have acted much earlier than we have. With every year that passes, the cost of taking action will grow, and that is why it is important that we proceed now with as much speed as possible to introduce a carbon price in Australia starting on the 1st of July next year with a fixed price. This is a reform, Deputy Speaker, which is in the national interest. It is a reform which will see Australia doing our fair share. It is a reform in which we will be able to show the rest of the world how to reduce emissions and, and by doing so to urge the rest of the world, because we need the rest of the world to act, to reduce their emissions. It is a reform which will let us move our economy towards the low carbon economy of the future, towards the clean energy of the future. Deputy Speaker, we will withstand pressures from sectional interests because it is in the national interest that we continue Order. to do the so. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary's time is expi has expired. I now call the Honourable Member for Farrow. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm delighted to speak on today's matter of public importance, the imminent risk of the government's decision to delegate the carbon tax to an unelected committee. And since the, the um, government is determined to quote <coughs> Professor Garno, we should put one of Professor Garno's quotes front and centre of this debate, and that is that Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost of a carbon price. Now, we already know that a carbon tax will attack the living standards of forgotten Australian families and households. I received a letter this week from a young mum in Kalgoorlie, Kalgoorlie in Western Australia, where the Treasurer believes our two-speed economy is going at full throttle. A young mum wanting to get back into the workforce, worried about the skyrocketing cost of childcare, worried about being able to give her family all that she hopes and dreams of. So what is the Prime Minister's response? She's going to hit her with even higher costs of living. For starters, a $20 to $30 per tonne carbon tax will raise power bills by 25 per cent. It will add six and a half cents to the cost of a litre of petrol, up go grocery prices by 5 per cent, and that's all just for starters, because Labor's shaky, flaky, single-issue partners in government, the Greens, say the tax must be $40 a tonne to drive change from coal to gas. And then it would have to go to $100 to drive the change from fossil fuels to renewables. And we know that that's actually what the Greens want to do. Now, I'm at a loss as to how I should respond to Tanya from Kalgoorlie, but I might also add that she added at the end of her email, I would have written this letter to the appropriate minister for the ALP, but it's become very clear that the Labor Party is not listening to middle income Australia. Anyway. Now, Labor set the tone for the debate on unelected committees in the last parliament when they kicked off with the 2020 summit, because having sneaked into government with 97 per cent of the then government's agenda, they had to bring a summit to Canberra to tell them what they then had to really do. We're not sure of our agenda. We've sneaked into power. What should we do? The Citizens' Assembly is another example of this that popped up during the last election campaign. 50-odd members from across Australia, 150 members, one from each electorate, and uh, we pointed out to uh, the Prime Minister then that we already have such an elected assembly in Parliament. But again, it was an initiative designed to tell the government what to do and what to think. Wind the clock forward, Deputy Speaker, to the Murray-Darling Basin debacle. The government flicked the development of a basin plan to the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, absolving responsibility for the outcome, and kept referring to the Murray-Darling Basin Authority as the independent authority. What a mess. Members of this parliament, chaired by the member for New England, have had to travel around the basin picking up the pieces and cleaning up the mess because, again, we saw the decision-making uh, decision of this parliament hived off to an independent committee. Um, we had to bring the decision back into the parliament where it belongs. We now have a proposed independent committee to set Australia's emissions reduction levels. 
to break the deadlock between the Labor Party and the Greens and to resolve the hissy fit between the Prime Minister and Senator Brown. <laughs> Professor Garno's final carbon price report is quite prescriptive. $11.5 billion, 55 per cent of which goes to households, 35 per cent to businesses. It will be budget neutral. There will be tax cuts, the tax-free threshold and so on. Pensions might be indexed. Petrol taxes are in the mix. Transitional assistance will be provided and so on. No less than three independent bodies will be set up to implement it. One to tell us what our future targets and scheme caps should be. Another to tell us what assistance should be provided to trade exposed in industries. And a third is the carbon bank to administer the final emissions trading scheme. But if the government disagrees with the recommendations, then it all has to come back to parliament and so on and so on. The problem here, Deputy Speaker, is not the existence of sound independent organisations to manage whatever disastrous policy emerges from this mess. The problem is the referral, the handballing, the dumping of the decision making that belongs in this parliament to outside bodies. Like many, I watched the Garno Press Club address today, but particularly the questions. And during the questions, Professor Garno was asked, what target would the independent committee set? Would it be more than 5 per cent? His answer, well, the independent committee would look at this in more detail. It would have the resources on the job to do the job properly. It would have a whole seven months to do it. And so one can only conclude that the independent committee might well set a target of greater than 5 per cent. The point of this is not so much the 5 per cent target, but the clear impression that the responsibility for the setting of the target does not lie within this parliament, but lies with one of these three independent committees. Do people really think that if the committee that determines a target of more than 5 per cent uh, doesn't have its advice taken by the parliament, that all of the other work that's being done by independent committees outside this place would stand up. It wouldn't. To me, that is a strong indication that this government is devolving responsibility to a body that is not elected. Every other piece of advice or decision hangs off that target. Now, the Prime Minister needs to fess up here. She has no idea what to do with this train coming down the track. Now, Deputy Speaker, I represent a rural electorate, like many members in this place, and I refer now to the Australian Farm Institute report, which says that the impact of a carbon price on Australian farm businesses, in the case I'm going to use grain production, is going to be quite devastating. The proposed carbon price mechanism will increase the price of energy and hence the cost of farm inputs that involve the use of energy in their production or delivery. So it doesn't matter how many tax offsets or structural adjustments you put in, it doesn't matter whether agriculture sector emissions are in or out, the on-farm costs will rise, and for my own electorate disturbingly so. The report notes the impact of a carbon tax will be relatively greater for the smaller New South Wales farmer, with the lower productivity of a modest-sized grain farm hit harder by the rise in costs. This simple report comes up with the figures the government needs, apparently a full-blown committee to consider. Even at a modest carbon price scenario of about $20 a tonne, uh, this would add uh, $12,000, $15,000 to the bottom line of this farm business. And Deputy Speaker, farmers have enough to cope with drought, floods, locusts, mice and um, the scourge of, um, of, of the things that they face without adding the carbon tax to it. As I said, the Prime Minister has no idea what to do with the carbon problem, the carbon tax problem. But what the coalition says to this government is that no matter how many independent committees, expanded government bureaucracies, experts or actors you wheel out to ram your message down the throats of the Australian people, nothing is going to substitute for your government's poor, shocking leadership, the incompetent way that you've managed the dis this debate, your muddle and confusion. The simple truth is that the government's carbon tax will impose excessive deadweight costs on the Australian economy. The carbon tax will increase the cost of living. It is, most disturbingly, a tax which is actually designed to go up as soon as it commences. As soon as it commences, it transforms into an emissions trading scheme down the track. 
It starts as a carbon tax at some level yet to be set. The mystery will be revealed by the multi-party committee. But as soon as it's legislated, it's designed to go up. Compare that with the GST, where checks and balances and legislation was put in place and agreements were made to make sure that that didn't happen. This is a tax that, by its very design, goes up the minute it hits the pockets of everyday Australians. The government is not brave enough, Deputy Speaker, to put its stamp on this tax, not brave enough to bring the decision-making that it should be doing across the parliament, inside the parliament. Instead, it's hiving it off to a committee of unelected people that will have, as the member for Flinders pointed out, extraordinary power. The, um, the wide-ranging discussion that we heard at the press club indicates that Professor Garno's committees will have their fingerprints all over all sorts of aspects of government policy, particularly tax, particularly pensions, particularly FBT and fuel prices. How could they possibly get it right? How could they possibly make it budget neutral in the end? And I do worry, as I said, about those deadweight transaction costs of money moving around the economy and who knows where it will end up. Deputy Speaker, if the Prime Minister wanted an actor to help get the message across, she would have been better off to choose Chopper Reed than <laughs> Kate Blanchett, because Chopper Reed was quoted in the press on the same day that Ms Blanchett and Michael Caton were um, as saying, uh, look, I just make it up as I go along. It appears that the Prime Minister and this government on this topic is also making it up as they go along. The Honourable Member's time has now expired. I now give the call to the honourable member for Chifley. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I agree at the outset with the member for Flinders. It, in one aspect of his contribution to the House today, and that is, we are at a critical point. We are pressed to do something of paramount generational importance, and that is to tackle the issue of climate change, an issue that, on their side, they grappled with for years. Uh, ignored public pressure to deal with uh, the, uh, what the public wanted to see, support for Kyoto, support in tackling climate change, wanting to see some sort of action being undertaken for the sake of future generations, and that they comprehensively failed to do anything on until the last moment when their former leader, John Howard, agreed that they would need to do something and that they would need to support an emissions trading system. And um, uh, he was ultimately uh, required to face the grinding weight of facts and the compelling case to act. 2010, again, it's worth noting, 2010, one of the warmest years on record. The previous decade, one of the warmest. The graphs recording movement in temperature might bounce up and down, but the trend line undeniably is moving upwards. But the turning point for us. The turning point for us—is it uh, warm in here? Yes. No. Well, from the hot air that comes from that side, it doesn't surprise me you'd feel that way. The turning point was the election of the leader of the opposition, whose strident opposition has forced splintering in the very things that people who now argue against so strongly believe in, and in particular, the member for Flinders, whose own academic work declared support for a pollution tax is now forced to advocate for a pollution subsidy. Some of the best work, some of the uh, few thing, good things that came out of the 90s were the member for Flinders' work in advocating for some sort of price mechanism through a pollution tax that he now argues against in this House. And we had uh, two of the more moderate and reasonable people from their side advocating immoderate and unreasonable positions through the course of this debate, knowing full well in their heart of hearts that they cannot ignore that we are required and almost compelled to do something. But I, you, you uh, have to be astounded by the gall of the opposition, who come here as the defenders of democracy, who come here as the advocates for mandates, who wring their hands on the issues of cost of living, and yet where was all this? when they upended the lives of workers when they brought in work choices. Never went to an election advocating or indicating in any way, shape or form that they would be rampantly introducing individual contracts, that they would be using, stripping away penalty rates, squeezing overtime, putting pressure on working families, 
They never, ever came in here and said that this is what we are going to put forward at the next election. Now they come here as if they have discovered the virtue of mandate, that they have discovered in some way, shape or form the importance of uh, democracy and the importance of being upfront and transparent, and yet seek to, to demonstrate here today this line. Now we ask them, given that their MPI is talking about uh, the way that we intend to approach this whole issue of preparing our approach on dealing with climate change, we had asked them to be involved in the multi-party climate change committee. They had a chance to be involved and they refused. Why? Because they wanted the ability to be able to sit on the sidelines and be able to do whatever they could in supporting the Leader of the Opposition's position to, uh, to take or to not undertake any sort of comprehensive action on climate change. What they wanted to do was to sit outside the process and yet, when they invited to be able to have the input to put forward the issues that they claim they are most concerned about now, they did not do it. So what we have is an opposition now that is effectively cast into the scientific dark ages. While the front makes lukewarm support on science, you have some incredible comments being made by people in a position of responsibility who should know better who say, for example, um, they don't know whether carbon dioxide is quite the environmental villain that some people make it out to be. And that from the Leader of the Opposition, who, while the member for Flinders and while the member for uh, Wentworth will, with their hands on hearts, say that they do accept the science, their own leader is unable to be able to comprehensively say that he accepts that the earth is getting warmer and that something needs to be done about it. And at the back, we have people like the member for Tagney, Senator Minchin, Senator Joyce, Senator Boswell, this column of sceptics who are out there um, and are the reason why the Leader of the Opposition is unable to be able to articulate or form any sort of comprehensive policy on this because they are out there wide-handing the position of the coalition in being required to come forward with some sort of meaningful, durable way to actually deal with this issue of climate change. And they remain on the outer because they have put themselves there in an effort to wreck any chance of being able to form that type of community cons consensus required on this pressing issue. And amazingly, stunningly, misleading at all times in uh, trying to, as part of this scare campaign, always out there misleading the public on what the impact would be and in quite an economically illiterate campaign. Now, they have been picked up on this. Lenore Taylor of the Sydney Morning Herald, in actual fact, um, dissected this quite neatly after the Leader of the Opposition visited a butcher's store up in the Coffs Harbour as part of his uh, annual charity bike ride that he did uh, uh, within uh, the eastern seaboard. And he stopped into a butcher's and he said at this butcher's that the carbon tax would contribute $4,000 to the energy bills of that butchers. The, the, journo, the journalist then went back in and asked, is this the case? They said yes. Then they were asked, what impact would this have on your turnover and then prices? The butcher said that, for example, the impact would be that on a kilo of T-bone that costs currently $22 a kilo, the price would move stunningly up to $22.04 from $22 to $22.04, and on a bag of mince, a kilo of mince, it would move from $11 to $11.02. This scare campaign, unable to deliver the facts where we had previously demonstrated under other potential options that uh, grocery prices on average might move from $0.80 cents to $1.30 a week, um, they are going out there doing all sorts of scare campaigns encouraging people almost to hoard wheat bix under their bed because the carbon tax would have a 0.0006 cent impact on wheat bix and i know that they're prone to their three word slogans so now it's bix under beds for the opposition because they want to beat the price rise caused by the carbon tax what have we done you look at what we've done we have worked on the science we have provided comprehensively through the Climate Commission, 
uh, the report that was tabled last week, the critical decade, to be able to detail in clear, factual terms what's going on. I am astounded that the response to try and undermine this work by notable scientists has been they have been paid by the government. This is the sum total of the response by the coalition. And yet, if people put their hands in their own pockets on this issue critical to Australian public life and they fund a campaign to demonstrate their commitment to seeing climate change tackled, the opposition then undermines their efforts, as we have seen on the weekend, with someone who has made their fortune from the ground up in terms of Kate Blanchett and some of the others. What these people have done have sought to undermine their commitment to the cause. We have had consultations with business, NGOs, the farm sector, looking at the household impacts. And what we have on the other side are the sultans of subsidy, those people that would be willing to hand over at the outset $10 billion in subsidies to businesses who pollute and to do this in a way that would effectively uh, be an ineffective way of encouraging climate change, as evidenced by the Grattan Institute that said this type of work does nothing and will, in actual fact, by 2050, lead to $8 billion per year extra cost on the budget. The, the other side do not have uh, the will, the willingness or the uh, ability to be able to cooperate, as we have uh, provided them opportunity through the multi-party uh, consultative committee on climate change. They stand as vandals on this issue as opposed to what we are trying to achieve for generations Order. to come. Order the member for has time has expired. I call the member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The very thought of a carbon tax has made big business shudder, and small business, the engine room of our economy, very surely catch pneumonia. The carbon tax did not get much of a run in the recent federal budget, but there was funding for a $13.7 million advertising campaign to sell this unwanted and unnecessary tax, which will have such a negative impact on the everyday lives of everyday Australians. The ad blitz started on Sunday. There was Michael Caton of the Castle fame spruiking the merits of a carbon tax. Someone, anyone, tell him he's dreaming. Kate Blanchett, wonderful actress, was also there on the small screen talking up the initiative. If Labor thinks it can sneak this toxic tax via celebrity endorsement, then it is wrong. Plain wrong, morally wrong. Ms Blanchett would know that human and industrial activity has ensured CO2 levels are different than those in the Elizabethan era. It will not be any golden age if Labor, being dictated to by the unrepresentative Greens, forces a carbon tax on hard-working, long-suffering Australians. Our modern-day maid Barry and Kate Blanchett also ought to realise that a carbon tax will take hard-earned money from the pockets of the poor and won't decrease sea levels or lower the global temperature one iota, not one millimetre, not one degree. Robin Hood would not be proud. Perhaps our Treasurer is invoking the ideas of old King John from medieval times who imposed harsh taxes on the working class. This morning I received an email from an aged pensioner in my electorate who wrote, quote, When I listen to debates about a carbon tax, apart from placating the Greens, I wonder if Labor's real intention is to have a new source of income in order to achieve their promised surplus. The sender, Peter Piltz, is a fairly typical sort of person, a father a grandfather, a former small businessman, someone who knows a con when he sees it. He is like a whole host of other fairly typical sort of people, regional Australians and city dwellers too, who can see straight through Labor's deception, spin and the fact it has caved into the green pressure to keep a tenuous hold of its minority government. Just before the August 21 election, the Prime Minister, who has shown she will say anything do anything and be anything just to stay in the lodge, declared there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead. She is right about that. Green Senator Bob Brown is running this sorry show. The Prime Minister has no mandate to introduce a carbon tax and inflict financial pain on the Australian people. She should do the decent thing, the honourable thing, the democratic thing and call an election. Now, there is an imminent risk to Australia of the government's decision to, relegate, to delegate the carbon tax to an unelected committee. 
a huge risk, a risk we as a nation ought not be taking. What sort of committee makes such critical decisions affecting the nation without the Prime Minister, without the Deputy Prime Minister? The member for Lyne, who I might add represents an electorate which gave just 13 per cent of primary preferences to Labor, the party he took 17 days and then 17 minutes to give power to after the hung election result, has talked about imposing a carbon price sufficient to let the market rip and let the science fly. Carbon tax is Labor's big lie another of its broken promises. As we've heard from the member for Farrow this afternoon, we've had the 2020 summit, the Citizens' Assembly, the independent Murray-Darling Basin Authority, which made such a mess of water, and now the unelected carbon pricing committee, all telling this government, which has no idea how to do anything, how to do its job. Labor will relish the opportunity to impose high reduction emissions in line with its minimum 40 per cent cut by 2020 via a suitably stacked member for line Ross Garno style independent authority led by, say, Tim Flannery, Garno himself or carbon queen Kate Blanchett. In the Garno review, it is stated that Australian households will ultimately burden the full cost of a carbon tax. Householders, not big polluters. A $26 a tonne carbon price would push up electricity prices by an extra $300 a year per household in just the first year. Prices would continue to soar every year thereafter. Petrol would rise by 6.5 cents per litre. Gas would rise by up to 10 per cent in the first year. Grocery prices would increase. The price of Australian-made cars will increase by $412. Manufactured goods would rise. It will push up carbon farming costs, as, as, as the member for Farrah indicated, particularly in the Riverina as well, an electorate I represent. Compensation will be temporary. Compensation will not change people's carbon producing habits to stop what the Deputy Prime Minister ridiculously and hysterically calls dangerous climate change. The introduction of a carbon tax will hurt Australian manufacturing and dependent industries and committees for no environmental gain. United States President Barack Obama abandoned his planned emissions trading scheme, further proving that this Labor government is now completely isolated from its major trading partners. How many jobs are we going to lose overseas and what damage will be done to our economy before US, Japan and China get on board, if ever? Labor's carbon tax will send manufacturing overseas to countries which use more emissions to make the same things which are currently being made here. Businesses will be forced to cut jobs to be able to afford the carbon tax. Labor claims that 29 out of 38 countries with Kyoto obligations already have an ETS. Those 29 countries all operate under the European Union ETS, 27 EU countries and Norway and Switzerland. The EU ETS is not comparable to Labor's carbon tax and certainly is no justification for proceeding with it. 80 per cent of EU trade occurs amongst EU countries. Therefore, less than 20 per cent of its trade will be exported outside the EU to countries the producers of which do not face ETS costs. Common sense has given way yet again under Labor to economic recklessness. Australians are going to be burdened by significant extra costs for no environmental benefit. Our economy has been distorted by the misallocation and redistribution of resources for no reason, and our exporters are going to be placed at a disadvantage in the international market. This Labor government has set a target for reducing emissions without having any clue about the effects it will have on the country. And the member for Wakefield can, can interject all he likes, but he knows what I'm saying is correct or at least they will have not revealed to the public what effects it will have. Australia contributes 1.4 per cent of world energy CO2 emissions according to 2002 figures. For the purpose of comparison, the USA contributes 23.5 per cent of global emissions, China 14.6 per cent, the EU 11.6 per cent. Why is this Labor government pushing for us to be world leaders with a carbon tax? Is it because Labor, maybe the government, but the are in government, but the Greens have the power. Internationally renowned and respected environmentalist beyond Blomberg says there is no hurry. Carbon tax will only force us to spend all our money rolling out patently inefficient current technology when smaller investment in research would give much more innovative and much better and cheaper solutions in a few years. Replacing agriculturally rich soil for growing Australia's food supply with forestry will significantly impact on the produce that is supplied to cities and regional Australia. 
It might be fine for city slickers to support a carbon tax, but they will be the first to complain when they cannot no, can no longer access fresh Australian produce, produce which will feed our nation, not forests. We need to remember who puts food on our plates and supports the economy of this country. Crippling the agricultural industry will have major economic and social ramifications in regional Australia. Just this afternoon, Oxfam, in a media release entitled Broken Food System Could See Millions Go Hungry, indicated Oxfam's new Growing a Better Fu Future Food report, explaining the world's broken food system, showing how rising food prices, increasing scarcity of arable land and water and, a rapidly changing, uh, and, and being rapidly changing will undermine access to food across the world. Oxfam Australia Executive Director Andrew Hewitt said, although the world produces enough food for everyone, the broken food system means one in seven people are still going hungry. Oxfam was created in response to the food crisis caused by the Second World War, but this is a new, new food crisis that threatens us all. Mr Hewitt said the Australian aid program reflects the global trend over recent decades of declining investment in the food and agricultural sectors of developing countries. We must address this and prioritise support for small-scale primary producers who make up more than 80 per cent of the world's hungry people. The Growing a Better Food report reveals that by 2050 demand for food will rise by 20, 70 per cent, yet the production is not keeping pace and it certainly won't keep pace with a carbon tax. As a nation, Australia is best placed to grow the food to feed ourselves and the world. A carbon tax and an unelected committee determining it will do nothing to help the world food shortage. For a government which claims to be for regional Australia, this carbon tax drives the stake deep into the heart of regional Australia. The unelected committee deciding the carbon tax does not stand for what Australians need, does not represent the views of ordinary everyday families and is just being led by the nose by Labor, which is being led by the nose Order. by the Greens, Mr. who are very time has nose. expired. I call the member for Throsby. Wakefield. Wakefield, my apologies. Thank you. Wakefield. Thank you, Deputy Where Speaker. Uh, well, look, uh, this has got to be the strangest uh, matter of public importance ever brought before this House. It is a very strange uh, uh, issue uh, to debate, uh, this issue of an unelected committee. And I was really uh, quite perplexed about what it might be about, but I've listened carefully to the debate. And um, I listened in particular to the member for Flinders talking about the Boston Tea Party and other things. And I really, uh, I mean, I can't really understand it. This parliament's elected, the government's elected, any committee any report, it comes to us, they recommend to us, they're subordinate to this parliament, to the democratic process, to the national interest, in the same way every other institution set up by this parliament is, the same way the Reserve Bank is, the same way all these other, other uh, um, bodies are, the Murray-Darling Basin uh, Authority and other authorities set up under Australian law, are always subordinate to this parliament. And I couldn't work out what we would be debating for such a length of time, but uh, I now realise it's the Boston Tea Party, it's this attempt to conjure up an Orwellian fantasy, a dark Orwellian fantasy where we're ruled not by the parliament, not by democracy, but by some unelected body tucked away somewhere. <laughs> and it's this sort of attempt, this is, this, this is the, the Liberal Party's new politics, because it's an attempt to undermine this parliament's uh, legitimacy, it's an attempt to undermine the policy intent of the government, it's an attempt to appeal to extremists and to fruitcakes who now populate the, uh, the activist base of the coalition. Yeah, yeah. And we know that the first signs of this, the first signs of this actually appeared last year, in February of last year, when Tony Abbott, just two days after uh, launching his climate change policy, met with Lord Monckton, a British lord, a British lord, he met with him in secret. Uh, Tony refused, uh, the member for Warringah refused to let us know what it was all about, <laughs> but the, but the uh, Lord Monckton told us what it was all about. He said um, that the proponents of climate change wanted to establish a world government that would shut, shut down democracy worldwide. So we can see that there's just sort of en elements of that in the uh, MPI today. And what else did Lord Monckton say after that uh, meeting? He said, uh, Lord Monckton added that Mr Abbott's policies to encourage tree planting and to help energy save industry would help address genuine environmental problems. And he said, it is indeed better to have a policy which nods to the issue of climate change for those who still believe, and there, and, and there are some diehards who still believe, that fixes some of the genuine environmental issues that are a lot cheaper than enormous amounts of money diverted to uh, uh, this ridiculous climate thing. And he said uh, that uh, it could be turned off 
He said it, he said it could be turned off if necessary. That's what uh, one of the things um, uh, Mr Monkton said. Lord Monkton. <laughs> Lord Monkton, yes, Lord Monkton said. Now... No, no, no. I was just, I was just looking forward, to, looking for what to miss. I'm just looking. I was just looking for what Mr. Turnbull later said. So that was what Lord. That's what Lord Monckton said. He said that this is a great policy. Eventually, we can, uh, we can. It, it gives a nod to climate change, and if necessary, can be easily turned off. Now we notice. Fast forward a year, the member for Wentworth goes on late line and says, "I think there are two virtues of this." from the point of Mr Abbott and Mr Hunt. One is it can be easily terminated. If in fact climate change has proved to not be real, which obviously some people believe, I don't, if you believe climate change is going to be proved unreal, a scheme like this can be brought to an end. So we can see here that from Lord Monckton to uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull's quotes that the, the opposition have basically got a policy uh, which is all about chicanery. It's all about conspiracy theories. It's all about uh, uh, designing a policy that will get them through the next election, provide them with a fig leaf for their resistance to the idea that the science is right. And we heard it in the member for Riverina's uh, defence of this motion. He clearly doesn't believe that climate change is a problem. And so the references in this uh, MPI to an unelected committee are really targeted at those, uh, as I said before, those uh, uh, extremists who now make up the coalition's activist base. Now, we then, heard, we then heard their attacks on good Australians. We heard their attacks on Kate Blanchett. We heard their attacks on Michael Caton, uh, people who are a great part of our cultural life, who have worked hard, who are our exports to the world. Uh, and we heard uh, uh, you know, Barnaby Joyce out there, Senator Joyce out there attacking Kate, saying she was hurting people. And we heard uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition in this parliament yesterday uh, abusing her for having an eco-mansion. And what this is, this deliberate bullying and abuse of Australian actors, this revolting political abuse that we just heard from the member for Riverina, what is an attempt to do is to paint good Australians as elitists. Mm -hmm. That's what it's an attempt to do. Yeah. It's an attempt, People and it's all part of this Boston then. Tea Party Republican revolt against the elites. Sarah Palin. That's the political appeal. To it. That's the strategy behind it. It's anti-elitist. It's pitchfork-wielding conspiracy theorists. And we saw them out the front here of this parliament at their carbon tax rally. And right behind the leader of the opposition's head was a sign saying, say no to the carbon tax for UN, IMF, global governments equals Agenda 21, genocide agenda. I mean, this is a sort of, this is a sort of, these are the sort of people who are, uh, who are supporting the opposition. And so we have this this, I mean, poor Kate Blanchett. Poor Kate Blanchett. She must have thought that she was back in the Lord of the Rings, surrounded by hobgoblins, surrounded by orcs, these horrible Denzians of the political world, horrible Denzians of the conservative world, attacking her, you know, having a go at her. The member for Warringah down here, you know, the golem of Australian politics, clutching his precious ring of negativity precious ring of opposition, you know, desperately attempting to extract the last morsels of political gain out of his uh, opposition to sensible Australians, verbaling Dr Garneau. This is, the, this is the opposition's political strategy. It has nothing to do with good policy in this country. It's all about pandering to foreign extremists like Lord uh, Monckton. So we've got you know, this pandering to Lord Monckton, meeting with him in private. So, oh, Lord Monckton, your views are so good. And then talking about elected committees. Well, at least they're committees of Australians. At least they're not foreign lords. I mean, at least we're not appealing to this weird collection of international conspiracy theorists. And all I can say is that if that's, their, if that's really the opposition strategy, it is not going to work. It is simply a strategy that is designed to cover up their massive divisions. And their divisions are big. It, because we have, on one hand, the believers in climate change, and there are many in the opposition, and they are horrified at the position their party is taking. And then we have those, like the member for Riverina, who are quite happy to deny climate change, who are quite happy to do anything, who are quite happy to quote, quote environmentalists who put it all on black, all on some technology turning up in the future. And if we have a problem, well, we'll just learn to adapt as a planet burns and, and the next generation of uh, of uh, Australians and uh, citizens around the world have to deal with an ever-increasing warmer planet and all the consequences go, on, uh, go, over, go with that. 
We have a strategy that basically is, you know, to sort of get through the next election with this policy of direct subsidy, which will cost the nation $30 billion, $30 billion to top end polluters. And if no, you know, if there are no changes in that, it might by 2050 change cost the future government $18 billion a year. I mean, that will be the, the small investment. That will be the small investment the coalition makes, this, this weird sort of pork barrelling exercise for, uh, uh, for the big end of town. And this is what the Liberal Party, Liberal Party is now degenerated to. It's why Fraser and Hewson and others are walking away from you, because what has happened is that the Liberal Party, this once great bastion of moderation, in Australian politics has become this sort of home for foreign extremists, for bizarre ideologies of world government. And, and, it, and it rejects the influence of sensible Australians, sensible, decent, hardworking Australians like Clay Blanchett. And we hear this abuse in the parliament of a great Australian actress, a great Australian actor like Michael Caton, this sort of abuse of good Australians. And why do we have this? Why do we have this, this sort of uh, this, this political strategy? Well, it's to deny the undeniable, and we know last, uh, you know, we know um, a couple of uh, a little while ago that uh, the member for Flinders said, well, this is what he said in his honour thesis: the market system is a preferable regime as it ensures that the polluter bears full responsibility for the cost of his or her conduct. And we know that the shadow treasurer, the member for North Sydney, said last year, well, uh, inevitably we'll have a price on carbon. We'll have to. Inevitably, we'll have a price on carbon. We'll have to. So the member for North Sydney knows that one day we'll price carbon, and the member for Flinders knows we'll price carbon. The only people who won't admit it are people like the member for Riverina. And basically, what they want to engage in is this appealing to conspiracy theories, listening to foreign extremists, abusing good Australians, purging all reason and good policy from their party, and finally ignoring the national interest and the moral obligation we have to future generations. Order. It appears the discussion has concluded. <laughs> I call the Attorney General. Yes, I uh, seek leave to make a ministerial statement concerning Cyber Security Awareness Week. I understand uh, the, it is a wish of the House to grant leave. There being no objection, leave is granted. The Attorney General. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Yesterday, uh, Senator Stephen Conroy, the Minister for Broadband uh, Communications and the Digital Economy, and I launched National Cyber Security Awareness Week. Uh, this event is about spreading the message that we all have an important role to play in improving our cyber security. The internet, of course, is now part of our daily routine, from sending emails and doing business to reading the newspaper, planning a holiday or even to search the yellow pages. It's literally become quite impossible for most of us to imagine surviving a day without using the internet in some way. And while the internet has the potential to make our day-to-day -day lives richer and easier, we must, of course, be vigilant to our online security. Advances in the technologies we use and the reasons we use them have been accompanied by developments in the number and type of cyber security threats that we face. And that's why the Australian government has made cyber security a top national priority and has invested significantly in enhancing our cyber security capabilities. Our strategy focuses on three main objectives. Firstly, securing our own government systems. Second, working in partnership with the private sector. And third, reaching out to individual Australians to assist them to deal with problems that they may encounter. Dealing firstly with the government systems, the security of government systems is important not only to ensure the continuity of services to all Australians, but also to protect the personal information of citizens that governments hold. We've established the Cyber Security Operations Centre in the Defence Signals Directorate to provide government with a complete picture of the online security landscape and the capability to respond to cyber incidents. ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, has also established a specialist cyber investigations unit to investigate and provide advice on state-sponsored cyber attacks against Australian interests. We've also announced our intention to accede to the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime 
which is the only binding international treaty on cybercrime. But the government, of course, is only one player. Business is crucial. And that brings me to the second pillar of the government strategy, working with the Australian business community. The Computer Emergency Response Team, Australia, or CERT Australia as it's known, provides a direct link between government and the private sector and seeks to improve cyber security for all Australian internet users by developing and sharing information about significant threats and vulnerabilities within Australian businesses, including, for instance, banks, utilities and phone companies. Additionally, the Internet Service Provider Code of Practice, or the IISP Code of Practice, requires internet service providers to assist home users and businesses to stay secure online. The iCode, as it's known, aims to promote a cyber security culture within ISPs and provide a consistent approach uh, among ISPs to inform, educate and protect their customers in relation to cyber security. The Australian Government also put in place crisis management arrangements in the event of a major cyber incident. To test these arrangements, the Australian Government, along with over 50 businesses and government agencies, participated in last year's International Cyberstorm 3 exercise. That exercise allowed us to test our preparedness for cyber threats and to strengthen relationships with business uh, and uh, with our international partners. This means if something goes wrong, the government and the private, private sector have drilled and can work together to fix the problem. The government is also taking action to ensure that all Australians are aware of the cyber risks uh, that they face and that they take steps to protect themselves online. One very valuable tool available to home users is the Stay Smart Online website, which provides a free alert service and information on the latest cyber threats and how to address those threats. Yesterday, the government also launched the new version of the BUD-E Cyber Safety and Security Education uh, Package. BUD-E provides interactive, self-learning modules for primary and secondary school students, including advice on malware, how to secure personal information online, and safe social networking practices. Yesterday, Minister Conroy announced the development of another government initiative aimed at keeping young people safe online, and that is the Easy Guide to Socialising Online, which aims, aims to improve understanding of the risks associated with dis disclosing information about themselves or other family members and ways in which privacy can be maintained. I also draw the attention of parents and teachers to another program which is aimed at protecting children. The Think You Know program has been developed by the Minister for Home Affairs and Justice, the Honourable Brendan O'Connor, and provides interactive training to parents, carers and teachers through primary and secondary schools across Australia using a network of accredited trainers. A particularly useful tool for home users is the Cyber Safety Help button. The button is a free application that can be downloaded, giving internet users, particularly children, easy access to cyber safety information and assistance. The button is specifically designed to provide younger internet users with a confidential means of immediately notifying of content of concern and drawing it to the attention of authorities. Another important initiative that I launched this week is the second edition of the highly successful booklet entitled Protecting Yourself Online, What Everyone Needs to Know. The government launched the first edition of the booklet last year and already more than 438,000 copies have distribu been distributed through libraries, internet service providers, community legal services, government agencies and programs, and I hope also through a number of members' electoral offices. This second edition builds on the first with updates that reflect the changing cyber landscape. It also highlights new government initiatives with links to resources to educate home users on potential risks and the starting points when looking for help. The publication promotes eight simple steps that can significantly enhance internet security. Those steps include advice in respect to uh, installing and renewing your security software 
to set it to the to, sorry to set it to scan regularly, uh, to turn on automatic updates on all your software, including your operating system and other applications, to think carefully before you click on links and attachments, particularly in emails and on social networking sites, to regularly adjust, adjust your privacy settings on social networking sites, to report or talk to someone about anything online that makes you feel uncomfortable or threatened, and to download the government's cyber safety help button, to stop and think before you post any photos or financial or personal information about yourself, your friends or your family, to use strong, strong passwords and change them at least twice a year, and to talk generally with your family about good online safety. I encourage all members to read the booklet and to promote it within their electorates. It is a good item to include in members' newsletters and I can provide members with additional information if that would assist them to promote uh, this resource through their electorate. The booklet itself is available for download and in hard copy format. I hope members will also take the opportunity to participate in some of the many events that are taking place as part of National Cyber Security Awareness Week. Mr Deputy Speaker, we all have an interest in maintaining a secure internet and members of parliament can play an important part in making sure that all of the community uh, is cyber security and aware. And to assist members, I table a schedule of useful links and contacts on the assistance that is available for their constituents. Uh, and, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I now ask leave of the House to move a motion to enable the member for Stirling to speak for nine minutes. I understand it's the wish of the House to grant leave, and there being no objection, leave is granted. The Attorney-General. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the member for Stirling speaking in reply to the Minister's statement for a period not exceeding nine minutes. I put the question as moved by the Attorney-General. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I call the member for Stirling. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Attorney-General for his statement. Um, as he has pointed out, cyber security is a top national security priority and the government has the opposition's support in enhancing our capabilities and defences. The cyber security challenge is vast. We have now entered the age of cyber warfare, where one nation's offensive capabilities can paralyse a target nation, causing chaos not only in its military response, but in its key economic sectors as well. Banking and finance, transport, electricity, manufacturing, medical, education, uh, and of course, government. All are now dependent on computers for their daily operations. There are nations in our region that are known to have such an offensive capability. Of course, such is the nature of the electronic theatre that physical proximity and the problems of supply lines are no longer relevant. Australia's formidable natural defences may as well not exist in an interconnected world. In fact, at a recent computer security conference, the whole cyber world uh, was likened to the North German plane. This nation must therefore commit itself to the task of closing the capability gap. However, it is not just in the science fiction world of cyber warfare that threats reside. The internet and in-house computer systems are an ideal environment for terrorism, organised crime and industrial sabotage. The threat is not merely that of lost money or stolen information. Many private systems are important components of our critical infrastructure, the failure of which would wreak havoc in the civilian population. The Coalition strongly supports government's efforts to help maximise, its critical, to help maximise security in critical systems. However, as the government plans to go ahead with their national broadband network, it is alarming that there has been little talk from the government about the security risks that might be associated with that network. The Australian Federal Police have expressed their concerns in their submission to the Joint Committee on Cyber Safety uh, on the 25th of June last year. That submission stated, the national broadband network is a case in point. The AFP, with other Australian government agencies, is working to minimise the criminal exploitation of the NBN. 
The inherent risk of the MBM is that it would facilitate the continued growth and sophistication of online criminal syndicates' ability to commit cyber offences against online systems due to the attractiveness of the increased speed. Increased bandwidth available via the NBN may result in increased bandwidth available for committing or facilitating computer offences. The submission went on to say, the, uh, the proliferation of a large number of retail service providers has the potential to increase the difficulty of law enforcement, uh, the, to increase the difficulty, the difficulty law enforcement has to obtain telecommunications data. The Coalition strongly supports the AFP's concerns that security must be at the centre of the NBN initiative as cybercrime rises. Also of concern to the Coalition are the increasing cyber attacks on major resource companies such as Woodside Petroleum, BHP Billiton and ExxonMobil. It has been suggested that foreign hackers are looking for clues on government and business attitudes to major resources projects and foreign investment along with intelligence on overseas activity. Malicious cyber activity is increasing to a point where systems in both government and the private sector are under continuous attack. It was alarming to hear in February this year the security think tank, the Kokoda Foundation, which released a report that concluded Australia is increasingly ill-equipped to deal with cyber attacks on the nation's energy, water, transport and communication systems. The report states that cyber security has become Australia's fundamental weakness. The opposition is deeply concerned, given Labor's cuts to our national security agencies in the latest budget, that the government are not taking Australia's security as seriously as they should. Finally, as the Attorney-General has said, there are problems that individual Australians may encounter in the online environment every day. We are all familiar with online scams privacy issues and cyberbullying, as well as a serious issue of the transmission of unlawful material such as child pornography and terrorist material. The attorney has, has tabled a helpful list of resources available to individuals and businesses. I commend the agencies responsible for the production of this material and I endorse the attorney's call for members of this place uh, to keep them within our electorate offices and distribute them to our constituents as appropriate. The, the uh, clerk. Government business, order of the day number one. Migration amendment, strengthening the character test and other provisions bill 2011, second reading. I, the House of Mackenzie, the bill in detail. Oh, sorry, yeah. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I'll call the clerk. Second reading. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 and for related purposes. Okay. I, I, the House will now consider the bill in detail and I understand it is the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole. The question is that the bill be agreed to. I call the member for Cook. I move, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move the amendment circulated in my name. The amendment will ensure that the provisions of this bill to strengthen the provisions relating to general criminal conduct under the character test will apply to all persons who are not citizens, not just those who are in or should be held in detention. The minister has opposed the amendment, claiming it will cause chaos in the processing of tourist visas and deny access to subclass 976 visas provided through the Electronic Travel Authority, or ETA. There are some points I wish to bring to the minister's attention. Firstly, it is the government's preference, it is the government's preference that persons with any criminal conviction, including those carrying a custodial sentence of less than 12 months, apply for a 676 tourist visa rather than a 976 ETA visa. Now, how do I know this? Well, it says so on their website. It says, criminal convictions, if you have had any criminal convictions in any country, you may want to consider applying for a tourist visa, subclass 676, rather than an ETA. If arriving on an ETA with criminal convictions, you could be refused entry into Australia. Now, I concur with the government's advice, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, because 
offences that would attract a 12-month sentence or less in the UK, for example, include communicating a bomb threat and various forms of assault. And I think it's important that we know about these sort of things before people come to our country, or at least have the opportunity to know. The requirement to notify of criminal conviction carrying sentences of less than 12 months is also not uncommon in Western countries. For example, it is standard requirement in both the United States and Canada. In fact, it is also a standard requirement in China, India and Russia. Secondly, the condition to deny a person access to a 976 ETA visa is provided for under the Migration Regulations, not Section 501 of the Migration Act, as that is, that is the subject of this amendment. Regulations relating to the 976 visa, ETA visa stipulate regulation number 8528 as a condition that must be imposed with respect to the 976 ETA visa. It is regulation 8528 that sets the bar of a 12-month custodial sentence for the ETA, not section 501 of the Act that is the subject of my amendment. The amendment I move today does not alter construction of the conditions set out in Regulation 8528. It will continue to operate as it always has. As a result, the ETA process will not be compromised by the amendment that I've put forward. The Minister's objection is a red herring and he should know it. Thirdly and finally, the character test consideration is a separate issue to the decision whether or not to deny or cancel a visa. The decision to deny or cancel is discretionary. Using the Minister's logic, every application for an ETA visa should currently be scrutinised under the general conduct provisions of the test. This is not done as these matters are triaged, triaged as they would continue to be under my amendment. The Minister has a problem with making decisions, Mr Deputy Speaker. He has a problem with his discretionary powers under the Migration Act. In the earlier comments I made on this bill, we made it clear that on several occasions the minister had refused to use his discretionary powers and simply allowed the opportunity to pass him by. Rather than seeking to delegate such decisions wherever possible, uh, whether it's to the courts or his department or, as I just mentioned, just letting it go or just ignoring it, uh, this is an issue the minister clearly has problems with. Uh, and the amendment that I've put forward would enable the same test to apply to someone on one side of the fence as it did on other sides of the fence. If the minister was of a mind to ensure that we had clear standards about acceptable uh, conduct and behaviour, he would apply the provisions across the board and make whatever consequent adjustments he believed necessary, either by a direction under section 499 or change regulations to achieve the desired outcome. But with prima facie, what I put out here today, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that is unnecessary, it would appear, because the change that uh, I'm making is to 501 of the Migration Act, not to the regulations, which is where the ETA is considered and uh, made clear. So the ETA, ETA position is not affected by this. The minister can, the minister can make all sorts of fear-mongering campaigns as he's like, as he's issued a statement in the last 24 hours saying my amendment will bring down the tourism industry. But what he does know is if this amendment is passed, the ETA will operate as it always has. What he needs to do is understand whether he wants to use his discretion under the Act to ensure that people who come to this country abide by our laws, our rules. It's his government that abolished the community expectations test from the uh, directive provided to department decision makers. It's his government that rolled back the strong border protection laws that have put us in the situation we are now in. It is his government, and this minister in particular, that's refused to reuse the discretion that is available to him. He continues to obfuscate, and I commend the amendment to the House. The question is that the amendment be agreed to call the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship. Thank you, Mr <coughs> Deputy Speaker. I don't intend to detain the House for long because this is clearly a stunt from the opposition. As I said last night, we have the situation where the opposition's position on this bill is that it doesn't go far enough and it's not necessary. It's not necessary, he's been saying for weeks, we don't need to do this, it's completely unnecessary. And now he came out last night and said, but it's not going far enough. What the Shadow Minister has done in his contribution just then is retrospectively fit his amendment to his rhetoric. In his second reading contribution yesterday, he said that this amendment was necessary because if somebody who is in Australia uh, on a visa commits an offence, and he used the example of Northies or down at the club, I think he used the example of the Coogee Bay Hotel, um, that the Australian people deserve to know that if they're committed of an offence, they could then be deported. What he didn't outline to the House is the implications for people who are applicants for visas, because I suspect he didn't even realise that was the import of his amendment. He's addressing it now. He didn't address it last night. He explained to the House last night. 
He explained, he explained to the House last night the import of his amendment, and he was talking about the implications of this amendment for people in Australia on temporary or permanent visas. At no stage did he say to the House last night that this would have an impact on Member tourist applications, on 457 applications or any other. I pointed that out to the House last night, and now the Shadow Minister has gone back to his office and retrofitted his rhetoric to fit his amendment. He probably got his legal advice from George Brandis again, Mr Deputy Speaker, and you always get in trouble when you do that. You always get in trouble when you do that. You really need to get a better lawyer. But what we have here is a situation, Mr Deputy Speaker, where the member for Cook should point out the problem he's trying to fix. Show us the problem he's trying to fix. Which tourist, which tourist committed an offence in another country and then came to Australia and had caused trouble in Australia, which is covered by this legislation? Which 457 visa holder? Who, which case is the shadow minister pointing to in relation to justifying this uh, amendment? Now, very clearly, the opposition and the government agree that the character test was not strong enough for people in detention because people in detention uh, can impact on government property, can impact on the well-being of Commonwealth employees and employees working on behalf of the Commonwealth, not to mention, of course, other detainees. Very, very serious issues. And there have been a number of instances under governments of this persuasion and governments of that persuasion where people in detention have committed offences with a penalty of less than 12 months and the government has not been able to exercise the character power. It's happened under Minister Ruddock, it's happened under Minister Evans, it's happened under me. I've taken the view to recommend to the House that that situation be changed, and the House endorsed that last night. Now, the member for Cook found himself in a, a bit of a political situation where he thought, well, I can't just back the government, I'm going to have to look tougher. What I do best is beating my chest. How am I going to beat my chest if I just go in and support the government's legislation? I know what I'll do. I'll cook up an amendment. I'll, I'll bring in the issues about tourists and 457 visas and all sorts of other people, Mr Deputy Speaker. The member for Cook used the term red herring. Well, if the member for Cook, if the member for Cook looks in the mirror, he'll see a red herring in relation to this amendment, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is a stunt and a farce, and I would invite the honourable member to call a division. If you really believe this is important, there's plenty of members in the House, call a division on this amendment. Bring it on. Let's have a division. Let's see if every member of the opposition lines up behind the member for Cook. Let's see if every single member of the opposition supports the member for Cook. Uh, it hasn't stopped the member, the member opposite calling a division before if the, member, if the independents don't support him. We know the independents won't support him. What we do know also is it is unlikely to get the support of the Liberal Party room for this amendment. Therefore, he runs from a division. If you have nothing to hide, then call a division. If you are hiding divisions in your party room, then no call the division. I suspect, Mr Spe Deputy Speaker, we know the answer. He will not call a division. He will not call a division because he cannot rely on the support of every party room member, every Liberal Party room member on that side of the House. We know that the Liberal Party is divided on many issues. They're divided on this issue because there are several members opposite who think this amendment is a joke, as it is. Order. The question is that the amendment be agreed to or call the member for Cook. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I noted the bluster of the minister, but he failed to address the issue that he raised in the House last night. Now, I flagged this amendment to the House that I believed that, uh, and I raised this in the briefing also with the, with the minister's uh, department and uh, with those of his own office, and I, I asked the question at that time. Why are we only strengthening the character test for those in detention and not for all of those on visas, as we, we currently have these applications apply right across the board? And uh, there was no answer. I hadn't thought of it. Now, I understand last night the minister must have thought of it after that because they certainly hadn't thought of it before then, before I'd raised it. But the minister didn't give me the courtesy of replies to the issue that I'd raised with his staff, so I brought, I brought the amendment forward. Now, the amendment uh, deals very specifically uh, with changes to section 501 of the Act. Now, last night in this place, the minister said that this amendment would not work because it would require a, a complete collapse of the electronic travel authority system, um, which would destroy the tourism industry. And he even was so bold to talk about my previous time as a, as a managing director of Tourism Australia, and he said I should have known this. Well, the minister should actually understand his own regulations and his own act. He, he came into this place last night and said this amendment could not be practically operational. Effectively, that's what he said. And today in this place, in putting forward this amendment, I have made it very clear to the minister, and I have set it out, that the requirement to consider 
someone's criminal, criminal convictions under the ETA, which would bar them effectively from making an ETA application, is provided for under Regulation 8528, and it reads, the holder must not have one or more criminal convictions for which the sentence or sentences, whether served or not, are for a total period of 12 months duration or more at the time of travel to and entry into Australia. Now, that is where the power is created to bar someone access to the ETA. It is not an automatic um, progress from Section 501 of the Act of the Character Test into that regulation. But even still, even still, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm sure the Minister's still listening, even still he knows that if he wanted to support this amendment and he wanted to have the same rules for everyone on one side of the fence as on the other, then he could quite easily introduce regulations and he could quite, quite easily introduce a directive under section 499 of the Act to ensure that these matters were operational. Now, I'm happy for the minister to tell me where these things are out of place. I mean, after all, he has 9,000 people working for him in the Department of Immigration. On the opposition side, there are a few of us here working together with our staff and our officers, and we have some experience in dealing with these matters. But at the end of the day, it is for the minister to be able to come into this place and understand specifically what occurs under the act he administers and under the regulations. Now, I put it to the minister, if it is not regulation 8528, that is the key issue here for the operation of the Ele Electronic Travel Authority, that I'm happy for him to correct me. I'm happy for him to set me straight. And equally, on top of that, the minister can also advise what changes he could therefore make to the regulations and what directives he could give under section 499 to make sure that they were operational. And I'm sure he'd get support from the opposition to do that, because we are supporting this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker. We are supporting the bill, and uh, we will ensure that this bill passes through this place and through the other place. But in making this point, we offer the, the, the opportunity for the minister to ensure uh, that uh, we would be in a position to have this change effected. Now, if the government is not prepared to support the opposition in making this amendment, then frankly, there's no point for a division. There's no point for a division, minister, because it will not go through this place. And I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to waste this chamber's time uh, with the government's uh, refusal to cooperate in a bipartisan way with the opposition over something of this nature. The coalition have provided the government with support for their measure. We've put forward a practical proposal, which in our understanding we believe can work. If the government doesn't believe that's the case, well, I'm open for the, the government to actually tell me how this can be made operational at an operational level. But from what I've seen to date, it would seem that the regulations are quite clear and changes to section 501 of the Act would not impact on the operation of the ETA system. But even still, even still, if the minister believes it does require a change, I'm sure those changes can be made to the regulations and can be made all otherwise by the form of a directive under section 499. The question is that the amendment be agreed to call the Minister for Immigration and citizenship. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm happy to address the matters raised by the Shadow Minister. Firstly, the Shadow Minister raised why the difference, and I actually did address that last night and addressed that earlier this evening, and again, I'm happy to, spread, to spill it out uh, very clearly, as clearly as I can, for the Shadow Minister today. The changes proposed by the government are there to fix a problem. The changes proposed by the opposition are a solution in search of a problem. The Leader of the Opposition, uh, the Shadow Minister, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, he might be Leader of the Opposition soon, but he's not yet. The Shadow Minister for Immigration uh, has not outlined the problem he's trying to fix. When you bring in a change to legislation, it's normal practice to outline to the House what's wrong with the existing legislation, what's wrong with the character test as it applies to tourists and 457 and all non permanent, all, all uh, non-citizen and visa holders in this country. There are four and a half million applications for permanent and temporary visas in Australia uh, each year. And so what the Shadow Minister needs to do is point out where the problem is he's trying to fix. Now in relation to detention, people in the detention, the government has pointed out that offences committed in detention uh, can result in damage to public property, can result in uh, harm to Commonwealth employees and to people in our care, uh, that is to say, uh, detainees. So, of course, there have been a series of events which have shown that the character test needed to be strengthened, would benefit from more clarity in being strengthened. The Shadow Minister, in search of a political solution, 
which I completely understand, and that's his role as Shadow Minister to find political solutions to political challenges for the opposition, has put forward this amendment. But it is not an, a, a solution to a public policy problem, because there is no public policy problem which he has identified. I invite the Shadow Minister again to show us which example, which example of uh, somebody who's come to Australia who had a custodial sentence for less than 12 months at some point in their future, in their past, has gone on to cause a problem in Australia. Now, I will deal with the matter of ETAs because the Shadow Minister has chosen to verbal me or, alternatively, he has misunderstood. And I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say he didn't understand what I was saying last night. I was actually pointing out last night exactly what the Shadow Minister is pointing out, that there is an inconsistency, that ETAs, which apply to people who come to Australia from several countries, would not be covered and, would, and therefore, uh, you would have an inconsistency in terms of how this uh, amendment would be implemented. That if you came from certain countries, you'd be covered in a certain way. If you came from other countries, you'd be covered in another way. And that this had not been thought through by the Shadow Minister, with due respect to him. Uh, he, this was a thought bubble uh, cooked up as a solution to making him look tougher, to look tougher. As a result, uh, he would implement a system which would mean that the department would have to uh, uh, devote, devote considerably more resources or see processing times blow out very substantially for tourists, for 457 visas, etc. And I just wonder what the tourism industry would think about that. I wonder what the resources industry would think about that. What, what industries in search of more skilled labour would think about that. This government's worked hard to reduce the processing times for 457 visas and achieve considerable results, much better processing times than in years past. But yet we see this nonsensical amendment from the opposition, I invite him to call a division. Uh, the member for Cook. In addressing the uh, minister's points he's just raised, I'm reading the statement that he's issued today, where he said, under the proposed amendment, every person with even the most minor conviction would fail the character test, which could result in visa rejection. Now, it's interesting, Mr Deputy Speaker, because every person arriving on an ETA right now under that class of visa, when they present themselves at the airport and they've filled out their bit of, about criminal conviction, can be rejected right there and then. And my point about the amendment is it changes nothing in terms of the normal operation of the department in issuing visas, whether it's tourist visas, whether it's skilled visas, uh, whether it's 457 visas, whether it's family reunion visas, whether it's humanitarian visas. The amendment I have put forward makes no change to the smooth working of any of those operations. But I can tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, what has caused a change to the smooth running of this department, and that was the decision of this government in August of 2008 to abolish the uh, border protection regime put forward and run successfully under the Howard government. Under that regime, once it was abolished by this government, we have gone into absolute chaos. The costs of associated with managing asylum seekers has gone from $100 million a year to more than a $1 billion a year. Now, if the minister is concerned about the impacts on the smooth running of the department of government policy changes or indeed opposition amendments, I would, I would caution him and I would ask him to look at the record of this government because there is one thing that has gridlocked this department, gridlocked uh, business visa applications, gridlocked family reunion applications, gridlocked every form of visa application consideration uh, all around the full spectrum of what's offered under this country. And my office and members' offices on our side constantly have had stories brought to them of frustrations in dealing with visa applications, and they have been told, including humanitarian applicants, I should stress, and matters brought to me by um, members of the Salvation Army, bringing to me specifically cases of humanitarian applications that have been delayed and not considered and rejected on the simple grounds that the, the government, basically their program, had been overwhelmed by those who'd come by boat. And that was the advice they got from this department. So the minister may want to come to this dispatch box and he may want to say, uh, as he has said in his statements that he's issued, uh, that an amendment put forward by the coalition to try and ensure that we have a consistency in our laws. That's the issue he should be addressing. Now, if, he's, if he doesn't think there is a problem, if he doesn't think there is an issue in our community of those who are on visas um, breaking the law, if he thinks that doesn't happen, 
If he thinks uh, that all around the country, that every person that comes here un in a, under a visa never gets themselves into trouble or never gets themselves engaged in disorderly conduct and never has one drink too many or never engages in assault or never engages in any sort of offence, then he should pick up the phone not just to the president of Nauru to fix his other problem, but he should pick up the phone to the New South Wales Police Commissioner. He should pick up the phone to the New South Wales Police Service, who deal with these incidents on a constant basis. And what they tell me is what they want to see is a consistency in the approach applied to non-citizens. And so if there is the added sanction, if there is the added opportunity, that those who, who choose to act up while they're guests of our country may well face for a conviction of less than 12 months a clear failure of the character test and the, and the minister then taking a decision to uh, deny, cancel their visas, uh, then that is something that I think would be a welcome addition to the opportunities that are available to those who are seeking to enforce our laws, not just in New South Wales but all around the country. So the minister can choose to stay with inconsistency as opposed in his bill, or he can choose the path of consistency. It will not have the implications suggested by the minister. He hasn't been able to demonstrate that. He's come back into this House today with no backup for his claim that this would cause havoc. The only thing that's caused havoc in our immigration department is the way that this government has dealt with the asylum seeker management and refugee policy. Now the question is, the minister, uh, the, the amendment be agreed to. I call the minister for immigration and citizenship. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Again, uh, the opposition uh, shadow spokesman uh, attempts to verbal me and the government. He says the government believes, or I believe, that people who come to Australia on visas uh, never commit criminal offences. I have not said that. In fact, uh, what we have is a situation where the current regime works. In fact, non-citizens who have been sentenced to a term of imprisonment in Australia for 12 months or all are already identified at the rate of about 60 people of interest per month. That just shows the system works. Now, what the shadow minister needs to do, what the shadow minister needs to do, is indicate where there has been a problem which this legislation seeks to fix. That's what the shadow minister needs to do. Now, the shadow minister has again said. Uh, that he will not call a division because he won't win the division. Now, I've been in this House uh, now for seven years. I can recall a number of instances where oppositions have called divisions when they didn't think they were going to win. Every division ever called in any of the previous parliaments before this one, uh, for example, and several divisions called during this parliament. Uh, I'm sure this is a new precedent. I'm sure the member for uh, Cook will let the member for Sturt know that this is a new rule. You don't call a division unless you think you're going to win it. Uh, otherwise, the House is entitled to conclude that the Shadow Minister for Immigration is not calling a division because he cannot rely on the support of his own party. Well, well call a division. I can't, under the standing rules. You can. Cook, you can. Member for call Cook, it. the Minister will not respond to the interjections. Um, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. Uh, the question now is that this bill be agreed to. Uh, the question now is the amendment be agreed to. All in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary. No. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the noes have it. Um, is a division required? Division is not required. Uh, the, uh, the bill has been um, agreed to. Uh, Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading immediately. Is leave granted? There being no opposition, leave is granted. Minister? I move the bill will now be read for a third time. Clerk? The, uh, the question is that the bill will be now read a third time. All in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Clerk? Third reading. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 and for related purposes. Okay. Minister? Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that order of the day number two, government business, be postponed until a later hour this day. Well, the question is that the order of the day number two, government business, be postponed until a later hour this day. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. Uh, the ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Government business, order of the day number three, families, housing, community services and Indigenous affairs and other legislation amendment, further election commitments and other measures bill 2011, resumption of debate on the second reading. Now, the question is that this bill will be agreed to. I call the member for Robertson. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I was speaking in support of the Families, Housing, Community Service and Indigenous Affairs and Other Legislations Amendment Further Election Commitment and Other Measures Bill 2011. 
Uh, in essence, for those who are listening and just picking up this debate, which is uh, in continuation from yesterday evening, um, the, the matter under discussion is really the provision of flexibility for families seeking in advance on their family uh, benefit, their family payment benefit. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, just to pick up uh, the threads of where I was up to yesterday evening, I'm, I'm very proud to support this reform because it represents this government's strong and proud record of sensible and practical reforms to the welfare system. This flies in the face of the general criticisms of those offered. They, have, uh, they are strident in their false claims that this government hasn't succeeded with the reform agenda. They're strident in their claims that positive economic and welfare um, reform cannot be achieved. And they're strident in their false claims that reform cannot occur in this parliament. As the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport Leader of the House put on the record last Thursday, the 26th of May, as of 1.30 last Thursday, the Gillard Labor government has passed 112 pieces of legislation through this House in eight months. And this compares with 108 bills passed in the first 12 months of the Howard government. Apart from uh, productivity and efficiency, however, Mr Deputy Speaker, this legislation reveals our Labor government's commitment to improving the life outcomes for all Australians. Mr Deputy Speaker, I represent an electorate with a high proportion of young families on low to middle incomes. The electorate of Robertson is an electorate with a high residential population, many of whom make the daily commute to Sydney or Newcastle for work. One of my great ambitions as the member for Robertson is to, level the, uh, to see the level of youth employment and participation increase. I'll always seek improvement in this area because sustained and stable employment is vital for young families with mortgages and tight budgets. But quite often these families, some of whom are on a single income, do rely on welfare payments when balancing their family budget. And balancing the family budget can be a critical element of enabling young people to continue in education and enabling young people to continue in training. I am also confronted with these concerns when I meet constituents as I am door knocking through my electorate. This legislation is a step towards assisting regular Aussies who need a bit of flexibility to manage the challenges that life throws up at all of us from time to time. Uh, recently, I attended an event named the Peninsula Lynx Day. This event was organised by the Peninsula Lynx Steering Committee, and it was an innovative effect, uh, impact, uh, innovative uh, project brought together by uh, great leadership from our local Centrelink agency. The vision for the day is to link customers, clients, and companions to various agencies within the Central Coast. I'm proud to represent an electorate where the charitable and community organisations are strong and well organised and have great support throughout the community. This was demonstrated certainly on the Peninsula Links Day, where a variety of community organisations were present to meet the different needs of the community and discuss the real and pressing concerns of many of our local families. Many of uh, these local organisations operate on a non-for-profit basis um, and provide a great support to our local community. This extends to legal services, problem gambling and uh, financial advice which is critical to this bill. Community organisations and charity can play an indispensable role in providing support to those who cannot afford it or access it. But I'm not one who believes that community organisations in any way can supplant or uh, remove the obligations of the Australian government in providing a strong and efficient system of practical welfare. Whilst I believe that there are limits to what welfare can achieve, and that obviously welfare must be provided efficiently and effectively. Welfare must not be determined according to arbitrary ideolo ideological factors. Rather, it needs to be able to respond to the complex realities of ordinary lives. Our eyes remain focused on the practical need for welfare to support families. I wish to address the second component of this legislation uh, before the House this evening, and that is the Healthy Start for School initiative. This initiative will implement a condition upon the Family Tax Benefit Part A for parents and carers of four-year-olds. The condition is that children of four years of age go through a basic health assessment check, such as the Healthy Kids Check. Now, This would fulfil an important objective to ensure that children are healthy, both physically and emotionally, and, and also socially, when they commence school that they're prepared for learning. 
Health checks can also have the aim of helping with the detection of early lifestyle risk factors and delayed development and illnesses. These are varied and include illnesses such as vision and hearing problems, in addition to intellectual, social and emotional delays. It's been demonstrated quite clearly that health checks and the guidance they provide and the opportunities for early intervention and access to support can provide incredibly power to, powerful positive results for low income families and children being brought up in those contexts. This is in no way meant to criticise the parents of, on low incomes. Incomes are not an indication of love or care or ingenuity or a capacity to manage on a limited budget. But this legislation does recognise that in many cases, guidance in relation to healthy lifestyles and early intervention is really a very important thing. I passionately believe that education is the primary means for enabling patterns of disadvantage to be broken down and to enable more Australians to access and thrive in the uh, mainstream Australian economy. There, it's worth, um, there is nothing to gain by leaving some of our fellow Australians behind. Indeed, it's a core labour value that a quality system of public education is provided to enable the disadvantaged to access mainstream economic and social life. What we must always understand is that the early childhood years can be the most important in providing the foundations of a quality education and a good life. It's also at early childhood that academic, emotional and social concerns are very easily addressed. I believe that this healthy start to school is a fundamental part of this package to reduce disadvantage in our community. It's also much more economically and socially effective to address these issues at an early stage of life. The reforms about which I've spoken are important in terms of giving all Australians access to the opportunities of a great economy. They also provide families with the necessary flexibility to manage their own finances in, at times when uh, the washing machine breaks down or somebody in the family becomes unwell. I commend the bill to the House. Uh, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Blair. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I speak in support of the, uh, of the Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs and other legislation amendment, further election commitments and other measures, Bill 2011. Deputy Speaker, there are three main measures here, all in fulfilment of election commitments that we made. The first measure, the better access to uh, family payments, more flexible advanced payments of family tax benefit, uh, will improve the lot of 1.5 million Australians. The Healthy Start for School um, initiative will uh, actually affect uh, 92,000 children. And the Strengthening Compliance Child Support, it, it's estimated by Treasury, will have a benefit to the Australian taxpayer by reducing by uh, $78.6 million family tax benefit payments as child support payments increase and people fulfil their parental responsibility uh, to care for their children, regardless of the marital circumstances, whether they're married or separated. Deputy Speaker, Family Tax Benefit A is an initiative, of course, of the, uh, of the Commonwealth Government. Uh, it's A and B. Uh, Family Tax Benefit A is the main payment designed to help with the raising of the cost of children. Uh, it's payable to a parent or a guardian or an approved care organisation for a child under 21 years or a dependent full-time student between 21 and 24 years of age. Family Tax Benefit B is designed to provide assistance to families who really have one main source of income, uh, including sole parent families with a dependent full-time student up to the age of 18 years. Deputy Speaker, uh, in August 2010, under our election package, uh, better access to family payments, uh, the Federal Labor Party, the Australian Labor Party, committed ourselves to simplifying and making flexible the arrangements that people receive with respect to family tax benefits for unexpected costs, such as a TV or a freezer um, actually uh, breaking down, uh, people need to get access to those, that sort of money. Uh, Deputy Speaker, to be, it is, it's possible for people to get access to family tax benefit and to get an advance, but we wanted to make sure that uh, particularly uh, this would help families in unexpected circumstances. Deputy Speaker, this is an important reform and it will go a long way to making flexible the arrangements that people have because circumstances change. For instance, in a situation that I have in my electorate uh, of Blair, which represents most of Ipswich and the Somerset region, uh, families, many of them, thousands of them in fact, have been flood affected. Um, their circumstances are such that they require assistance from Social Security 
and certainly many lost TVs, uh, fridges, freezers, uh, they lost furniture and household items. So a more flexible advanced payment of family tax benefits ha would assist those people with these unexpected costs. Uh, many of these people simply didn't expect, of course, to be flood affected, um, and so the benefits here will assist. Uh, the maximum amount of advanced payment will be linked to a, a family's rate of payment, and generally a maximum of 7.5% of a family's rate of payment would be, could be advanced. For a family with one child under 12 years of age, it's around $312. For a family with two children under 12 years of age, $625. Overall, a maximum amount of $1,000 will apply, and advances will be only approved uh, if Centrelink is satisfied it won't cause financial hardship. Uh, Deputy Speaker, this is a, a good initiative. It, it helps my electorate clearly. It'll help my electorate as it recovers from the flood. Um, it means that uh, families, of course, will have that capacity to provide for the recovery and reconstruction of their lives, and I support it. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the second initiative, the Healthy Start for School initiative, again, uh, commitment of the Gillard Labor government, uh, a commitment of our government, which we made during the last election campaign, to measure for family tax benefit recipients on income support payments. It will make the payment of family tax benefit a supplement for a child turning four in a particular income year conditional on that child undertaking a health check, such as a, a healthy uh, kids check on Medicare benefit schedules or checks conducted by state or territory uh, maternal and child health services. To be speaker, the objective here, of course, is to identify if children have hearing loss or have a problem with their eyes, if they're suffering from some illness or condition, uh, to treat it early, to identify it early so that steps can be undertaken to give that child every chance in life, to prevent uh, learning difficulties and make sure that child gets appropriate and adequate medical treatment. I don't resolve from the conditionality of this initiative. I think it's important. We want to make sure that uh, children get every chance in life, and this is an opportunity to do so. Uh, Deputy Speaker, this initiative really uh, is helpful to children. Uh, it's sad, that, but true, that um, uh, some parents don't necessarily um, consider uh, that the health of their child is a high priority. Regrettably, that's a very uh, uh, common occurrence for those people who are struggling in circumstances where uh, they are under pressure, they might have mental health problems or psychiatric problems. This doesn't, of course, of course, occur in most families across the country. But we want to make sure that even in those difficult circumstances for those children, uh, they are healthy and fit and ready to learn when they start school. And this can only happen um, if parents really take that initiative. So the parents will need to confirm with Centrelink um, that the check's been done and the checks are serious checks. They're not simply uh, a ticker box thing that someone decides they might go to down the road. They've actually got to consult a health specialist, a medical specialist in relation to this. And it gives opportunity for parents to get the guidance in terms of a healthy lifestyle and what early intervention strategy can be undertaken if that child's suffering from some health, uh, adverse health condition. So uh, this will break down uh, patterns of disadvantage and socioeconomic hardship for families. And if we can break that intergenerational cycle of poverty and disadvantage, which is so evident by postcode across this country, that is a benefit right across the country from the, from the Torres Strait and Tasmania. It's important that children are able to participate in community life, get access to every educational opportunity and therefore provide financial security for themselves and their families by getting a good education. They're suffering from some form of disability or illness that needs to be identified early, and I support that initiative. I think that's a, a worthy cause to undertake, and I think it's important that we encourage parents on income support payments to in ensure their children receive their healthy checks before they start school. Deputy Speaker, the third initiative deals with the area of child support, and this is a, a vexed problem for many families across the country. Most people don't get charged with criminal offences. They don't have car accidents. They don't contact the, uh, the legal system of the country. But many, many people across the country live in um, separated households. Their relationships have broken down, whether they've been married or otherwise. And generally, uh, children are born from those relationships. And what happens, of course, in those circumstances are that those 
children need to be financially supported. And if the parents aren't fulfilling their statutory and common law obligations to provide uh, primary care for their children financially, then the taxpayers take up that, that cause. And that's exactly what happens in circumstances where uh, mothers or fathers fail to pay child support. And child support has been uh, the system in this country since 1989. And, and child support is paid, of course, under the Child Support Assessment Act, and it's collected under the Registration and Collection Act. And there's a formula in, in place, and people should know their obligations. Um, it's very much dependent on, of course, the payment of, uh, of tax and people lodging tax returns. If they don't lodge tax returns, it makes it difficult for the child support system to actually assess how much is payable, and uh, therefore people can make arrangements uh, to, uh, to avoid paying child support. In my previous uh, life as a lawyer and practising in family law, I met many people uh, who adjusted their financial affairs in a way to evade paying child support and uh, was involved in literally thousands of cases in, in courts, family court or federal magistrates court or other um, uh, aspects of the jurisdiction where I was attempting to uh, encourage people to pay child support and fulfil their obligations. Now, the situation is that uh, uh, we are trying here to get a more accurate system of payment of child support. Um, we're strengthening compliance. Uh, more accurate default arrangement will be introduced that uses a parent's previous taxable income instead of a low default income, that's two-thirds of Matawi, in cases where they've not lodged a, a tax return. Because sadly what happens, Deputy Speaker, is they say, I'm not going to lodge my tax return, particularly if it, it's a situation where they say, I'm going to be paying more child support, I'm going to be in a higher tax bracket, um, and they arrange their financial affairs in a way that they don't lodge their tax returns, so we don't get the accurate uh, figure, and they end up with a, a lower default income under the legislation. Now, this will ensure this amendment here a more accurate child support assessment, um, and it, it removes the, the almost accidental disincentive for a parent on a higher income to avoid paying child support um, and getting a lower child support assessment based on the, on the formula that's been established, the, the, the lower default uh, income assessed support. So the amendments here make a difference. It means that people's real income, or more likely their more accurate income, will be used for the calculation of child support, and therefore they're more likely to pay a higher child support payment. And the consequences of that, Deputy Speaker, are that we, the taxpayer, and the taxpayers across the country, are more likely to pay less money to that particular family as the payer, usually a male, will pay higher amounts of child support. Um, and that is a good common sense. It's good that we require people to take on their parental responsibility for financially for their children, but it adds to the integrity of the tax system by making sure that parents fulfil that responsibility and we, all of us, pay less taxation payments to that particular family. So this is a good initiative. Uh, it's a good initiative, again, another federal Labor government initiative. Um, and Deputy Speaker, we have stood up for families, um, and I'm proud of the, to be a part of a, a government that has cut income tax for three years in a row, which made a, has made a big difference. Uh, someone on $30,000 a year is paying now $750 a less in tax than in 2007-8, and someone on $80,000 a year is paying $1,400 less in tax than 2007-8. And I'm most proud of the fact that we've increased the childcare rebate from 30 to 50 per cent. And Deputy Speaker, that has had a big impact in my electorate. Um, we have seen since June 2008 more than 5,600 local families benefit from the additional childcare rebate payments. That's $3.143 million in additional assistance to pay to people in Ipswich and the Somerset region as a result of our reforms, unlike those opposite who almost in the first year that they were in power and after 1996 ripped a billion dollars out of the childcare system. We are investing a massive amount of money in the childcare system across this country. We are providing $20 billion 
over four years for early childhood education and childcare. That's a whopping $12.8 billion more than that was provided in the last four years of the Howard government. We're providing $16.4 billion to help 800,000 Australian families annually with the cost of childcare. So, Deputy Speaker, we, are, we have the runs on the board with respect to families. And this budget, of course, made a big impact on families locally in my electorate. 5,600 local families in Blair benefited from an extra $4,200 per child aged between 16 and 19 years under the changes to the family tax benefits system. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, this is on top, of course, of Australia's first paid parental leave scheme, um, extending, of course, the education tax uh, um, uh, refunds to a uh, situation where it covers uniforms as well. And you can see what this government has done with respect to helping families. Not just that, the, you know, the $16.4 billion in education, the almost doubling in terms of funding for health, having the coalition rip a billion dollars out of the health, out of the health system when the leader of the opposition was the uh, federal minister for health capping GP training places that they did, and disin disinvesting in the health and hospital system, all of which was vital to Australian families and their interaction with the health and hospital system, caring for their young children. When they were in power, they never saw the, had the wit or the wisdom to actually make the reforms to help Australian families that we did. And also the investing that we've done in our schools, likely to the BER projects, $109 million in the electorate of Blair, those wonderful projects, they've acted those halls as evacuation centres for people, flood affected families in my electorate across the Brisbane Valley and, and, and all throughout. Those opposite can carp and snipe and whinge about what we're doing, but they're hopeless, helpless and hapless when it comes to Australian families and what they've done. Uh, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Shortland. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I'll uh, start where the previous member uh, finished with the hopeless, hepl hopeless, hopeless, helpless, and hapless, and say yes. The opposition certainly demonstrated to us on this side of the house that that's exactly what it is, and it has demonstrated their lack of care for families. And. Uh, when the member for Blair talked about the health and hospital reform, I can't help but going back to the days when the leader of the opposition was uh, the health minister and the pain he inflicted upon Australians when the bulk billing rate declined and when he constantly stood up in this house and said he was the best friend that Medicare ever had and at the same time he slashed benefits undermined the effectiveness of Medicare and uh, said it with a smirk on his face. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm just, uh, it's, it makes such a difference when you have a government in power that actually delivers, delivers on their promises that they make in the election. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this the is a really good Aston news piece of legislation. I, I can understand why members on the other side of the <laughs> House get quite upset when I point out to them how we are delivering to, for families in Australia, delivering in a big way for families, something that they didn't do, rather they took from families, made it difficult for them to uh, go and visit their doctors because doctors stopped bulk billing. They had difficulty being able to purchase their med medicines. And what we've done on this side of the house is actually deliver better access to family payments and through more flexible advanced payments of family tax benefits, a healthy start for school component of this legislation. And strengthening compliance with uh, child support, making it easier for families. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I didn't mention at the uh, beginning of my contribution to this debate that I'm rising to speak on the families, housing, community services and Indigenous affairs and other legislation, amendment bill, further election commitments and other measures, Bill 2011. 
delivering to the Australian people and delivering to the people of Shorten. Really, really good news. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, this legislation does make some pretty important changes uh, to family tax payments. And it's their changes that will make it easier for families. And uh, what these payments do is what what will happen is that this will make more flexible advance payments of the family tax benefit. And families need flexibility. Families will be able to receive a larger and more flexible advance on their family tax benefit entitlements to help meet unexpected costs. And anyone that has a family or has children has have children themselves that have young families know how those unexpected costs arise. Everything is going along swimmingly, and the car breaks down. Everything is going along swimmingly, and the fridge uh, blows up, or the washing machine breaks down. And what we're doing is recognising the fact that there are unexpected events in the lives of families. We're recognising the fact that not all families uh, have uh, a constant stream in their life. Now, the maximum amount of advance uh, payment would be linked to a family benefits rate of payment. Uh, generally, a maximum of 7.5 per cent of a family's rate of payment could be advanced. For a family with one child under 12, this is around $312. And we all know if there is a problem with your car, $312 is a big, toward, big uh, help towards uh, having that car fixed. For a family with two children under 12, it will be $625. And overall, a maximum amount of $1,000 will apply. Advances will only be approved when Centrelink is satisfied that they will not cause financial hardship. So the advance itself must not cause financial hardship. Uh, there will be one minimum rate for all payment advances, which will be set at an indexed amount of around $160. Some families on the base rate of FTBA would have access to a smaller advanced amount because of their smaller and existing entitlement. Families who receive an advance would then have their subsequent fortnightly entitlements over six months adjusted to recover the advanced amount. Currently, the maximum advance is fixed at $324, and this can only be advanced twice a year, 1st of July, 1st of January. And this is a very, very inflexible arrangement. As I highlighted earlier in my contribution to this debate, these payments can be used uh, for those unexpected events, the car breaking down, the washing machine breaking down, the, the refrigerator breaking down. And unfortunately for families, that doesn't happen on the 1st of July and the 1st of January each year. These events are unexpected and these changes are designed to be able to incorporate those sort of events into a family's life. It's about flexibility and uh, it's based on the needs of family. It's not about an unexpected event happening on the 1st of July or the 1st of January each year. Now, the other component of this legislation that I'm particularly excited about is the measure that will make the family make the payment of the family tax benefit part A supplement for a child turning four in a particular income year conditional on that child undertaking <coughs> health checks, such as the Healthy Kids check on the Medicare benefits schedule. Now, I've got a grandson who is now five. When he turned four, I actually took him to the doctor and he had that uh, healthy kids check. And I was very impressed with this health check he went through. The doctor measured him, weighed him, 
tested his hearing, his eyes, and went through a full medical history of uh, young Sam. After about uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, he was given the all clear and uh, it was very, very beneficial. I walked away from there knowing that he was a healthy young boy who could play sport, who could hear, who could read and should have no problems with his learning because a child that has hearing deficits, sight deficits or some other deficit that isn't picked up uh, can end up having problems when they start school. The height-weight ratio is a very important index and in this era where uh, we're confronted with an obesity epidemic, it's important that we make sure that our children's weight and height are the right weight and height for a child their age and that the, the weight correlates with, with the height because one of the biggest uh, problems that we have in our society today is the increase in obesity and uh, that obesity is starting at a younger and younger age and it leads to chronic diseases such as diabetes and diabetes and that's type 2 diabetes is now being identified and diagnosed in quite young children and adolescents. So these healthy um, kids checks are important and if something such as obesity is identified then we need then the doctor can sit down work out a healthy eating plan work out an exercise plan talk through the issues with the parent and uh, following that uh, it can improve that child's health outcomes and and i suppose their future the, the choices that they'll have in their life because unless you're healthy you have so many restrictions placed on you. If you're obese it becomes a vicious circle, uh, you find it harder to exercise because you find it harder to exercise, you don't exercise, when you don't exercise you put on more weight and so it goes and the, by the time that that four-year-old reaches uh, puberty uh, he or she is quite obese and then by the time they're young adults then the problem's even been exacerbated further. So Mr Deputy Speaker, I really wanted to emphasise how important that uh, healthy start for school measure uh, is and uh, encourage all families, all families throughout Australia to recognise the importance have their child undergo these uh, healthy kids checks, not only the children that are covered by this legislation but all children because it's about their children's future and it's also about the long-term health of our nation. Now this requirement in the legislation we have before us applies to families where either of the parents or their partners have been on income support at any time during the financial year that, 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 and that's the financial year that that child turns four in. Income support families who do not meet the new requirement will have their family tax benefit A supplement withheld as the objective is to ensure that all children have a health assessment. Families who take their children to a health check within two years of the end of the financial year will be able to claim the supplement. So this is about putting in place an incentive to encourage all families to ensure that their children have this healthy uh, this health check. And as I've already mentioned, this is vital not only for that children, child, not only for its family, not only for that community, but for the long-term health of the Australian society. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, the other issue that is uh, there's two other issues in this legislation. One strengthening the compliance in the child support system, and this will be the current system will be replaced by 
uh, a more accurate process. Each and every member in this House knows the issues that surround uh, child support system, know the issues around compliance. And I think that this uh, process that will be put in place following the introduction of this legislation will help with a number of the problems that exist at the moment with uh, child support. The other, the other component of this legislation and one that I particularly embrace is streamlining the notification process for compensation recipients. This uh, is a budget measure, measure this year in the, in, uh, sorry, in the 2010 11 budget. And this will streamline the process of notifying Centrelink when payments are made by, comp by, comp by way of compensation payers such as insurers. In other words, if a person receives a compensation payment, it, makes the, it places an obligation upon that insurance company or whoever it is to pay that compensation as quickly as possible. As somebody who's uh, worked in rehabilitation and worked with people who have received compensation payments, I know just how much of a problem it is if people don't receive the payment quickly, they're unaware of it, they end up uh, with a debt uh, they end up with a debt uh, with Centrelink, and as well as that, they can uh, miscalculate or are unable to calculate their financial circumstances for the next uh, 12, uh, 12 months, two years, three years, or however long their preclusion period will be before they're entitled to receive Centrelink benefits. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is excellent legislation. It's the Labor government delivering to the people, uh, delivering what they promised that they'd deliver before the last election. This, along with the education tax rebate being extended to uniforms, childcare rebate going from 30 to 50 uh, <coughs> per cent, and the payments of childcare rebate being made on a fortnightly basis and paid parental loo leave are great Order. news for Australian families. The member's time has expired. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the Parliamentary Secretary for Community Services. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I begin by thanking uh, both sides of the House for their contributions uh, on this bill? This bill does bring forward three further election commitments to improve support for Australian families. The 2010-11 budget measure is introduced by the bill and also some minor clarifications to family payments. The first election commitment is an overhaul of the arrangements for advanced payments of family tax benefit to better meet families' needs. Families will get a more flexible system with more scope to choose the size and timing of their advance payments. The new system, starting on 1 July 2011, will help families meet unexpected household costs, such as having to replace a broken down fridge or a damaged school uniform. Some, for some families may find the new, more flexible system means they can avoid high credit card bills or high interest small loans. Other families may find they manage their budget better around unexpected expenses like car registration. Families will choose how much they get in an advance payment subject to set minimum and maximum amounts. The minimum amount will be 3.75 per cent of the maximum standard rate for a child aged under 13. This comes to around $160 as the minimum advanced amount for all families. <coughs> the maximum amount will differ between families depending on their usual rate of payment. Generally, a maximum of 7.5 per cent of that rate will be available for advance payment. For example, if the family is not receiving rent assistance and has one child under 13, the maximum advance amount would be around $320. If the family is not receiving rent assistance and has two children under 13, it would be around $640. A family that is receiving rent assistance would have a higher maximum advance. An overall maximum will apply. This will initially be $1,000 in 2011-12 and will be maintained at the same percentage of the maximum standard rate for one child under 13 as in the first year. Families will have their ongoing fortnightly family tax benefit Part A entitlement adjusted to repay their advance. Under the new arrangements, families will no longer be limited to receiving and repaying advances within two set periods of the year. 
those being 1 January to 30 June and 1 July to 31 December. Families will be able to meet Families will be able to request more of their entitlements in advance at any point in the year, and the advance will be recovered in the following six months. Importantly, though, Centrelink will not approve advance payment requests if financial hardship would be likely to result. Also, families making repeated requests will be assessed to see whether financial advice or financial counselling will be of any benefit. The second of the election commitments introduced by this bill is to establish a new requirement for income support recipient parents or carers of four-year-olds. This is aimed at giving their children a healthy start for school. Under this new requirement, the Family Tax Benefit Part A supplement, which is paid to families at the end of a financial year, will become conditional on these families on the kids going through a health assessment. The Healthy Kids Check is such an assessment. A health assessment at this age will help ensure that children are healthy, fit and ready to learn when they start school. In particular, it will help early detection of lifestyle risk factors and delayed development and illness, such as vision and hearing problems. The health check will also offer families guidance on healthy lifestyles and early intervention strategies. We know from the research that opportunities such as these will be especially important for disadvantaged families where a good education is so important in helping to break down patterns of disadvantage. The Healthy Start for School initiative will apply from 1 July 2011. Parents will need to confirm with Centrelink that the health check has been done. In exceptional circumstances, the new requirement may be waived, for example, when the child has severe disability or terminal illness. The third and last election commitment in the bill will introduce a new, more accurate process for assessing income support for assessing income for child support purposes in place of the current policy that applies when a parent fails to lodge or is late with his or her tax return. Currently, the child support assessment for a parent in these situations is based on a figure equal to two-thirds of the male total average weekly earnings, a process that in fact often leads to an understatement of the parent's actual income. The new process will achieve a more accurate child support assessment and therefore better support for children in separated families. By generally using in the assessment the parent's last known taxable income indexed by the growth in average wages. However, if the current process based on two thirds of male total average weekly earnings would lead to a higher income, that process will be used instead. In a measure from the 2010 11 budget, this bill will streamline the notification process when payments are made by compensation payers and insurers. These compensation payers and insurers will now need to tell Centrelink before compensation payments are made to compensation recipients or their partners. The new requirement will apply to lump sum payments as well as ongoing periodic payments. It will help to simplify the notification process to Centrelink and will help to make sure people are paid their correct entitlements and avoid unnecessary overpayments. Amendments will be moved to this measure as a result of consultation with the insurance sector these amendments will avoid any risk of conflict with state and territory compensation laws surrounding grant and payment of workers' compensation and make the new arrangements easier for the industry to manage. The bill currently provides for Centrelink to be notified at least 14 days before the payment is made. The amendments will allow the secretary and the compensation payer to agree on an alternative period within which notice must be given. Lastly, some minor clarifications with an existing policy will be made to several family assistance and child support provisions. Thank you. Uh, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Second reading. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance, child support and social security and for related purposes. I have received a message from Her Excellency the Governor-General recommending in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution an appropriation for the purposes of this bill. The House will now consider the bill in detail and I understand it is the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole. The question is that the bill be agreed to. Uh, Parliamentary Secretary for Community Services. I present a supplementary explanatory memorandum to the bill. I ask Leave of the House to move Government Amendments 1 to 8 as circulated together. Is Leave granted? Leave is granted. Parliamentary I'm, Secretary. Thank you. I move Government Amendments 1 to 8 as circulated together. 
The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Menzies. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, speaking very briefly to the amendments, I note the words of the uh, minister in her summing up speech in relation to arrangements with the insurance industry as to alternative timeframes um, being proposed by these amendments. But I simply want to place on record um, information provided to me just before I came into the House, so I haven't had an opportunity to compare what has been said to me with the amendments, but simply to place on record and this, and this to say that the industry, um, I'm informed, has become aware of a major, what they say is a major flaw in the legislation, uh, with the debate resuming today. One part of the Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs and other legislation amendment further election commitments and other measures, Bill 2011, requires insurance, assure, start again, it requires insurers as the payers of injury compensation to notify Centrelink two weeks before making payments. However, insurers have various state obligations to make payments to in injured persons in a shorter time frame, for example, to pay weekly payments to insured workers, uh, inj injured workers within one week or to reimburse out-of-pocket <coughs> medical expenses within a number of days. The upshot is that insurers <coughs> could not possibly simultaneously comply with both Commonwealth and state regulations, putting them automatically in breach of one or both regulatory obligations, or resulting in unnecessary delays to the payment of income support and other payments to in injured workers and other injury compensation uh, recipients. So, um, as I said, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, Given that this advice was just provided to me prior to walking into the chamber and uh, not having the opportunity to look in detail at what the amendments are, um, I would seek some assurance from the government that the amendments do go to this issue. Um, and uh, if the uh, minister is not able to answer that now, then to come back to me uh, after today. Uh, otherwise, we would obviously seek to have the matter examined in more detail when this matter goes to the Senate. Yep. The Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Speaker. Can I just uh, thank uh, the member for Menzies for uh, his uh, contribution? Um, I am advised that these amendments uh, will do detail, uh, deal with those issues. And in fact, um, the reason that it allows the Secretary to deal with it is, is that the, the restrictions in each state and territory are different so that those rules can be applied that relate to those relevant jurisdiction laws. So uh, we've been advised that we do believe it will resolve the matter. Thank you. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Against, I think the ayes have it. Parliamentary Secretary. I ask leave of the House to move to the third reading immediately. Uh, Sorry, Wisdom. Yeah, Judith uh, Benham. Uh, the question now is that, the, that uh, this bill, as amended, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Against, I think the ayes have it. Um, this bill is amended um, and has been agreed to. Um, the Parliamentary Secretary. So I now seek leave of the House to move the third reading immediately. Is leave granted? No objection. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that the, uh, the bill uh, be read uh, a third time. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Against, I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance, child support and social security and for related purposes. Clark. Government business. Next order of the day. Tax Laws <coughs> Amendment 2011 Measures No. 4 Bill 2011, Resumption of Debate on the Second Reading. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Member for Casey. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And on uh, behalf of the Opposition, uh, I rise to speak on the uh, Tax Law Amendment 2011 Measures No. 4 Bill. Uh, this bill uh, is a bill that, uh, like most tax law amendment bills, you'd appreciate, Mr Deputy Speaker, from your time in the House, the, uh, the, uh, the coalition uh, won't be opposing. Uh, I will take just a short period of time uh, in the House uh, to run through 
uh, each of the four schedules uh, that comprise this tax law amendment bill. Uh, this bill was introduced uh, just last week uh, by the Assistant Treasurer uh, in his tabling speech, uh, which I had the pleasure of hearing because I was uh, in the House at the time. Uh, he, uh, he outlined uh, the, uh, the government's approach to the uh, four schedules. Uh, in the case of most of those, they were budget announcements and uh, therefore this uh, legislation to update the relevant uh, tax laws and in some cases other laws uh, flows uh, from that. Uh, firstly, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Schedule 1, as uh, the Minister outlined, uh, reduces <coughs> the uh, uh, quarterly income tax instalments for the 2011-12 um, income year for those uh, taxpayers, as the Minister said, whose uh, instalments are adjusted for the previous year's uh, gross domestic product growth. So essentially the, uh, the amendments reduce that uh, GDP adjustment factor for 2011-12 uh, from the, um, from the uh, uh, set uh, adjustment uh, uh, level of 8 per cent uh, down to uh, 4 per cent. Uh, the effect of this measure, as the explanatory memorandum outlines, Mr Deputy Speaker, is to obviously um, reduce what would otherwise be those automatic uh, amounts on the adjustment factor. Uh, in revenue terms, over the course of the forward estimates, the explanatory memorandum, as I was about to say, shows us uh, on page three that whilst there's a, a cost in this 11-12 year, it's made up for in the 12-13 year. So essentially, this um, uh, is a timing issue of, uh, of benefit uh, in a cash flow sense to those uh, businesses, essentially small businesses, uh, in that, um, in that uh, affected area. Uh, the second unrelated schedule uh, relates to um, the uh, low income uh, tax rebate uh, and uh, its relationship with um, income splitting arrangements and essentially what this schedule does, which was again announced uh, during the budget on budget night on the 10th of May, is it removes the ability of um, minors, children under the age of 18, to use the low income tax offset um, to offset tax due on their unearned income, you know, and this includes of course dividends rent royalties and all the other examples outlined in the explanatory memorandum and in the Minister's tabling speech. Uh, and this uh, will uh, uh, apply, uh, as, as is outlined uh, during the in, the in the budget statements and on the budget press release from the night, uh, and we're told that the financial in impact will uh, be in 2011-12, $240 million, $250 uh, million in 12-13 and 13-14. Schedule 3, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, relates to total and permanent disability uh, policies and what these amendments do uh, essentially is two things uh, in Schedule 3. Uh, they firstly uh, enable uh, regulations um, to uh, be made to prescribe a certain percentage of premiums for certain TPD insurance policies that can be claimed uh, as deductions. And as the explanatory memorandum tells us in clause four, uh, it will also extend the current transitional relief for the deductibility of uh, TPD insurance premiums to funds that self-insure uh, their liability. Uh, and the final schedule, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker relates to um, the definition of reportable employer superannuation contributions and essentially uh, what this does uh, is changes the definition uh, of reportable employer superannuation contributions uh, in order to not include involuntary contributions for the purposes of assessing taxable income for the eligibility of government assistance as all honourable members would know, particularly my colleague, the member for Indi, would know that uh, uh, salary sacrifice uh, 
arrangements are counted for the purposes of income in terms of qualifying for these benefits. That is the case, obviously, with superannuation. Uh, but what this legislation ensures is that where that contribution um, above and beyond uh, those reportable limits is involuntary, uh, that is, it's part of a, uh, an agreement, uh, it's something uh, where, by definition, the, um, the employee uh, doesn't have any control or choice that, uh, uh, in those circumstances, um, that um, uh, these involuntary contributions aren't counted um, for the denial of, um, of assistance in that way. Uh, this was um, not part of the budget. I think it was announced by the former Minister for Financial Services and Superannuation back in uh, June of last year, uh, so almost a year ago. So, uh, as I said at the outset, the, um, the opposition uh, won't be opposing uh, this uh, legislation, and uh, I commend uh, the Bill to the House. The question is uh, that the Bill be read a second time. Honourable Member for Canberra. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, it gives me great pleasure tonight to speak in favour of the Tax Laws Amendment 2011 Measures No. 4 Bill 2011. This bill covers a number of areas which are important to streamlining the tax system, supporting small business, strengthening the economy and restoring the budget to surplus in 2012-13. To begin with, this bill implements the government budget measures to strengthen the integrity of the low income tax offset by removing the ability of minors to use the low income tax offset. This is important, Mr Spe Deputy Speaker, because there is evidence to suggest that 200,000 distributions from trusts have increased in line with the low income tax offset to take advantage of an opportunity to minimise tax by allocating income to children. The low income tax offset, or LITO, as, as some people refer, it to, uh, refer to it, was never intended for this purpose. It was intended to assist low income earners, not as a tax minimisation vehicle. This measure will merely protect the integrity and fairness of the system by discouraging families from splitting their income as a means to avoid tax. Further, Mr Deputy Speaker, the measure has no effect on the low income tax offset for work income, nor does it have any impact on the 660,000 um, 660, small business trusts that operate in Australia. Small business trusts are a legitimate business tool and we are undertaking a significant review to look at simplifying their operation. Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill also contains measures to assist super funds to transition to a new, better super system. Once again, these provisions are an example of how this government listens to the concerns of the Australian people and the Australian business community and, as, and acts in response to the concerns raised about the potential difficulties that super funds will face in complying with the law once the current transitional relief uh, expires. This bill streamlines the process for claiming tax deductions for the cost of total and permanent disability insurance provided through uh, superannuation. As it currently stands, if a super fund wants to claim the deductibility for total and permanent disability, it must gain medical certification that, that an individual is incapable of being uh, gainfully employed. Where broader insurance cover is provided, a super fund is required to obtain an actuary certificate to determine the portion of the premium that can be claimed as a deduction. This bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, allows a super fund to claim a deduction for a percentage of the premium of the, uh, the TPD uh, insurance policy specified in regulations. This will mean that super funds will no longer need to engage in actuary to determine the deduction. And, and Mr Speaker, I'd just like to sort of uh, discuss this TPD issue uh, just a little bit further. Uh, I know that uh, just from reading about superannuation funds, uh, particularly industry superannuation funds, there's a number of people who sign up to these funds uh, and yet they don't sign up to the TPD element of it. It usually works out to be about a dollar, the uh, last time I checked it was about a dollar a week in terms of signing up for this and it does give a lot of people uh, protection and insurance on the, um, in the event of um, total or permanent disability. So I'd like to use this opportunity to encourage people who are in industry super funds to take up that opportunity of TPD because it is highly competitive and I know it's a, 
it's uh, something that industry super funds have been mounting a campaign on for a number of years, and I encourage people and I encourage the members here tonight to encourage their, their, the people in their electorate to, um, to take advantage of the, the TPD in whatever superannuation fund they, they have chosen to um, use or that their, their uh, organisation has chosen for them to use. Mr Deputy Speaker, Schedule 4 of this bill alters the definition of what is a reportable employer superannuation contribution to exclude certain employer contributions made for the benefit of the employee, which are mandated by some requirement beyond the control of that employee. As it stands, Mr Deputy Speaker, additional super payments beyond the mandated 9 per cent are considered part of income when determining a person's eligibility for government financial assistance. This is because such payments have the potential to be taken as cash or some other accessible benefit, not just as super. This amendment follows concerns that some contributions mandated by law or industrial agreement were being considered by the ATO as reportable employer super contributions. As these payments cannot be controlled by the employee or taken out as cash or another benefit, the government believes that these types of contributions should be considered as part of income, so we've moved to amend that through this bill. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, observant members will have noted that I've left uh, Schedule 1 until last, and that's because I want to spend some more time talking about uh, the, uh, the importance of the, the, the small business and also the fact that this, uh, this bill also has a, a significant uh, um, impact on small business in a very, very positive way. But before I do that, I just want to uh, go back to the super issue, Mr Deputy Speaker, and just, again, it, it is a great concern for me in the fact that uh, a lot, I meet every week an, a number of women who are doing it tough in retirement, and uh, it's because they essentially haven't put enough money away for their retirement. Uh, it's, they've, they've taken time out for their babies and, and, done, uh, and, uh, and, and have been in and out of the workforce. And so I'm very, very keen for um, women to actually Take, be aware of their, their superannuation, to actually sit down and, and look at their super, super statement, get an understanding of what they've got in there, what they, um, how much they need for the future, how much they need to contribute in, uh, between now and their retirement, you know, whatever age that they choose to nominate for retirement, and then they can plan around that. They can plan to take the time off for a baby, they can plan to do part-time work. They can, and then they can work out when they want to retire, and they may need to sort of do part-time work in the lead up to retirement. But I encourage all Australians, but particularly women, to actually take control of the super, understand it first off, but also take control of your super so that you are actually aware of what you need for when you retire so then you can work back from there and to have complete control of your finances right throughout your working life. As part of that exercise, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm going to be running a series of how to read your superannuation statement seminars uh, later in the year. I've got colleagues who are, um, who are very well versed in that. Uh, they've worked for a number of super funds and it's a free seminar. It's not going to be telling people where to invest or which super, super plan they should be using. It's basically going to <coughs> sit them down and get them to work through their super sta statement that they have now and actually decipher it, explain to them in plain English what it means and also what it's sort of saying to them about, okay, this is how much you're going to be having for when you retire and this is how much you, will, um, you may need um, for when you retire, if you want a particular lifestyle, and this is most, most importantly how much you need to contribute over that time. I do, as I said, I've seen a number of women um, <coughs> through um, as the new member of Canberra who are really doing it tough in retirement because they just do not have the money. So they haven't had the money set it's right. <laughs> pardon me, <coughs> to get them through. <coughs> I beg your pardon. <coughs> I beg your pardon, Mr Deputy Speaker. Okay, I'll move on from super <laughs> if I can talk. Mr Deputy Speaker, Schedule 1 will also reduce the PAYG instalments for the 2011-12 income year for tax <laughs> taxpayers who pay quarterly instalments on the basis of the GDP adjusted notional tax method. Mr Deputy Speaker, this will have the benefit of freeing up some $700 million in cash flow for 2.7 million uh, small businesses. It's a significant figure, which, has, uh, which as a former small business owner myself, I can attest is most welcome. Mr Deputy Speaker, small business is the backbone of the economy, constituting up to 96 per cent of all businesses in Australia. This measure... <coughs> 
builds upon other measures announced in the budget, such as the $7.1 million to continue the small business support line, an instant write-off for assets costing less than $5,000 from 2012-13, a $5,000 immediate deduction for motor vehicles and improvements to the Enterprise Connect centres and business. These measures, Mr Deputy Speaker, build on the previous actions taken by this government to help small business in areas such as reducing the tax obligation of small business companies to 29 per cent in 2012-13, earlier than, uh, than, um, than other companies. The small business, and also in addition to that, the small business support line that's helping small business owners access information and referral services and the program that's associated with that line, which is helping small business owners to go online and engage in the digital economy. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is also the award-winning website business.com.au, which is connecting small business to information about start-up, taxation, licensing and legislation, as well as significant transactions such as ABN lookup, taxation compliance and licence applications. Mr Deputy Speaker, I recently held a small uh, forum for another free seminar for people who are interested in setting up small businesses uh, who've got that little bright idea that they've been sort of kicking around for a while and they, um, they want to turn it into a business but don't know how. And this actually, the seminar took them through uh, for, uh, the, it took them through the steps that they need to take in terms of what they need to do to set up a business, but also um, it made them think about a whole range of things that people quite often don't think about when they're setting up a business, particularly uh, the fact that you do need to spend money to make money, so you do need to actually have some, um, put some cash up front to get the business going, and uh, particularly for your public liability insurance and your um, professional indemnity, which can be very significant, particularly when you're first starting out in business. I know that my, when I first started my small business, my, um, my insurance bill was probably worth about probably about four months of income. It was a significant chunk, and when you're just getting going and the cash flow uh, when you haven't got cash flow because you've worked for three months and you're still waiting for the for the bills to be paid. It can be uh, it can be uh, you eat a lot of mints. So uh, it was uh, it it is a challenge, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But it is a very exciting to actually have your own business once you actually get going. It does have uh, there's lots of risks there. There's lots of moments when you think why have I done this? But generally the rewards are great. The personal and professional rewards are great. And uh, it was great to actually be with these people who are thinking about setting up a small business and sharing with them my experience and the experience of others in terms of what to do, what not to do, and uh, and and in a way pointing them in the right direction. But as, I, as I've just outlined, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are many, many services and, su and support systems available to small business throughout Australia into, at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level. And so it's small businesses, is, there's an there is an embarrassment of riches in terms of what uh, services and support systems they can, uh, they can access. So uh, again, I encourage anyone who's got a small business or wanting to expand the, the size of their small business or just thinking about a small business to take advantage of these fabulous uh, support systems that the government has provided in a range of areas, and also to, um, to commend the government for the, uh, the tax uh, uh, reductions it's giving to small business, particularly for those uh, to, to ease up cash flow. Cash flow, as I mentioned before, is a significant issue, particularly when you're just starting. And, uh, and if you want to make an investment, it, it, just, it really does help out with, um, with the day-to-day -day running of the business. So I'm sure that that will be wo most welcome. So in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to say that these bills, this, uh, this bill is an important one. Uh, it's very important for a strong Australian economy. It's very important for a strong small business. It's very important uh, for streamlining the tax system. And, uh, and it's very important to bring the budget back into the black on uh, 2012 by 2012-13, and I commend it to the House. Thank you. Order. The question is that the, the bill be read a second time. The honourable member for Bradfield. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to make some brief comments in relation to one aspect of this bill, <coughs> which deals with amendments to the low income taxpayer rebate and the treatment of income paid through a trust to minors. As has been made clear, on this side of the House we will be supporting this bill, but I do want to note the manner in which this particular measure was dealt with in the lead-up to the budget and highlight some of the 
unfortunate consequences of the way that this matter has been managed. I recollect listening to Adam Spencer on ABC local radio interviewing a tax expert one morning shortly before the budget was brought down when there was a lengthy discussion about whether trusts as a vehicle were to be prohibited. And that is a consequence of the media management engaged in by this government in relation to this measure. We were told that there was going to be a major crackdown and this of course caused understandable anxiety on the part of many people and businesses who use trusts for a range of important and legitimate business reasons. Operating a business through a trust can provide considerable flexibility and it can be of great importance in preserving assets, including for preserving assets to be passed to the next generation. For example, trusts are widely used in primary industry for precisely that reason. What we have here, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a government which is engaging in a grasping for revenue as a consequence of the fact that it has been spending without restraint for now some four years and it's finding every possible way it can to fill the increasingly large gaps which have opened up. I note with interest that the explanatory memorandum says, quotes, in recent years the low income tax offset has increased significantly as a means of providing targeted tax relief to low income earners. The low income tax offset has been available to all taxpayers with incomes below its cutoff threshold, including minors, an increasing amount of distributions from discretionary trusts have subsequently taken advantage of this concession. I simply make the point, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this is an issue which could have been foreseen at the time the low income tax offset was increased and if it was such a problem it could have been dealt with then. The consequence we have now is that a significant number of Australians will have arranged their affairs in reliance upon the law as it stood until uh, the night of the budget, and in doing that they are acting perfectly legally. As a consequence of this government's desperate grab for revenue, what they've obviously done is uh, asked the Treasury, what ideas have you got to find other ways in which we can claw in some money because we're facing yet another yawning deficit in the coming year 2011-12, we're facing a yawning deficit of $23 billion to add to this year's yawning deficit of $49 billion and the previous year's yawning deficit of more than $50 billion and the previous year's yawning deficit of over $20 billion. Cumulative deficits, Mr Deputy Speaker, now reaching over $150 billion since Wayne Swan has had his hands on this company's financial on this country's financial steering wheel. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is clear that as a result of the urgent and desperate desire to find additional revenues to deal with the fact that this government has been spending without restraint, that this government has thrown caution to the winds and has driven expenditure up from approximately $250 billion in 2006-07 to this year $349 billion, an increase of almost $100 billion in four years, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is clear that as a consequence of this unrestrained and profligate spending, what we have is a government that is desperately on the lookout for revenue anywhere it can scrounge it. And as a consequence, one of the measures included in this budget, Mr Deputy Speaker, is this measure which is going to have a consequence that a significant number of Australians who have arranged their affairs in reliance upon the law as it previously stood are now going to be inconvenienced, are now have, going to have to make changes and also suffered considerable anxiety in the period up until the budget in the way this matter was managed and as a consequence of the 
deliberate attempts by this government to give the impression through the media that it was going to produce a tough budget and that it was going to produce a fiscally responsible budget. As we've seen, in fact, the budget failed those tests. We were told that this was the budget which would return Australia to surplus. In fact, what we know is the 2011-12 budget does no such thing. It produces yet another deficit following the dismal run, the increasing run of deficit after deficit after deficit, and we don't in fact get a deficit, or get a surplus, Mr Deputy Speaker, until 2012-13. It's going to be a mere sliver of a surplus at 3.5 billion, uh, making almost no impression on the cumulative deficits of 150 billion and more, which by that point will have been racked up. And it is an unfortunate consequence of this government's chaotic and incompetent financial management, Mr Deputy Speaker, that amongst the measures they have needed to introduce, uh, this measure introduced with no notice uh, at considerable inconvenience to many Australians who have, uh, prior to this time, arranged their affairs in reliance on the law as it previously stood. It is therefore, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, a matter for regret that this uh, particular aspect of budgetary and tax ma taxation management has been handled in the way that it has. Order. <clears throat> the question is that um, uh, the bill be read a second time. The honourable member for Crosby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to speak on the tax laws amendment uh, bill 2011 a bill which amends various taxation laws to implement a range of improvements to the Australian tax laws. The measures set out, set out in the bill before the House today are all sensible measures to continue to improve and maintain the integrity of Australia's taxation laws and which help the difficult and challenging task of meeting our government's commitment to return the budget to surplus in 2012-2013. The first of these bills, or the first of uh, these measures, Schedule 1, uh, goes to the uh, reduction in the PAYG instalments, and I'll explain that if I may, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Under the pay-as-you-go instalment system, uh, taxpayers earning uh, businesses or investment income pay instalments during the year to which their final tax liability for that income year. And, this helps taxpayers meet their income tax liabilities and it's important for the effective and timely collection of tax liabilities. Taxpayers may pay their quarterly PAYG instalments on the basis of either the GDP adjusted notional tax or on the basis of instalment income. And in the most part, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, Speaker, small businesses, individuals and trusts and small superannuation funds uh, pay their instalments quarterly using the GDP adjustment method. The first of the measures set out in Schedule 1 will reduce the PAYG instalment for the 2011-12 income year for taxpayers who pay quarterly instalments on the basis of the GDP adjusted notional tax method. By setting the GDP adjustment for the 2011-12 income year at 4%, now, setting the GDP adjustment at 4 per cent will provide taxpayers with a smoother transition uh, from the current or the previous 2 per cent GDP adjustment factor that has been applied for the previous two income years as the economy recovered from the, gro the global financial crisis. Without the measures in this bill, the GDP adjustment factor would otherwise be 8 per cent. So, in other words, Mr Deputy Speaker, this provides tax relief for small businesses. It's a practical measure which will assist small businesses throughout the year, providing what we estimate to be something in the order of $700 million in cash flow benefits. The second of the measures in this bill deals with low income tax offsets, which will reduce the incentives for families to split income with their children. Now, the purpose of the low income tax rebate was to provide tax relief for low income earners, not to be used uh, as a vehicle for tax minimisation. The measures in this bill remove the ability 
of children under the 18 years of age to use the low income tax offset to offset tax on unearned income such as dividends, interest, rent, royalties and other income from property. The level of tax for low income earners has already been reduced by the Gillard government through the doubling of the low income tax offset from $750 to uh, one uh, to fifteen hundred dollars, and has delivered a benefit to taxpayers earning up to six sixty-seven thousand five hundred dollars per annum. But as I've said before, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this offset was never meant to act as a tax minimisation vehicle. Um, it's an important part of our plan to ensure that we do return the budget to surplus, and we ensure the tax offsets and rebates are used for the purpose for which they were designed. The third measure is the dis uh, goes to the disability superannuation benefits. And it is in essence, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, a measure of simplification. So Schedule 3 of the bill contains amendments to streamline uh, the process for claiming tax deductions for the cost of total and permanent disability insurance which is provided through superannuation funds. The amendments in this bill will give funds the option of using a simple method for apportioning TPD insurance premiums with reference to a schedule of percentages in the regulation without having to incur the cost of an actuary, which is the case at present. The fourth measure, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, is an amendment to the reportable employer superannuation contributions, otherwise known as RESC. The purpose of RESC is to assist in the accurate reportage of income, especially uh, as that relates to an employee's entitlement to receive government benefits or to make certain government payments. The measures in this bill will introduce amendments to ensure that additional employer contributions imposed by an industrial agreement or the rules of a superannuation fund will not be reportable employer superannuation contributions defined by the law. The definitions of RESC is designed to reflect the fact that these additional contributions could be taken as income and this definition prevents higher income earners from salary sacrificing a large proportion of their income into superannuation and by doing so reducing their income to become eligible for government financial assistance or to, uh, to avoid payment of other requisite payments. The amendments in this bill clarify that co contributions will not be considered risk where they are mandated by an industrial agreement or the rules of a superannuation fund. That is to say, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, the purpose is to ensure uh, that RESC is only applied to the non-compulsory contributions uh, of a superannuation co contributor. Uh, the fourth uh, issue, or the fifth issue I wish to address uh, uh, goes to some of the issues raised uh, in the previous contribution by the member for Bradfield. As I said in opening, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, the measures in these bills do two, two, do two jobs of work. First, they're sensible measures to adjust and tweak uh, the administration of our taxation system so that it is efficient and effective for both the administrators and for the taxpayers so that the taxation laws do the work they're intended to do and at the same time ensure that we are able to find savings uh, and uh, to find the income to ensure that the, the budget returns to surplus in 2012-13 as promised. Now our taxation laws are the foundation of our system of financial management and they enable successive governments to fund the services and the infrastructure that we all collectively rely on each and every day. It's a simple fact that there'll always be competing priorities for spending measures and that making the hard decisions about what those priorities about those priorities is what characterises a government, a Prime Minister and a Treasurer. And it's no accident that this budget has been described, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, as a Labor budget, 
that aligns with the core labour values because it is a budget which prioritises jobs, prioritises getting people who are at risk of long-term unemployment back into employment or re-engaging with the education system by record investment in skills and assistance to the long-term unemployed to ensure that we, as we move through the mining boom Mark II, we do not leave people behind. And the second area of priority which defines this as a labour budget is the record investment, $2.2 billion investment in mental health. And in complete contrast to those opposite, we do not believe that we should be investing uh, in the mental health system by robbing Peter to pay Paul. That is, we don't believe that we should run down the primary health system and enable us to make record investments in the mental health system. Now, like every member and senator in this place, we all have our wish lists of local projects that we seek funding for. In my own electorate of Throsby, I know that the National Broadband Network, for example, will make an enormous difference to the lives of those who currently have to commute to Sydney for their employment and will create a great incentive for local business and new businesses to invest in the region. That's why that I cannot, I cannot understand, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, the intransigence of those opposite, including the member for Gilmore, uh, in whose electorate uh, a trial site for the NBN exists, how they constantly carp and criticise the NBN project. Like the member for Cunningham, I'd dearly like to see the Commonwealth funding for the Malden Dombarden rail link, and we'll continue to lobby for this project as a long-term goal for the Illawarra region. However, we understand on this side of the House that there are pressing national priorities and that we have to move away from this notion, uh, this Santa Claus notion uh, of uh, federal budgets, which is to say, unless there is a present for everybody under the tree, um, that it is not a good budget or not a budget in the national interest. Uh, we understand on this side of the House, while we don't restrain from representing the interests of our electorate, it's the national interest that which, mu which must come first and prioritising jobs and mental health is in the national interest. Ensuring that we bring the budget back to surplus is in the natural, national interest as we deal with the record investment that is coming our way in mining and other industries in the out years of the forward estimates. So I'm proud to be a government which has done so much over a short period of time through measures, measures such as those contained in these bills to attempt to rein in government spending, make savings where that is possible, and to ensure that we bring the budget uh, back to surplus while investing in labour priorities. It's in stark contrast to those opposite, and we saw uh, a typical contribution from the member for Bradfield earlier where he, he stood up and criticised the measures within uh, this bill as somehow uh, some conspiratorial tax grab, some backdoor way to attack family trusts, which or uh, trusts which we on this side of the house understand do have a legitimate uh, purpose uh, in business, but they shouldn't be used for illegitimate uh, reasons, and they shouldn't be used merely as a means for tax minimisation. And indeed, if there is a controversy on the in the area of uh, uh, the regulation and the use of trusts. Uh, in Australian politics, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, it's on the other side of the House, not on this side of the House. And uh, we understand that uh, there are some aggressive ad advocates for taking the axe uh, to the use of uh, family trusts uh, in corporate uh, arrangements, uh, including, uh, as my colleague uh, reminds me from the member from North Sydney in this area. So if the member for Bradfield is looking for a conspiracy, um, he should look inside his own party room and not at those opposite. Uh, now, but it was interesting um, from the party that lectures us day in and day out about the need to do more to bring the budget back into surplus. But when you listen to the appropriation speeches of those opposite, not one contribution. Not one contribution, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, uh, on how we could bring the budget back into surplus. Indeed. I'll have more to say about this in future speeches, uh, Mr Ac Acting Deputy Speaker. 
We have millions and millions of dollars, Order. millions and millions Order. of dollars in Order. proposed new Remember spending. For Indi? Millions and millions of dollars in proposed new spending from those opposite in their uh, uh, appropriation speeches. Um, and the member for Hasluck has probably spent, uh, he's, he's done an Olympic effort, Olympic effort in his proposals for new spending. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether the, he, he gets up in his own party room in some of these proposals. As we're told they have $50, million, uh, $50 billion in spending. Uh, well, the member for Hasluck has put a big dint in that $50 billion. I can tell you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, and he's not alone. Uh, the member for Patterson, the member for Macmillan, the member for Murray and many others have stood up here uh, day after day and proposed new spending measures at the same time as opposing our saving measures, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. So um, I think if there is to be a debate around spending and, and probity in this House, uh, uh, it's not uh, lectures from those opposite we should be taking. In fact, they need to look closer to home. And the member for Bradfield uh, was wont to talk, us, talk to us about the need to, to rein in taxation. Well, I, remember them, I remind the member for Bradfield, as I remind uh, all of those opposite, uh, that the coalition government has been the highest taxing government in this nation's history. And I'll finish on this point. Uh, under the Howard government, uh, the tax to GDP ratio never dropped much below 25 per cent uh, of GDP, where it runs at 22 per cent of GDP under this government. I, compare, I com commend the bills to the House. The question is that the um, bill be read a second time. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak in support of the Tax Laws Amendment 2011 Measures No. 4 Bill and uh, commend the previous speaker, the Member for Throsby, for his contribution and uh, for, for some of the things he pointed out. I'd also like to commend the Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer for his great budget. Uh, a great Labor budget, a good steady pair of hands. Uh, great to see that he's able to uh, steer us back to the uh, a budget surplus in only about 13 months, I think it is. So it's great to see. This bill implements a number of budget Honourable measures Member to Farindai. reform the tax system. So it supports small businesses and generates significant savings for the budget bottom line. Deputy Speaker, the Labor government has provided a steady hand on the nation's finances over four budget cycles. And despite the toughest global economic conditions we've experienced for 75 years, we have ensured that Australia's fiscal position remains strong. And in fact, the reality is we're the envy of the OECD. The federal Labor government steered the Australian economy through the worst global recession in nearly 100 years. Uh, it's interesting, I went back Look, to look through a, a couple of newspaper articles and, the, and some presentations that I did for, in preparing for this. And you know, it's so easy to forget just how bad things were. Mm. The worst in 75 years. If we look back at the early 80s and early 90s, when we look at those recessions, they still had positive growth. I know there were tough times, but we still had positive growth, whereas in 2009 that wasn't the case. Obviously, governments have no miracle cure for all of our nation's financial uh, woes, especially when they begin overseas, uh, but we pull the levers that we controlled to keep our economy strong. The bank deposit guarantee and stimulus measures introduced by this government kept us out of recession and, more importantly, more importantly like a good Labor government, it kept hundreds of thousands of Australians in jobs. Uh, so we avoided, un thankfully, avoided that sort of dull cue schadenfreude that we see from those opposite so, so many times. These measures help keep 700,000 people in jobs. The Burr investments in new and improved facilities at our schools, and I, I know the member for Robinson is a big advocate for ed education, those investments will ensure better learning opportunities for our kids long into the future. And as any education uh, provider would know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to provide opportunity for our children and also set us up for the economic future. The, the high road of economic future rather than the, the low road of, of uh, low wages. I see us as a, a service economy providing great service to, to South East Asia and, and the rest of the world. So our investments also in critical infrastructure will boost productivity, not just ports and railways, but it will ensure Australians spend less time in traffic and more time with their families. And uh, I won't go into the NBN, I'll leave that for later for that. Obviously, is also a piece of critical infrastructure. 
But I would like to particularly mention infrastructure uh, that was mentioned in the budget, the $300 million improvement to the Kessels Road and Mains Road bottleneck in my electorate, uh, an intersection that had been a weeping sore for years and years and years under the Howard government. Uh, I was elected with a, pro with a plan to uh, solve it, and we we're getting on with it. Early work's already underway. In fact, I, I see some of the traffic lights were complete when I went through there last week, and the tender process for the main parcel of works is now in its final stages. I joined thousands of motorists on the south side who will breathe a collective sigh of relief when this congestion busting project gets underway in earnest. It will cut greenhouse gases from cars sitting at the idling at the intersection and get commuters home to their families earlier or uh, in the morning to school or work sooner. The budget also delivered an historic investment in better mental health services. Obviously this was well overdue, uh, I, I would acknowledge, and very well received in my electorate. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable, Deputy Speaker, that these funding initiatives were delivered on the back of an horrific summer of natural disasters. And as someone who uh, had more than 5,200 properties have water over their floorboards, I well know how horrible that has been and continues to be for many people. So yeah, thanks to, thanks to the, the Treasurer, Wayne Swan, we've got a very responsible budget, yet still on the track to return to surplus in 2012-13. Meanwhile, the opposition, the opposition leader, well, wasn't that an experience. Uh, it did in my diary say it was a budget reply speech, but I note that he steadfastly refused to actually outline an alternative budget. Shame. I'm not sure of uh, the exact extent of the great sandy desert and whether it's in the member for Lignari's um, electorate, but uh, if you go to the great sandy desert, you'll find a, um, the golden furry marsupial mole. Well, that has more vision than the Leader of the Opposition <laughs> when it comes to outlining an alternative budget. I can understand why, Deputy Speaker, after their $11 billion savings black hole debacle, <laughs> after their $11 billion savings black hole debacle uh, during the election, why he would want to avoid ec uh, the economy and economics, but the reality is a budget reply speech, it's not a mystery. The title suggests you're replying to the budget. It's not um, you know, a diatribe against the fact that you managed to not quite win the, uh, the last election. You've got to move on from that bitterness and get with the program. The reality is the Gillard government's here and we've got a plan. We're here to stay for, as I suggested earlier to the member for Indi, um, I think it might, could be as many as 900 days. Or, or, or that you, so she needs to get over this call for an election. We're here to stay. I would not, but I understand from the Deputy Speaker why he would not want to go there again. Uh, and if I was the leader of the opposition, uh, you know, maybe because he doesn't get the economy, he made that call. But then we even had the member for North Sydney in his response to the to the press club, I think it was. And then he had that amazing that amazing spectacle where he then writes a letter to the Fin Review and says, "Oh, by the way, uh, you know, by the way, well, I, I guess it's sort of like being a teacher. When you're a teacher, you hear lots of excuses for why people don't." do their homework, you know, but this was a classic one. This was actually the dogs did my homework, you know. It, it wasn't me, it was actually someone else that did it. So, I mean, unbelievable. So instead of offering a credible economic alternative, those opposite have retreated into an economic vortex. I guess maybe that's why the member for Wentworth is so keen to get his old job back and uh, things seem to be heading in that direction. In stark contracts, contrast, Deputy Speaker, the Gillard government has a proud record of delivering practical measures to support small business, and this bill builds on that record, providing around $700 million in cash flow benefits to small business. This bill reduces the PAYG instalments for the next financial year for taxpayers who pay quarterly instalments on the basis of the GDP-adjusted national tax method by setting the GDP adjustment at 4%. During the global financial crisis, the government reduced the GDP adjustment factor to 2 per cent. This rate has applied for the past two years. Without this bill, the GDP adjustment factor would return to 8 per cent. Obviously, that would be too much of a shock for the many Australians who are doing it tough still. People have still, are still on, are not out there opening their wallets, even though they are consolidating their debt. Therefore, we, we recognise that many parts of the economy are still in recovery and especially small businesses to serve a smooth transition back to 8% GDP adjustment factor. It will ensure that small, business, small businesses have extra cash throughout the year when they need it most. This bill also allows taxpayers who expect their income to grow by more than 4% to vary their quarterly tax instalments. 
This will enable small businesses to avoid a significant tax liability for the 2011-12 financial year when the final figures come in. Deputy Speaker, this bill also introduces measures to stop taxpayers using family trusts to avoid paying their fair share of tax. In recent years, increasingly discretionary trusts are directing income from adults to minors to minimise tax. I understand that this is perfectly legal. Uh, in fact, I know people who do it. But all fair-minded Australians uh, need to ascertain the reasoning behind this past practice and why we should let it continue. And if we do that, we can see that no, it, it's, it's a bit of a an historical anomaly, I would suggest. The, gov the government has increased the low income tax offset from $750 to $1,500, delivering tax relief to taxpayers earning up to $67,500. However, while this was intended to benefit low income earners, it has also been exploited by trusts. The tax office is aware that at least 200,000 distributions from trusts have increased in line with the increase in the low income tax offset. This bill amends the eligibility for the low income tax offset to ensure it cannot be used to minimise tax. It ensures children under the age of 18 with unearned income such as dividends, interest, rent and royalties will not be eligible for the low income tax offset. These rules concerning trusts hark back to a time when only one parent worked and mothers, usually, were in full time care of their children. So Australia has modernised significantly since those days and this amendment reflects that change. <coughs> Importantly, this amendment does not apply to children who work. They will still get access to the full low income tax offset for work income. This measure will discourage families from splitting income with their children to avoid paying tax, thus making the whole system fairer. Also, it will have no impact on small business trusts operating in Australia. I understand there are more than 650,000 trusts, Deputy Speaker, and apparently about 12 different types, all, all serve a purpose, I understand. But it is expected that this measure will save the government at least $740 million over three years. This bill also helps streamline the process for claiming tax deductions for the cost of total and permanent disability insurance provided through superannuation. The amendments allow the percentage of certain total and permanent disability insurance premiums that is deductible to superannuation funds to be specified in regulation. This will simplify the process and reduce the cost for super funds, a good things to do. And art super funds, one of the great legacies of, of the Hawke and Keating government. Mm -hmm. Finally, this bill amends the definition of reportable superannuation contributions to clarify that contributions that are mandated by an industrial agreement are excluded. Because these contributions are beyond the control of employees, they should not be considered income. This bill makes that clear. Deputy Speaker, this bill introduces significant savings, which are good for the budget bottom line and important reforms that make our tax, our tax system fairer. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for introducing this bill and in doing so I commend it to the House. Well, the <coughs> question is that the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Member for Fraser. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to uh, speak to the House about the Tax Laws Amendment 2011 Measures No. 4 Bill 2011, and I want to focus in particular uh, on the measures in the legislation uh, around the low income tax offset. Uh, and I want to speak this evening about the important role that measures such as the low income tax offset play in improving participation in Australia. Boosting low employment rates in Australia uh, is a core labour value. It, uh, it lies at the heart of why many of us on this side of the House came into politics and making sure that we do all we can to remove barriers to workforce participation uh, is an absolutely critical public policy objective. Uh, the LITO is uh, a mechanism that changes the tax-free threshold uh, for the largest number of people. In 2007-2008, uh, uh, the Henry Review estimated that 6.8 million taxpayers uh, had their tax-free threshold changed as a result of the LITO. Uh, and the, uh, the full amount of the, the LITO at the time the Henry Review was, uh, was uh, brought down was available to incomes, uh, individuals with a taxable income up to $30,000, uh, $30, uh, beyond which it was reduced uh, at, uh, at four cents in the dollar. Uh, and the, uh, the LITO, which was brought in, put in place uh, in 1993-94, uh, at an amount of uh, maximum amount of $150, uh, has been steadily increased 
uh, under this government. 2006-2007, uh, the LIHTO was $600. Uh, then the next financial year to $750. 2008-2009 we boosted it to $1,200. 2009-10 to uh, $1,350, uh, and in 2010-11 to $1,500. Uh, and the low-income tax offset is very much a measure that recognises that work provides dignity to Australian households. Uh, it's important in terms of the income it brings. Uh, if you look at what drives inequality across countries, uh, places like the US, it's distribution of wages. There's a, a large working poor uh, in the US labour market. Uh, that's less true in, in countries like Australia. Uh, in Australia, the divide between rich and poor really is mostly driven by the number of adults at work in a household. Uh, so if we want to close the gap between rich and poor, if we want to reduce inequality in Australia, uh, unemployment is really where it's at. Uh, but it's not just about the distribution of income, uh, it's also uh, about the intergenerational effects. Uh, the Prime Minister has spoken articulately uh, about the value for children of growing up in a household uh, where an alarm goes off in the morning uh, and a parent Goes off, to, goes off to work. Uh, she has spoken about the, uh, the simple fact uh, that a child who grows up in a household uh, where no parent works is substantially less likely to hold a job uh, when he or she enters the labour market. Uh, and it's possible that some of this intergenerational impact uh, is derived from uh, the example of seeing a parent going off to work. A lot of other developed countries have, over recent years, put in place negative income taxes, also known as earned in income tax credits, uh, and that's certainly a, a policy that I have a, a keen interest in, uh, something that I did a lot of research on when I was uh, back in my PhD days. Uh, the closest thing that Australia has to that is, uh, is the low income tax offset, uh, and it does reflect very much a recognition in Australian social policy uh, that we have to reduce the effective marginal tax rates, uh, that when we have uh, welfare phase-outs sitting on top of marginal tax rates, that creates a substantial disincentive to work. Uh, Professor Bob Gregory at the ANU did some of the most important work on this, I think, uh, recognising that the highest effective marginal rates of tax uh, were not paid by millionaires in Australia, they are in fact paid by those moving from welfare into work, who face benefit withdrawal layered on top of an income tax system. Uh, and LIHTO is, uh, is a response to that. It's recognising uh, that we do need to put in place measures uh, that encourage work, uh, both for the income benefits uh, and the dignity it brings. Uh, the measure today, is, uh, that, uh, in, as part of this legislation, uh, is uh, uh, on the back of having increased the LIHTO, uh, also recognising that it's important uh, that the LIHTO not become uh, a tax minimisation uh, vehicle. Uh, by increasing the LIHTO, uh, the government has effectively doubled the amount of non-work income that can be allocated to, uh, to children tax-free. Uh, there's some evidence that the, uh, uh, around 200,000 distributions from trusts uh, have increased in line uh, with the, incre the increased LIHTO, uh, essentially households taking advantage of the opportunity to minimise tax by allocating income to children. Uh, let me just take the House through a couple of examples of that. 2006-2007, uh, uh, the effective tax-free threshold uh, for, was uh, $1,333 for non-work income for minors. Uh, and when you look at the graph, you see a strong spike in the, uh, in the distribution uh, from, uh, from trusts in that range of $1,001 to $1,333. Uh, the following tax year, 2007-2008, uh, the effective tax free, free threshold rises to $1,667 for non-work income for minors, and lo and behold, the distribution shifts accordingly, uh, and suddenly you see this spike uh, in, the, uh, in the range $1,500 to $1,667. 2008-2009, the 
the effective tax free, free threshold uh, rises to $2,667 for non-work income for minors. And yes, you guessed it, the distribution of income from trusts uh, again moves, uh, suggesting that uh, the trusts are, are make, taking advantage of this uh, to, uh, to, to min minimise uh, tax. Uh, and LITO, as, uh, as I've set out, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, was always meant to benefit low-income earners. It was never intended to be a tax minimisation vehicle. So we're putting in place these changes um, so children can't take advantage of uh, uh, the LITO for non-work income, but will still get access to the full LITO for work income. Uh, the measure has no impact uh, on the 660,000 small business trusts operating around Australia. Uh, it just discourages families from splitting income with their children to avoid paying tax. And it's important that we do this to protect the fairness and, and the integrity of the, uh, the Australian tax, uh, tax system. Uh, it's an important budgetary savings measure, uh, and uh, th that will save uh, around $740 million uh, over three years. I, I want to conclude, uh, Deputy Speaker, by uh, focusing on the, uh, the big picture here. Uh, we're, uh, we're speaking in this House about the importance of, uh, of jobs, uh, but the member for Bradfield has, uh, has also focused uh, on the issue uh, of public sector debt. And so I think it is important to recognise what would have happened if uh, those opposite had occupied the Treasury benches uh, over recent years. Uh, in their book uh, uh, Shitstorm, Lenore Taylor and uh, David Uren uh, talk about uh, the influence of US economists on the Australian political debate uh, in late January 2009. Uh, they say, on the right, Stanford economics professor John Taylor argued there should have been more permanent tax relief. Turnbull was now firmly in the Taylor School, calling direct payments like those he'd supported in October ineffective cash splashes. Taylor argued that the temporary measures do little to stimulate demand because if people know a payment is a one-off, they're more likely to save it and less likely to spend it, whereas across the board permanent tax cuts would encourage more spending because people knew they could count on the extra cash. His slogan was that the government policy should follow the three Ps—permanent, persuasive and predictable. It was an argument Turnbull embraced. Uh, and of course, if, uh, if those opposite had been in power, uh, the effect of putting in place permanent tax cuts in the 2008-2009 period uh, would have been that we would not have been able to get the budget back into surplus. We would have locked in substantial tax cuts rather than the timely, targeted and temporary fiscal stimulus uh, which the, uh, the Labor government put into place. That timely, targeted and temporary fiscal stimulus saved around 200,000 jobs. Uh, they may sound like statistics to those of us here, uh, but each of those is a life that's not blighted by the impact of unemployment. Each of those is a career that's not scarred by spending time out of the labour market. Uh, many of those are mums and dads uh, whose households never felt the effect of unemployment. Uh, and it's that human effect of unemployment uh, that I think is, uh, is so easily discounted sometimes by those opposite. Uh, I graduated high school in, uh, in 1990, uh, not a good year to, uh, to, to leave school because of the impact of the, uh, the early 1990s recession. Uh, there's good research uh, on the impact of recessions on workers' careers. You can still see that scarring effect a decade on. Uh, and by putting in place timely, targeted and temporary fiscal stimulus, uh, the Labor government ensured that those jobs were saved, that the impact of unemployment did not blight so many, so many careers. And, Deputy Speaker, because we did this uh, in a way that we, where the fiscal stimulus could be withdrawn, we ensured that we were able to bring the budget back into surplus. Australian public sector debt is extraordinarily low by OECD standards. Many developed countries are, are now having debt levels well over half their annual GDP, some of them well over the total value of their, their annual GDP. By contrast, Australian public sector debt uh, is well below a tenth of our, uh, our annual GDP. Uh, by contrast, the typical household carries debts, uh, debt loads that are often many times uh, their household annual, annual incomes. Uh, so Australian public sector debt, looked at from that perspective, uh, is low and manageable. Uh, the government will bring the budget back into surplus in 2012-2013 uh, as expected. Uh, and in a way that would not have been possible uh, had 
the, uh, the prescriptions that the member for Wentworth was, uh, was pushing in early 2009 uh, then realised. It is, of course, though interesting to, uh, to look at the, uh, what the member for Wentworth uh, would have done uh, in light of uh, some, uh, some correspondence to uh, the letters page of the Australian Financial Review this week. Uh, the, uh, the member for North Sydney decided that it was important to write in and uh, correct Australian Financial Review readers. Uh, he said, uh, this article claims my budget address at the National Press Club was light on de detail, yet fails to mention it was a collaborative effort. With the coalition economic team, including Tony Abbott, Andrew Robb and other senior policy makers. Uh, and, uh, and of course, that's, uh, that's recognising uh, that, uh, that there is very little of uh, policy substance uh, on the other, the other side of the House. Uh, and the member for North Sydney then went on uh, to compare his own performance as shadow treasurer uh, with that of the member for, member for Wentworth. Uh, neither performance, though, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, stands, uh, stands elect to, uh, to that which Labor uh, has delivered since, be since being in office. Uh, as with the climate change debate, we have listened to mainstream economics. We recognise that the right Keynesian economics tells you what to do when a global financial cri crisis beckons. It tells you to act quickly. Australia's fiscal stimulus was uh, quick, quick out of the blocks faster than virtually, virtually any other developed country, uh, with our household payments being delivered before Christmas 2008. We also used the opportunity to invest in much-needed infrastructure, uh, to invest in roads projects, to invest in school infrastructure that improves educational outcomes uh, in Australia. Uh, but we also put in place stimulus in a way that it could then be wound back, because as the Treasurer has said, if you're Keynesians in the downturn, you also have to be Keynesians in the upswing. Uh, you have to recognise that just as government has a role to play in stimulating the economy, ensuring those 200,000 jobs are kept, uh, government also has a role uh, in, uh, in ensuring that, uh, that as the private, the private sector demand expands, uh, we, we step back, particularly in those areas where we're competing with the private sector. We continue doing the productivity raising investments, the national broadband network, the investments in trades training centres, uh, the investments in better universities and better skills. Uh, but where we're competing with the private sector, uh, we step back. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, those opposite are in utter disarray. They're a, a dad's army team when it comes to economics. Uh, according to an article by Michelle Grattan in today's uh, Age, uh, it is believed Mr Abbott recognises that Mr Turnbull would be the strongest shadow treasurer, but the post would give him a greater platform to advance his leadership ambitions. Uh, so the leader of the opposition does not intend to have a, have a resh reshuffle. Uh, the member for North Sydney believes he outperforms the member for Wentworth. The member for Wentworth believes he outperforms the member for Nor North Sydney. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't know which side to take, uh, and Australians are left wondering whether there is anyone competent on the other side of the House, anyone who wants to focus on the big long-term challenges facing the Australian economy. I commend the bill to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Deakin. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And it's always a pleasure to follow on from the member for Fraser. Although I may say his memories of the 1990s recession are probably a bit different to mine, as I'd left school a few years before he had, and uh, I was up until that point in full-time work. But of course, due to the downturn, uh, spent quite a bit of time looking for work. Uh, those sorts of things do uh, obviously make a part in your life, and they stay with you. And I think uh, anyone that's been through that sort of uh, downturn should never forget the effect, because it is real and it affects uh, people in so many different ways. The Deputy Speaker, tonight I'm here to speak in support of Tax Laws Amendment 2011 Measures No. 4 Bill of 2011. In particular, I'd like to speak about uh, two schedules of the Bill, Schedules 1 and 2. The first one, uh, in particular, implementing the Government's budget measure that provides cash flow benefits to small businesses, individual, in individual investors and other eligible taxpayers. Under the pay-as-you-go instalment system, taxpayers earning business or investment income pay instalments during the year towards their final tax liability for that income year. And this helps taxpayers meet their income, li income tax liabilities and is important for the effective and timely collection of that tax. At the advent of the global financial crisis, the Federal Labor Government implemented a number of measures to protect our economy and assist taxpayers. 
One of these measures at the time was the introduction of a 2 per cent gross domestic product adjustment factor to pay as you go instalments, and is applied for the last two income years. The 2011-12 income year was to see the GDP adjustment to PAYG using the formula of the Taxation Administration Act of 1953 go to 8%. But the common sense measure in this bill to smoothly transition to 4% instead of from 2%, so that's 2 to 4 instead of up to 8, is welcome as our economy recovers from the global financial crisis. And it provides a transitionary measure to help the many small local businesses, not only in my electorate of Deakin, but those right across Australia. And a good example is a local business that I uh, visit fairly frequently, and uh, it's always great to be able to talk about a local business as such uh, in this place. Michael and Linda are the hard-working owners at Michu's Cafe in Mitcham, and they know the challenges of owning a small business very well. They also work particularly hard and they make uh, coffees and lunches for not only the passing trade but also the many offices and workers uh, in Mitcham, which is where my electorate office is based. And certainly my staff are some of their best customers and that's a great thing. It's a good thing to do locally is to support businesses such as that. But measures such as this make a real difference to, biz to business people like them and their bottom line is important because even though it's not all that bad in Australia compared to the rest of the world, not everything is back to the way it was. And local businesses can tell you that only two or three years ago their trade was so much higher. And although they've got some of it back, not all of them have. So for them, a smooth adjustment is necessary because cash flow ben benefits from a measure such as this are important now. But overall, of course, there's no net, help, no net cost to the Commonwealth because over the forward estimates, these measures um, cancel each other out. What's put forward one year uh, is then uplifted later on. The amendments contained in this bill do not reduce the income tax liability of businesses and taxpayers affected by the measure, but merely change the timing of those tax payments and will also provide eligible taxpayers with a smoother transition from the 2 per cent GDP adjustment factor that applied for the previous two income years to the proposed 4 per cent as the economy, as I've said, recovers from the global financial crisis. There will be a reduction in tax collections of $700 million for the 2011-12 income year, which will be offset by a reduction in tax credits of $700 million in the 2012-13 income year. I think it's also important to mention the small number of taxpayers whose 2011-12 income year commenced before 1 April 2011 have already started paying their instalments for 2011-12 based on the 2 per cent adjustment factor and they'll continue to pay quarterly instalments for 2011-12 income year on that basis. And I'm sure most people would agree that it would be potentially disruptive and confusing if this small group had to change to the 4 per cent rate partway through the year. Deputy Speaker, I'd also like to speak about the second schedule of the bill, uh, referring to the low income tax offset. And in recent years, the low income tax offset has increased significantly as a means of providing targeted tax relief to low income earners, helping those who need it most. The low income tax offset has doubled from $750 to $1,500, and these measures deliver a benefit to taxpayers earning up to $67,500. The low income tax offset has been available to all taxpayers with incomes below the cut-off threshold, including minors. The support of successive Labor governments for the low income tax offset has provided an essential means to help working Australians who earn less than the average wages. Deputy Speaker, this bill will implement the government's budget measure to remove the ability of minors to use the low income tax offset so that they can no longer um, claim unearned income such as dividends, interest, rent, royalties and other income from property. But it's important to note that it applies to unearned income rather than earned income. For children under the age of 18, the low income tax offset will still be available to reduce tax payable on income earned from work, whether that be a paper round, part-time work in a shop, an apprenticeship or similar. Deputy Speaker, in recent years, an increasing amount of distributions from discretionary trusts have taken advantage of low income tax offset concessions to direct an ever larger amount of income from adults to minors as a means of minimising tax. 
there's been a significant spike in the movement of money from discretionary trusts around the exact point where the effective tax-free threshold for minors is applied in each recent tax year. This spike has moved broadly in accordance with increases to the effective tax-free threshold for minors, and I think the figures speak for themselves. In 2006-07, when the effective tax-free threshold for non-work income for minors was $1,333, there were nearly 200,000 distributions very close to this level. In 2007-08, the effective tax-free threshold relating to non-work income for minors rose to $1,667, and that is very close to where this number of 200,000 distributions landed that year. In 2008-09, the effective tax-free threshold for non-work income for minors rose to $2,667, and guess what? This group of nearly 200,000 distributions from trusts to minors neatly landed very close to that new level of $2,667. Now, of course, these distributions were merely maximising the tax benefit of the low-income tax offset for unearned income, and it's obvious that many people have taken the full advantage of that provision. However, the advantage has gone to those families that have had the financial resources to set up a trust, and it'd be fair to say that many wage earners are either unaware or cannot afford to follow that course of action. Deputy Speaker, I do not believe the low-income tax offset was set up to be an opportunity for the well-off to minimise tax. Providing incentives for families that can afford to split income with their children has created the effects of this use of the low-income tax offset. The low-income tax offset should be seen as what it really is, a helping hand from government for those workers in our society who, for whatever reason, are on lower incomes and need some assistance. This may be from having a low-paying job, working part-time or casual, or also not even being employed for a full year. There can be many reasons why people's income is not as much as they expect, or maybe they never have the opportunity. So the low-income tax offset does provide benefit for those, as I said, that are on lower incomes. The effect of this amendment is to discourage families from splitting income with their children to avoid higher tax rates, effectively using their children to avoid paying tax. Deputy Speaker, this is a common sense amendment in the bill and returns the intent of the low income tax offset to help those who need it most. It does not change the treatment of earned income through work, for, through, uh, work from minors such as apprentices or those who have left school to enter the workforce. It also protects unearned income of minors who are orphans or disabled. Deputy Speaker, as the government promised, the budget is set to return to surplus by 2012-13, and it's savings such as these that the government's worked hard to find. This measure provides a budget savings amount of $740 million over the three years to 2014-15. This amendment does not set out to disadvantage, but sets out to create more fairness in our tax system. It removes the opportunity for taking advantage of loopholes that the public constantly call on their representatives to take away. On that note, Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of those members who contributed to this debate. Schedule 1 of the bill reduces the quarterly income tax instalments for the 2011-12 income year for those taxpayers who, whose instalments are adjusted for previous year's gross domestic product growth. This is called the GDP adjustment method of working out instalment amounts. The great majority of taxpayers required to pay quarterly instalments use this method including most small businesses, plus individual investors and small superannuation funds. The amendments reduce the GDP adjustment factor for the 2011-12 income year from the default, which would be 8 per cent, to 4 per cent. This delivers small businesses and the other taxpayers using the GDP adjustment method a $700 million cash flow benefit in the 2011-2012 income year. This will provide eligible taxpayers with a smoother transition from the 2 per cent GDP adjustment factor that the government had applied for the 2009-10 and 2010-11 income years as the economy recovered from the global financial crisis. This measure is part of the government's package of measures to improve the cash flow of small businesses and simplify their tax affairs. 
Those measures include the instant asset write-off for any asset costing less than $5,000, an immediate deduction of up to $5,000 for motor vehicles, and reducing the small business company tax rate to 29 per cent. Schedule 2 reduces the incentive for families to split income with their children, therefore protecting the integrity and improving the fairness of the income tax system. These amendments will remove the ability of children under 18 years of age to use the low income tax offset to offset tax due on their unearned income, such as dividends, interest, rent and royalties. Since coming to office, the government has increased the value of the low income tax offset to provide tax relief to low income workers. Increases in the low income tax offset have, however, increased the amount of income that can be allocated to children tax free. These increases have been accompanied by increased distributions of income to children, especially from discretionary trusts. The low income tax offset was never meant to act as a tax minimisation vehicle. Importantly, children will still be able to use the low income tax offset to reduce tax payable on their income from work. This measure is one of those announced in the budget that will contribute to returning the budget to surplus by 2012-13. Schedule 3 amends the tax laws to allow the percentage of certain total and permanent disability insurance premiums that is deductible to superannuation funds to be specified in the regulations. This will streamline the process for claiming tax deductions for the cost of TPD insurance provided through superannuation. The regulations containing the prescribed percentages will be developed following consultation with industry. The cost of TPD insurance provided through superannuation is deductible to the extent the policies provide cover, which is consistent with the definition of disability superannuation benefit in the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997. Superannuation funds are required to obtain an actuary's certificate to determine the deductible portion of the premium if broader insurance cover is provided. The amendments in this schedule will reduce costs for superannuation funds in complying with the law by avoiding the need to engage an actuary to determine the deductible portion of premiums in many cases. The government introduced transitional provisions in 2010 which were designed to allow time for the industry practice of deducting the full cost of broader disability insurance policies to be brought into alignment with the operation of the law. During the transitional period, which covers the income years 2004, 2005 through to 2010-11, superannuation funds can deduct the cost of broader types of disability insurance cover. These amendments extend this transitional relief to funds that self-insure their liability to provide disability benefits. Schedule 4 amends the definition of reportable employer superannuation contributions, or RESC. Additional contributions to super that are mandated by an industrial agreement or the rules of a super fund will no longer be considered income when determining a person's eligibility for government financial assistance. It was never the government's intention that such contributions be reportable employer superannuation contributions. So the amendment will be retrospective, applying back to July 2009, when the definition of reportable employer superannuation contributions first came into force. Deputy Speaker, the bill deserves the support of the parliament and I commend the bill to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Is leave granted for the third reading to be moved immediately? Leave. Thank the member for Brisbane. The Parliamentary Secretary. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number four, Social Security Amendment Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement Bill 2011, 
resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Menzies. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the Social Security Amendment Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement Bill 2011. <clears throat> this bill seeks to limit the application of the Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement so that recipients are only covered by the transitional arrangement for children who are in their care before the 1st of July 2011. The bill seeks to amend the Social Security Act 1991 to limit the application of the Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement so that recipients are only covered by the transitional arrangement for children who are also in their care before 1 July 2011. The Gillard Labor Government seeks to amend subsection 500D3 of the Act to provide that a child cannot be a parenting payment child of a person under that subsection unless the person was the principal care of the child on or before the 30th of June 2011. Madam Deputy Speaker, we all too quickly forget that it was the Howard Costello government which in July 2006 introduced substantial reform, namely through changes to the Act to reduce the age of a person's dependent child above which the person ceased to qualify for a parenting payment from 16 years for their youngest dependent child to eight years for single parents or six years for couples. Those who immediately before the 1st of July 2006 were in receipt of a parenting payment were grandfathered or grandmothered under the Act and could continue to qualify for a parenting payment until their youngest child turned 16. It's appropriate at this point to turn attention to the notion of real reform. This grandfathering of the eligibility of existing parenting payment recipients is called the Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement and has given effect in Subdivision AA of Division 1, Part 2.10 of the Act via the definition of parenting payment child in subsection 500D3. In basic terms, under current legislative arrangements, a parenting payment transitional arrangement can continue to be paid to a person indefinitely while a person who was in receipt of the payment on the 30th of June 2006 continues to, to use the words of the legislation, acquire dependent children. For example, if a person is covered by the parenting payment transitional arrangements on the 1st of March 2011, when they gave, give birth to a new child, that new child can be their parenting payment child until he or she turns 16 on the 1st of March 2027, and they can be covered by the parenting payment transitional arrangement for that whole time. Through their recent self-proclaimed Labor budget, Labor has decided that a child cannot become a parenting payment child of a person for the purposes of the parenting payment transitional arrangement after the 30th of June 2011, though they will still be a parenting payment child until they turn six or eight, Labor argues that it will remove an unintended inequity. The practical effect of these changes is that they will limit the ability of parenting payment recipients to extend their grandfathered status by acquiring new parenting payment children. Any subsequent children that come into the recipient's care will not be covered by the grandfathering provisions. This will mean that all parenting payment recipients will be treated equally in a shorter time frame than would otherwise be the case. This bill was referred for inquiry and the Coalition will carefully consider the report of the Senate Education, Employment and Workplace Relations Legislation Committee due for release on the 14th of June of this year. As I pointed out earlier, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Labor is quick to ignore the Coalition's 2006 reforms. They're quick to ignore that a problem that more than 100,000 Australians have come off parenting payment, single and partnered, since July 2006. Indeed, in 2005, there were approximately 618,000 people in receipt of the parenting payment. By 2010, that number had reduced to 459,000, a reduction of 160,000 people on the parenting payment as a result of those reforms which the Howard government 
uh, introduced and uh, I was minister for at that stage in uh, 2006. It was the coalition who pursued and who delivered significant social security reforms for this country. Labor hasn't given the coalition any credit for the reforms other than by imitation through weak and directionless attempts to replicate real welfare reform in the guise of trials, reviews and, of course, more rhetoric. Let me go back. In 2005, Labor was scathing of welfare reforms. There were no scathing of reforms of parenting payments. Senator Wong from the other place said, and I quote, these laws allow the creation of a working poor in Australia. And she said, and I quote, let us be clear about this. These are the most drastic changes this country has seen in social security in decades. They will make hundreds of thousands of families worse off, unquote. Well, she couldn't have been further from the truth as we look back on what were some of the most effective and important social security reforms in recent history. Real reforms, not labour type pretend reform. Senator Evans in the other place at the time said, and I quote, the so-called welfare reform package is confused, fails to meet the government's own objectives, increases disincentives to move from welfare to work, is manifestly unfair and is not reform but in large part punishment of those on income support." Unquote. So in concluding, Ms. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is another missed opportunity for real social security reform. Back in 2005, the member for Jaga Jaga, now the minister, said Labor opposed the welfare to work measures, and I quote, because Australia needs real welfare reform, unquote. Well, now she's the minister, and while she loves talking about reform, we all know that it's just, unfortunately, regrettably, mere talk. We need real action, not inaction. Labor's not prepared to make the tough decisions. They're not prepared to do the hard yards. Theirs is a government based on spin and slogans, and it's time they brought I've some given real a plans. Bit of latitude, and I'd really like you to come back for, to the bill before the House. This isn't an appropriation speech. Uh, indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's time they brought some real plans for welfare reform to the table beyond what's in this bill. If history is everything to go by, the next policy announcement I make will become Labor policy soon after, like our mutual obligation announcements from 2010. Uh, the coalition will not oppose this bill. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Blair. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I speak in support of the Social Security Amendment Parenting Payment Transition or Arrangement Bill 2011. And, Deputy Speaker, this is a good piece of legislation because it's about making sure that people have the benefit of, uh, of equity and equality with respect to their arrangements. It's part of our broader framework in terms of the learning or earning and getting people uh, off welfare into work. It's about making sure that we give people uh, incentive to do so. It's we uh, unapologetic about the fact there's a carrot and stick approach as well in terms of what we're doing in terms of social security. Uh, this bill, uh, Deputy Speaker, will amend the Social Security Act of 1991, 1991 so that only those children who are born uh, to or came into the principal care of their parent before the 1st of July 2011 will count towards the grandfathered status of the parenting payment uh, recipient. Now, Deputy Speaker, under our welfare to work, um, the eligibility for parenting payment was changed so that recipients who claim the uh, the payment from the 1st of July 2006 cease to be eligible once the recipient's uh, youngest child turns 16, if the recipient is partnered or eight years of age if the recipient is single. So prior to these changes, the eligibility, of course, for pa parenting and payment ceased when the child turns 16 years of age. Existing uh, parenting payment recipients on the 1st of July 2006 are covered by the transitional grandfathering arrangement whereby they continue to be assessed under the previous rules and may remain eligible if the circumstances change uh, for the payment until the youngest child turns 16 years of age. So it's about making sure that uh, people are treated similarly. Uh, the amendment in this bill will limit the grandfather transitional arrangements so that only children who are born to or came into the principal care of the parent before the 1st of July 2011 will count towards the grandfathered status 
of the peri-employment recipient. Deputy Speaker, this is a matter of equity. It's a matter of encouragement as well as a matter of uh, a stick in many ways as well. But, Deputy Speaker, I can't let the, the previous Speaker get away with some, saying some of the things he did. I mean, they talked about ducking the hard yards. This government didn't duck the hard yards. When faced with the global financial crisis, when faced with what Treasury said would be 200,000 jobs uh, lost, 1.5 million Australians work in the retail sector, 250,000 Australians work in the construction sector. What did we do? We made sure that those jobs were secure. We put in a temporary, targeted and timely approach to uh, going to deficit, but making sure that by way of our Keynesian response, we actually kept people employment. I can't count the number of times that people told me they had uh, jobs as a result of the BER projects, the infrastructure projects. We saw many people get a start, getting off welfare, into work, young people, apprentices, people that actually had opportunity, people that uh, in part had been recipients of parenting payment and social security payments who actually got jobs as a result of what we were doing. And when I visited in my electorate, Bremer TAFE, which received $2 million under our payments and opposed, of course, by those opposite, uh, when they received it to make sure that we improved the campus that at Bremer TAFE at Bundamba, made sure that single mothers, young people, older people could take new opportunity in their lives, could get off welfare. Many of them were single mothers and they was, there was, of course, um, uh, a childcare facility there where they learnt uh, responsibility, where they learnt parenting skills and they were given opportunity. And there were also arrangements where people could learn skills and trades as well, English, uh, computer skills. We put the money into the into Bremer TAFE. We did opposed by those opposite. That's our idea of getting people off welfare into work. And we've given a record amount of money for higher education. Now, we hear people opposite talk about the fact that they were the great reformers on Social Security. That's a member for Menzies talking about that. But I'll tell you something. Their idea of Social Security reform and, and reform not just in, in the uh, in the family life of people, but in the working life of people, was to impose work choices on, on, on the higher education sector, whether it was Bremer TAFE or the University of Queensland at St Lucia or at Ipswich. That's their idea. So they feign concern. They say that they're for reform with respect to social security, with respect to family payments. They say they're, they say they're in favour of, of helping those in need, yet by their very action, when in government, they, oppo they opposed um, real reform, and their reform was more of a matter of punishing those who are poor, weak, oppressed, disadvantaged, people who are migrants. And we see it every day, but not just by, by their actions, but by their language. We see it at question time. There's a harshness, there's a brutality, there's a meanness, and there's a dispiriting anger that those opposite keep showing towards those on welfare and those who are poor and those who are suffering. There, there's a real born to rule mentality and it comes through remember, for Menzies and all those opposite, the way they go on in this place. And even the Nats over there, Deputy Speaker, even though they do it. But look, this legislation is important legislation. My patience on this legislation is important. This legislation is important because forgotten, it's a first of many changes with respect Thank to you to the eligibility of, of groups of parenting payments. Um, this is important. This is, of course, aligning uh, rules to different recipients and ensuring over time the same rules apply to each person. And I believe fundamentally that the laws and social security payments and payments that people receive should be the same. They should be eligible uh, regardless of where they live, what their circumstances are. Deputy Speaker, these form part of a, a broader package, as I was referring to before, of building Australia's future employment package, a $3 billion initiative that we put in in this, in this budget. Now, we're, we're encouraging participation in work and other activities across the electorates across this country. In my electorate, we've seen it. 
to the local employment coordinator, Samantha Wilson, what they do. And the work that those groups have done to get people off welfare and into work has been fantastic. Organisations like Apprenticeships Queensland, organisations like Work Ventures, organisations like Bremer TAFE, organisations like the University of Queensland Ipswich campus. These are great organisations that are important to get people from welfare into work. And this budget that this legislation forms part of sees a $1.75 billion initiative in terms of funding payments to the states for vocational education and training. Never seen anything like that from those opposite. So don't let the member for Menzies come in here and lecture us about welfare to work, because their record doesn't show keenness for work, only keenness for work choices, and they're not interested in the welfare of the Australian people. What they're interested in is the welfare of the Liberal and National parties. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Haslock. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I just want to say to the member for Blair that, uh, given the uh, pathway I've walked in life, I don't find his comments uh, applicable. I rise today to support and contribute to the debate on the amendments to the Social Security Act of 1991, limiting the application of the parenting payment transitional arrangement. I acknowledge Senator the Honourable Chris Evans for the proposed amendments, which I support. The bill forms part of wider reforms to the Building Australia's Future Workforce 2011-2012 budget package released earlier this month. If passed, the amendments contained in this bill will come into effect as of 1 July 21. The bill will amend the Act to tighten existing arrangements on the grandfather clause which allows parents covered under the clause to continue receiving parenting payments for any child born before 1 July 2011. This amendment is about equality and ensures all Australian families are on an even, an even playing field in respect to parenting payments. This amendment is an important one and ensures that all the parents in the electorate of Haslark are given the same level of benefits that they deserve. It applies further amendments to the Employment and Workplace Relations Legislation Amendment, Welfare to Work and Other Measures Act 2005 introduced by the previous Howard government. The coalition agrees that government needs to do more to encourage sections of the community to re-enter the workforce or take this step for the first time. It is a long-held belief of the coalition that work is the best form of social security and its benefits far outweigh the obvious financial ones. This belief underpinned the previous amendments put forward by the Howard government. I launched the Green Jobs Corps in Forestfield, which, in my, which is in my electorate of Haslark earlier this year. It is a 20-week environmental training program that offers young people aged 17 to 24 years a combination of work experience, skill development and accredited training to ensure they're ready for employment in emerging green and climate change industries. In talking to them, I asked them why they hadn't taken other pathways, and they said this gave them the opportunity to enter into the working arena, and from that they were looking at pathways that they might consider at the end of their training. At the last election, the coalition had a suite of policies designed to encourage and reward more Australians to enter or return to the workforce. The coalition planned to introduce a job commitment bonus to encourage young Australians who had been out of work for lengthy periods to take a job and commence a pathway back into the workforce. The proposed additional incentives would encourage these people to stay in work beyond two years. A reallocation allowance was proposed if unemployed job seekers moved to a regional area to take up a position. Employers would have been rewarded for employing an eligible job seeker. Our older Australians who have a lifetime of experience, corporate knowledge and skills would have benefited from the $3,250 seniors employment incentive, payment for employees that hire mature workers aged 50 or older. Australia finds itself in a unique geopolitical position in the 21st century. The rise of China, a burgeoning India and a growing ASEAN economies will place huge demands on our workforce in the coming years. 
and it is a government's responsibility to ensure that its people are best placed as possible to take advantage of this growth. Australian governments have an obligation to build Australia's workforce and strengthen our domestic employment market. Deputy Speaker, the availability of jobs is one of the most important issues to my constituents in, in Haslark, and I suspect it would be the same for many other electorates. The electorate suffers from some of the highest levels of unemployment in metropolitan Western Australia, and there are many efforts underway to improve this situation by encouraging small businesses and giving people the skills they need to enter the workforce. I want to refer to initiatives that encourage young people to acquire skills which enable them to access employment opportunities. The Catalyst Clement University Education Program, driven by Mission Australia in association with Edith Cowan University, is based in Maddington and helps provide education to fast-track people into university courses. The second, Jobs West on Abernethy Road, is a community-based registered training organisation which promotes hands-on learning, while the Smith Family Group in Gosnells and Midland assists low-income families to enter its Learning for Life scholarship program. The Small Business Centre, South East Metro, is proof of how local organisations, given the right support and encouragement, can make a real difference to the community. Since its inception, the Small Business Centre has created hundreds of jobs in the south of my electorate. They manage a significant number of clients who, after advice on training and small business creation, are empowered to take steps to full-time employment and jettison the welfare dependency. In the north of my electorate, the Small Business Centre East Metro, under the watch of the Doyen Chief Executive Officer Tony Watts, is also helping one of Hazak's most disadvantaged areas thrive under difficult business conditions. And certainly he encourages young people to make that choice of stepping into the workplace, being supported, and then having the opportunity of a full-time job in some uh, uh, key areas. They also look at the opportunity for pathways into the resource sector. It offers training advice to start up businesses, information on new tax regimes to existing ones, the knowledge of how to maximise your business. This naturally results in employment flowing on into the community. Hazluck is also blessed with strong chambers of commerce, namely the Swan Chamber of Commerce and its formidable Chief Executive Officer Sandra Wallace, the Kalamunda Chamber of Commerce and its President Robert Bentley, and the Gosnells Chamber of Commerce, oversighted by John Hardy, the Chair, who was ably assisted by the Chief Executive Officer Denise Bradley. In my discussions with them, we've been looking at the opportunities that we can create for young people within the electorate of Haslark and, again, allow them to have that second chance in life that will enable them to not rely on government welfare programs that support a dependency. As such, I've set up, an advisor, I've set up advisory groups sourced from businesses, agencies and constituents within Haslark in the areas of training, environment and disabilities to meet regularly throughout the year to identify funding and policy opportunities and to progress the issues relevant to those key areas within Haslark. The Haslark Training Advisory Group is made up of representatives from different sectors in training, including industry, registered training organisations, the TAFE sector and the secondary schooling sector. Again, our focus as leaders within this area is to look at the opportunities that we can create for people to bring them into the skills pathway and into permanent work. This varied repre representation recognises that in the area of training, all sectors have a significant part to play in the delivery and outcomes of training opportunities for the people of Haslark. The proposed bill is highly relevant to the work we are collectively undertaking as leaders within Haslark. Deputy Speaker, my intentions are to address both the immediate needs of individuals within Haslark, but more importantly, to work with a strong network of training providers who contribute to the skills development of West Australians within this local area. I want to contribute to my belief in lifelong learning for all to enable individuals to have the capability and capacity to make choices, access skills training and have the flexibility of career pathway options. This group will work on achievable areas of policy formulation and opportunities in training which will assist young people who want to work and come back into the workplace. 
The alliance, or this alliance of the Hasluck Trading Advisory Group, is to provide strategic directions for a local approach for providing training and skilling opportunities. The bill will, to, the bill will contribute to my belief in lifelong learning for all to enable individuals to have the capacity to make choices, access skills training and have the flexibility to career pathway options that will increase labour market efficiency, productivity, innovation and to ensure increased utilisation of human capital as opposed to the reliance on the welfare measures. The Skills Australia discussion paper, Creating a Future Direction for Australia Vocational Education and Training Skills Australia, released in October 2010, is a salient reminder of the fact that the skilling of our human capital is critical. Australia is facing a stark reality in respect to our long-term economic and social prosperity and depends on the depth of skills in the population and the better use of those skills to overcome the risk of a fiscally unsustainable unsustainable ageing population. There is an urgent need to provide individuals with the broad-based skills and knowledge for changing labour market demands and emerging occupations and industries. Having had an education background, I'm often uh, of the view that we sometimes undervalue the human capital. This is often caught up on the welfare dependency. And in my discussions on a couple of occasions with Noel Pearson about the incredible talent that we still have within our society that we don't harness nor do we capitalise on the opportunities by taking them off dependency of welfare payments and into pathways of learning, skilling and training in order to equip them to make choices for some of the job opportunities that exist within this country. And to that end I commend the government on the amendments within this legislation. The Social Security Amendment Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement Bill 2011 is one step towards encouraging Australians to re-enter the workforce. I thank you, Deputy thank you. Speaker. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Petrie. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is my pleasure to rise to speak in support of the Social Security Amendment per, uh, Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement Bill. 2011. Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill is important to really correct what has been referred to uh, by the minister as an unintended consequence. And we've heard the member for Menzies, who was the minister at the time that uh, this transitional arrangement was brought in back in 2006, uh, criticising the position that the government is now taking in relation to this bill. But the reality is we are here today introducing this bill because there was a flaw in the way that this transitional arrangement was set up. Uh, to set up a grandfathering arrangement uh, generally means that you are looking at the entitlements of what was being provided at the time and you are protecting those entitlements into the future for a period of time for that individual group of individuals who are receiving that. What grandfathering clauses are not meant to do is to allow for those arrangements to indefinitely continue or for those arrangements in effect to be expanded because they not only protected those um, that were to be covered by the grandfathering clause in the first place but in fact broadened their coverage. And that's what the changes back in 2006 did. Uh, the parenting payment transitional arrangements came in uh, under the welfare to work and the changes were in relation to the eligibility for parenting payment such that the recipients who, who claimed the payment from 1 July 2006 would cease to be eligible once the recipient's youngest child turns six if the parent is partnered and eight if the recipient is single. Uh, prior to these changes, eligibility for parenting payments ceased when the youngest child turned 16. So the purpose of the transitional arrangements was to uh, identify those parents who were already in receipt of the parenting payment and to ensure that they continued to get that parenting payment recipient, uh, parenting payment as recipients until the child turned 16. Now, what that arrangement should have done is said, until the child or children 
who existed at that point in time in 2006 turned 16, but it didn't. It failed to put that clarity around that legislation at that time, and it created a situation that not only uh, the children at the time uh, as of, uh, who were born prior to 1 July 2006 were included in this grandfathering clause, but that those parents who continue to get that parenting payment, if they had further children or care for the children post 1 July 2006, continued to have that time frame of the youngest child until they turn 16 apply to those future children. And that is the case today. If they have another child today, then it's 16 years from that child. So that is the, the problem uh, that was created as a consequence of what was a flawed transitional arrangement that was established in 2006. So I appreciate the member for Menzies standing here in this chamber this evening and criticising the government, saying this isn't you know, a Labor government policy, this isn't about um, looking after parents and, uh, and entitlements, and criticising this government for the move we're making. But the fact is, the reason this bill is here is because the member for Menzies didn't do his job properly in the first place and, and basically uh, introduced a flawed piece of legislation. So we are here today, Madam Deputy Speaker, to rectify uh, that problem in relation to the transitional arrangements and to ensure that those parents in receipt of the parenting payment who have a child post 1 July 2011 will have those parenting payments in relation to those children born after the 1st of July 2011 receive exactly the same entitlement as every other parent getting the parenting payment, which is they will get that entitlement until that child uh, reaches the age of six, if they're partnered or if they're singled, um, uh, up to the age of eight. Now, I fail to see uh, any unfairness in a proposal that ensures that we bring in equality as far as entitlements for parents, and that's what this bill seeks to do. Now, it's very good to hear the member for Hasluck talking about uh, the importance of incentives for businesses, for ensuring we're delivering skills and training, and that we're moving away from reliance on welfare, because that's exactly what this Labor government's budget for 2011-12 did, and that's what this bill before the House today does because this bill is the first stage of the income support payment reforms contained in the Building Australia's Future Workforce Package. Now, this is a package of incentives for parents to engage in the workforce, reduce their dependencies on welfare and will provide families with a greater measure of financial security. Mr Deputy Speaker, what this government is doing is committing to building Australia's future workforce, mm -hmm. ensuring we are training up and getting people ready for work. We are doing this through skilling Australia's future workforce with $3 billion over six years, including reforms of the training system, through placing industry at the heart of the training effort, by ensuring apprenticeships at work for more Australians, vocational education and training to meet the longer-term needs of the economy and building better skills for workforce participation. Mr Deputy Speaker, we are ensuring more participation through rewards, opportunities and responsibilities, improving incentives in the tax system, investing so more young Australians are earning or learning, rewarding and supporting single parents to engage in work, supporting very long-term job seekers and more opportunity for people with disabilities. This is a new approach to addressing entrenched disadvantage in targeted locations also throughout the country. Mr Deputy Speaker, since the December quarter of 2007, Australia's GDP has risen 6.5 per cent in real terms, while real GDP in the Euro area and Japan are yet to return to pre-crisis levels. During the global financial crisis, Australia was one of only three advanced economies 
not to enter recession. And Australia's economy is expected to continue to strengthen over the medium term, driven by the resources boom which have, flowed on, which have flow on effects for the rest of the economy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Labor's, work, uh, force, uh, Labor's workforce participation is around historical highs at close to 66 per cent. Unemployment is forecast to fall to 4.5 per cent by mid-2013, and it is estimated that close to 500,000 jobs will be created over the next two years. However, there are still some groups at risk of missing out on these opportunities. It is this bill and other bills currently being debated before this House and bills that will be introduced over the coming weeks and months that will uh, implement the budget 2011-12 commitments that will see this government committing to more workforce participation and ensuring that those those people who have been long-term unemployed, those people who are single parents, those people who have disabilities, our young people, uh, those people in areas of entrenched disadvantage are getting the opportunity to participate in the workforce and have the dignity of work. That is what this government is about. It is about trying to move people away from the reliance of welfare and give them that opportunity. Now, some of those initiatives as part of the Building Australia's Future Workforce Package is skills for workforce participation, and that is why this government is investing $263 million to help people attain the basic skills such as reading, writing and numeracy needed to participate in the workforce. Mr Deputy Speaker, if we want to move people out of the welfare system and back into work, we have to invest in the basic skills that those people need, especially if they've been long-term unemployed, especially if they've been at home and caring for young children and out of the workforce for many years. That is why we will commit to $143 million to provide 30,000 additional commencements for job seekers in the language literacy and numeracy program, $80 million for additional training places for singles and teenage parents. $20 million to expand the Workplace English Language and Literacy Program to support businesses who want to boost the core skills of the workers, and $20 million to maintain the number of places in the Australian Apprenticeships Access Program to ensure apprentices have the basic skills they need. These measures build on the $116 million investment in language literacy and numeracy in the 2010-11 budget through the Skills for Sustainable Growth initiative. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have talked about workforce participation, and this government is spreading the benefits of that workforce participation through the most recent budget and through bills such as this. We are doing this by rewarding work through more timely tax assistance, improved income tests for single parents and young people, and incentives for employers that hire people with disability and the very long-term unemployed by providing new opportunities to get people into work through training, education, childcare and improved employment services, and introducing new requirements for the very long-term unemployed, disability support pension recipients, teenage parents, jobless families and young people, taking new approaches to address entrenched disadvantage in targeted locations. That's what this Labor government is doing to ensure that we are doing everything possible to ensure that we are getting workforce participation at a time with low unemployment but a skills shortage and businesses screaming out for workers. We need to do everything possible to make sure that people are not left behind, and that's what we seek to do. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I know a number of my colleagues uh, were speaking immediately before this bill on the Social Security Amendment Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement Bill on uh, some of the new tax law amendments uh, in relation to the budget, and they were talking about the low income tax offset. And that is, again, just one of those improved incentives in the tax system to make it, uh, I guess, more attractive for people to move back into the workforce but not be disadvantaged by doing so. And importantly, very much what this bill is about, talking about our parents, rewarding and supporting parents to re-engage in work. It is so important that we do this. 
and there are new opportunities and responsibilities for single parents. It goes both ways. We will provide the opportunities, but there are also responsibilities that come with that. In order to encourage parents to get into work, the government will provide $179 million to reward part-time work by reforming the income test for single parents on new start allowance. Changing the taper rate from the current 50 to 60 cents in the dollar to 40 cents in the dollar from 1 January 2013 will let them keep up to an extra $3,900 of their income from part-time work each year. And from 1 January 2013, the government will also gradually phase out grandfathering arrangements for the parenting payment recipients for the youngest child aged 12 to 15 to make eligibility more consistent with the treatment of other parents. And that's what we're talking about with this bill before the House today, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's about providing incentives at the same time as ensuring that we are moving people away from that reliance on welfare. It's also about providing consistency and equality. Right. And if we want to get the system right, if we want to get the balance right, we need to make sure that arrangements such as grandfathering arrangements work the way they're intended. And that is that they have a certain life a lifespan. And once that lifespan is up, and it should be a reasonable uh, lifespan, then those people move into a system getting the same benefits as everyone else. Not worse off, not as the member for Menzies would have us believe. It's about equality. And I, I fail to see how the member for Menzies can stand here and argue that parents who have a child after 1 July 2011, who will still get the benefits of the transitional arrangements for all of the children that um, were prior to the 1 July 2011, if they were part of the transitional arrangements from the 2006 legislation, that all of the children they have from the 1 July will get the same benefits as every other parent out there. I think this bill is fair. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend it to the House. Yeah. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Dobell. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak in relation to the Social Security Amendment Parenting Payment Transitional Bill 2011. And uh, we've just heard from the member for Petrie, who's given a, a, a very considered contribution in relation to uh, this bill, and in particular has pointed out the hypocrisy of the member for Menzies in terms of his criticism. Um, it was interesting. I was also uh, able to be here in the chamber to, to listen to the member for, for Hasluck, who took a very different approach to the member for Menzies. In fact, the, the member for Hasluck recognised this bill for what it was and congratulated the minister and uh, supported the bill and uh, congratulated uh, this government in relation to uh, the particular initiatives that, uh, that this bill seeks to bring in and the associated uh, reforms that uh, this government has uh, sought to, to brought in, bring in around jobs. In fact, I, I, I almost thought that uh, the member for Hasluck is actually sitting on the wrong side uh, because of the, uh, his, his, his such strong endorsement of government policy. Um, and, uh, he uh, went on to talk about jobs and the, the need for, for f further education, and uh, uh, clearly the member for Hasluck um, hasn't uh, spent too much time looking at the policies of the former Howard government, because uh, if, if he had, he would have been horrified with the party that he's uh, in this parliament to represent, because uh, they had an atrocious record in relation to investment in human capital, which was something that the member for Hasluck spoke about at length. Uh, they had a terrible record in relation to higher education, the, uh, the, the worst in the OECD. I think the, the next worst in the OECD it was, uh, had a positive contribution of something like 10 per cent in terms of growing uh, the, uh, the, the budget for, for a higher education. Uh, under the previous government, we saw a 15 per cent cut. So um, the, the member for Hasluck, um, look, I, I would make a general invitation to him that uh, with the views, the strong views that he put, he's obviously his personal commitment in relation to, to jobs and, uh, and making sure that uh, people get the opportunity to start, that he should come to this side of the parliament and join us more often because uh, uh, clearly he's a, he's a, he's a, a very decent man um, and uh, one who sees a good policy for, for what it is. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, as the member for Petrie said, this legislation is, is about fixing up a mistake 
that the member for Menzies made in 2006. He left open the grandfathering provision so that it didn't just apply to those, uh, the children of those parents who were eligible at, in uh, July 2006. It continued to apply by mistake by error in the legislation to a whole category of children that were born after that event, after that particular date. And, and, and th that really isn't grandfathering at all. That's uh, uh, the, the creep of, uh, of, um, of uh, middle class uh, welfare. Um, and it, it, has, it has effects um, because it means that uh, people are treated differently, that there isn't equality in the way in which uh, uh, we treat uh, children and parents who, who, who are eligible um, outside of that uh, grandparenting uh, provision. And that's just unfair. And uh, one of the things we need to do is make sure that we treat people fairly. But it also has a detrimental effect in relation to encouraging people to get off welfare back to work. And uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that's, that's where uh, this government stands in stark contrast to uh, the opposition and uh, to the previous Howard government in relation to what we believe needs to be done with jobs, uh, needs to be done in terms of the dignity of work, in terms of what needs to be done to, bre uh, to uh, break the, uh, the unemployment uh, cycle that uh, so tragically often affects many ge generations of, of, uh, of families. Um, <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, it, it's, it's not the first time that uh, people from this side of the House, and, and nor should it be the last because we're very proud of our record in government, remind the House of the, the fact that this government and only this government stood between Australia and a much, much higher unemployment rate that would have, uh, would have happened if uh, those on the other side were in charge of the Treasury benches when the global financial crisis uh, took place. Because, quite frankly, Mr Deputy Speaker, those on the other side weren't concerned about jobs at all. That was never part of their, their, their issue. Uh, they were happy to, to let the market rip and uh, see what happens and you know in the long run people will uh, uh, find a job was the, the sort of uh, attitude that was taken there. Well we stood up for Australians. We made sure that jobs was a priority. We wanted to make sure that people where we could keep them in jobs we did so and uh, that's what the, the stimulus packages were about and uh, all we ever got from the other side was negativity. Negativity about why things shouldn't happen, why we should be opposed to these issues, rather than looking at the, the, the very positive impacts that uh, our stimulus package had in terms of keeping people employment employed. I actually remember in particular visiting a school uh, a building site uh, where a hall was being built at uh, Tacoma Public School and meeting uh, a, a young apprentice, an apprentice carpenter called Jeff. Uh, now, Jeff had, was in his uh, third year of uh, apprenticeship, but uh, um, his apprenticeship, his, his previous employer, uh, cut him loose because of the, the downturn, and uh, he was in the unfortunate situation of being a third year apprentice um, without an employer and in a very difficult position to try and pick up and finish uh, th that, uh, th that uh, apprenticeship, which would have given him vital skills, uh, made sure that he was able to, to be employed and contribute to the economy. But it was our stimulus package that made sure that he had a job because he was picked up by the, the local builders. He was a, a local boy and uh, he, he got a job at that school, was able to go on and finish his apprenticeship. Now, that's, that's a, a very local example of, of why jobs are so important. Now, this budget, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, we've just had, um, of course, also made sure that it uh, looked at particular regions in, uh, in, in around Australia that, uh, that ha have uh, have had entrenched unemployment uh, and often intergenerational unemployment. And one of those, uh, one of those ten areas is uh, the Wyong Shire, uh, which uh, falls in my electorate of Dobell. Now, people for a long time have said in my electorate that uh, oh, unemployment is always going to be higher than the national average. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, that's just the way it is uh, in terms of uh, uh, where I live, that, uh, that there just aren't enough jobs. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, we don't take that view on this side of the House. We, we take the view that uh, no one should be left to the scrap heap of the economy, that uh, people should be given training, they should be given the opportunities. And what's so exciting about uh, the, this, this most recent budget was that, that in these ten areas, uh, where actually—and I note that the member for Throsby is, is here as well, and he's one of the other 
one of the other ten areas as well too, um, is that uh, that in relation to uh, to uh, this this particular package, we're actually looking at local solutions in these uh, these areas because that's often the key. Often it's making sure that we we're able to look at the ways in which we can approach unemployment from a local perspective, knowing the particular problems that exist in the local area and looking at the providers, the local solutions that are there, and moulding and crafting those solutions to get people back into jobs, mm -hmm. by making sure we connect those employers who are looking for, for, for a certain sort of uh, employee uh, with those employees who are looking for jobs, making sure we give training opportunities to, to uh, those people who, who may not have the skills to match the jobs that are there, but by making sure we put appropriate packages there, we're going to be able to match these, these things up. Now, the, the previous government, um, under, uh, in the intergenerational report, um, spoke a good game about uh, participation rates and the need to, 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 uh, to, uh, to increase Australia's participation rates uh, because of the ageing population, but they actually did nothing in relation to, to uh, uh, looking at uh, fixing uh, Australia's uh, participation rates. And in particular, Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the areas that we really need to focus on with participation rates, even though Australia's participation rates are at record highs, is that 25 to 44-year-old bracket for, for females. Um, Australia, uh, in, in that area, um, isn't performing as well as it should be. Uh, we're 25th in the OECD. Um, out of 33 nations, which is uh, a lot lower than what we should be. And so this government has, has looked at, over, over a long time, um, the way in which we can try and uh, make sure that uh, women in that childbearing age are able to participate in, in, in the uh, economy for two reasons. One, for their own social reasons, to make sure that they have the sense of you know, purpose and well-being, but also, importantly, for the economy itself, because we need to make sure that we are increasing participation rates, with uh, unemployment down to 4.9 per cent and estimated to go down to 4.5 per cent. So it's vital that uh, governments look at, uh, at particularly this area in relation to uh, making sure we can increase participation rates. Um, in terms of that, of course, the most obvious and the, the, the most uh, uh, needed uh, reform in this area was introducing a paid parental leave scheme. Yeah. Uh, Australia was one of only two countries in the world, uh, in the Western world, that didn't have a paid parental scheme. And uh, how, how the previous government could say that they are interested in increasing participation by women and not address this issue is beyond yeah, is beyond reason. Uh, clearly, this is something that was long overdue and will have, over time, a direct impact in terms of the participation of women who are in that childbearing age. Of course, the second, one of the second areas that we looked at was childcare and making sure that we increase the childcare rebate up to 50 per cent as well, because women in this area, uh, in the 25 to 45-year-old uh, bracket, um, often didn't have a choice but to stay at home because Childcare on, on, in two levels was difficult. One, it was uh, often unavailable, and uh, we've uh, looked at addressing that issue. And two, it was too expensive. And uh, by increasing the, the rebate to 50 per cent, we have, have done that. Um, the, the other issue, that, of course, is that, uh, that we've, we've done more recently is that we've uh, reduced the, uh, the effective tax-free threshold for, for low-income earners from 11,000 to 16,000, so that the effective marginal tax rate is not a disincentive for people to get back into employment. And that's a, a, a very important thing in relation to making sure that we get uh, people participating in, in the community. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this government has a track record of making sure we look at measures to get people back into jobs, making sure that jobs is first, making sure that we can put people who, who, who need to work uh, into, into, into work. We've, we've looked at areas that are of particular disadvantage, and uh, my uh, electorate is, is, is one of those. Mr Deputy Speaker, I was uh, shocked to learn, looking going through some of the statistics um, after looking at uh, the, the budget initiative the other day, that I have suburbs where there is uh, unemployment at the 26% uh, mark, uh, which is 
uh, which is a, a, a terrible uh, indictment in, in relation to uh, uh, the, the way in which governments in the past have looked at trying to uh, uh, address these sorts of issues. And, uh, Often in, in, uh, in, in this particular suburb, the, the unemployment is uh, uh, many generations because uh, they, they've known nothing else. They are welfare dependent. Uh, this government is about making sure people have the dignity of a job, that we get them off welfare uh, into the workforce so that they have that self-esteem, so the economy gets the benefit in terms of their contribution. Uh, this, this bill is, is part of that overall matrix of, uh, of uh, proposals and, uh, that uh, this government has put into place. Uh, it is uh, an example of the way in which uh, this government says jobs come first, because without jobs our communities disintegrate. Without having the emphasis on making sure people have uh, paid employment and are off welfare, our, our suburbs become more dangerous. They have a, a range of social issues that flow from long-term intergenerational unemployment. Uh, this bill is an important bill because it plays a role in relation to that, and it's a bill that I commend to the House. Yeah, yeah. Order the question is that this bill will be narrowed a second time. We'll call the member for Throsby. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's with great pleasure that I uh, uh, follow my colleague and friend, the member for Doe Bell, in this debate because uh, he makes an important uh, contribution, uh, a, devastating, uh, a devastating critique uh, that goes to the very heart of the distinction between our philosophy and how we manage the budget, how we manage the economy and how we deal with uh, social security and welfare and the distinction between our position and the position of those opposite. Because, as the member for Dobell points out, as we've gone through the global financial crisis, we've seen an interesting separation of, uh, of views between those opposite who thought it was much more important for them to retain the political bragging points that they could balance a budget for the government than it was for the millions of households to balance their budgets by retaining a job. And they come in here day after day and talk about the importance of dealing with cost of living. Well, there's millions of households out there, Mr Deputy Speaker, who know that the most effective way to balance their budget in their household and deal with the cost of living is to have a job. Now, this legislation before the House today is a part, a small part of our broader program to reform welfare and to reform the work for, and to re reform our workforce policy. Our approach to welfare sits on three pillars, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the first pillar is that we believe any good society has an obligation to assist its citizens in their time of need. The second pillar is that we believe that there is an inherent benefit in work and engaging in the workforce. That's a benefit to the individual themselves, to the economy and to the society as a whole. And the third pillar is that we believe that you can actually design a welfare system in a way that on the one hand provides a benefit to the welfare recipients but also builds in incentives, incentives for people to care for those whom they're entrusted to care for, incentives for those who are receiving a benefit to actually get out there and engage with the education system to, to learn and to build their skills, to re-engage with the workforce, and incentives to actually earn. A well-designed welfare system addresses each of those three points. And that philosophy, that approach, those three pillars to our approach to welfare are reflected in our budget. Uh, they're reflected in the legislation that we've brought before this parliament and intend to bring before this parliament, and they are reflected in this bill. The Gillard, Gillard government's first priority is to keep the economy strong so that we can keep families in jobs. And we have a very strong record in creating jobs. There are now more than 750,000 Australians in work than there were when we came to office in 2007, and we estimate that over half a million jobs 
will be created over the next three years. And the measures in this bill and our recent budget will facilitate that growth and facilitate making more opportunities for our fellow Australians. Now, joblessness, joblessness amongst families is a significant social and economic problem in Australia. It's associated with high rates of poverty, poorer health status and lower educational attainment for parents and their children. In my electorate of Throsby, Mr Deputy Speaker, in New South Wales takes in large parts of the southern Illawarra suburbs and the southern highlands, there are areas of intergenerational unemployment, much like those described before me uh, by the member for Dobell, where we have intergenerational unemployment and intergenerational social disadvantage. And that's why I'm pleased that a key objective of the Gillard government is to provide opportunities to equip jobless families to train and work and to provide a pathway to better life outcomes for both themselves and their children. I'm proud that this budget's a Labor budget that gives priority to jobs and opportunities for Australians, making sure that everyone can benefit from our growing economy. We all know that long-term parental joblessness, long-term parental joblessness and reliance on income support is a detriment to the long-term well-being of children. And that's why I'm particularly happy that in this budget, a region within my electorate, the Shell Harbour local government area, which falls within the southern part of my electorate, is one of the communities that has been identified for intensive assistance uh, to deal with long-term disadvantage. All of the social indicators in the Shell Harbour local government area for income support, for unemployment, for youth unemployment are higher than the national average. They paint a picture of a region that's been missing out on employment and opportunities for far too long. That's why it's great news that Shell Harbour is one of the ten sites for the trial of the new measures to make sure teenage parents finish school, that we support jobless families and we provide additional support for their children. I'm very pleased that recently the Minister for Human Services visited the Shell Harbour area, had an initial consultation with community groups and organisations and other stakeholders are in the front line of dealing with people at the tough end of disadvantage. The bill before the House today reflects another step in this government's budget to make sure parents remain engaged with the workforce and are helped to get back to work sooner. So currently single parents that have claimed income support after 1 July 2006 are eligible for parenting payment until their youngest child turns eight. However, at the moment, most parents, or well, parents who are receiving parenting payment before 1 July 2006 were grandfathered under the welfare to work changes, and their eligibility ceases when their youngest child turns 16, including for any children born or coming into their care after then. This bill aligns the eligibility of grandfathering recipients with those who started receiving parenting payments after the welfare to work changes, which came into effect on 1 July 2006. In straightforward terms, grandfathered single parents that have new children after 1 July 2011 will only be able to receive parenting payment until that child turns eight, not until that child turns 16 which is currently the case. In addition, grandfathered parenting parents that have, a new, that have new children after 1 July 2007 will only be able to receive parenting payment until that child turns six, aligning it with the current arrangements for new parents on parenting payment partner. This, this initial change will over time mean that the same arrangements apply to all parenting payment recipients and will lead to a reduction in time spent out of the workforce. The primary change we're introducing is a more generous income test for single principal carer parents. This provides, this provides for a strong incentive for single parents to take on part-time work. And as part of a $178.9 million initiative, Working single parents on Newstart allowance with a youngest child between 8 and 15 will be able to earn 
almost $400 a fortnight. We're up to a total of $1,346 per fortnight before they lose eligibility to New Start allowance. The grandfathered group's eligibility for parenting payments will cease when their youngest child turns 12 or 13 from January 2013. Now, this will give affected parents at least 18 months to get prepared for the change. As a transition, Parents whose youngest child is already 13 years old before 1 January 2013 will not be affected by the change. We also, make, we also make sure that parents have the right support and services to get the skills to get back to work. For example, the government will provide over $80 million for additional training places for single and teenage parents so they can get the skills they need to get a good job when they return to the workforce. In addition, $19 million for additional community-based support for parents like playgroups and mentoring through the Communities for Children program, $4 million for access to career counselling through the job services providers. Now, this career advice will be available to grandfathered parents in the year before they move on to the New Start allowance so they can start to plan their return to work and access the training needed. This is in addition to the pro, uh, support that we are providing through the new Teen Parents Initiatives to ensure that we are providing not only support and life skills and education opportunities, but generous child care support so that we make uh, and provide every support possible to give these people the opportunity to re-engage with education and re-engage with the workforce to provide them with greater life opportunities. In Mining Boom Mark II, we cannot allow whole regions to be left behind as they were during Mining Boom Mark I. It's notable that we've heard very little from the Leader of the Opposition on these new measures since the budget two weeks ago. Indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, he continues to be all opposition and no leader. This budget has focused squarely on jobs. It's focused on education and it's focused on training to ensure that the benefits of the mining boom make it into every corner of Australia, including some of our most disadvantaged communities. In our new location-based approach, welfare recipients will have greater responsibilities participate, to participate, but they will also have extra help. Centrelink is going to have dedicated caseworkers for the most disadvantaged job seekers and will work closely and in many, in many cases under the same roof with financial counselling services, drug and alcohol counselling services, housing and homelessness services and other types of services to help long-term unemployed people back into the workforce by overcoming all of the barriers that have kept them unemployed and have provided barriers to them being engaged with the workforce or education. All of the initiatives outlined in the budget are designed to couple intensive support with increased obligations, to give that extra help that people need to get them into work and to make sure that they too are able to share in unprecedented economic opportunities. The Gillard government understands that as our economy strengthens, there will be some parts of the nation that are leaping ahead and some that will fear that they are at risk of being left behind. And that's what we know as Australia's patchwork economy. And this is why the Gillard government is so determined to make sure that as we spread the opportunities that this phase of economic growth gives us, we do it in a way that provides jobs and opportunities for all. Opportunities to get a job, opportunities to get a trade, opportunities to get the skills, opportunities to get the skills that you need to get your first job. And as the Prime Minister has said, when you get that first job, the opportunity to move on, hopefully, to an even better job. And that is why, even in a tight budget, we have made sure that three billion dollars are available to invest in skills, because if we don't do that, not only will we, we, we be leaving people behind and running the risk of further entrenching disadvantages, but we know that we will be building economic bottlenecks in our economy 
that lead to an increase in inflationary pressures, uh, decreases in our capacity to take advantages of the opportunities that are available in the mining regions available to us as Australia located in the go-ahead region in the world, opportunities that are available to us in the boom in our services economy and we are not willing to sit by and allow that to occur. So there is a stark contrast, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. It's a contrast between the approach of those on this side of the House. We understand that there is an obligation on a, a government in a good society to provide both a helping hand but an incentive through the welfare system to ensure those that have often been left behind or ignored in welfare traps to find their way out of those traps, those poverty traps, those welfare traps, and that they don't hand down intergenerational disadvantage from, uh, from mother and father to child, from one generation to the next. We understand that engaging in work has inherent benefits for the individual, for an economy and for a society, and that we understand that a well-designed welfare system provides benefits to the individual but also builds in incentives to care, to learn and to be educated and to earn. I commend the legislation to the House. Order. The question is that this bill be endeavoured a second time. I call the member for Parramatta. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Back in April um, 2011, just a month ago, the OECD released a report called Doing Better for Families. It was a report into the condition of children in countries, and I have to say, Australia, uh, reading about Australia was not particularly um, pleasant reading. The sole parent employment rate was found to be one of the lowest in the OECD, which contributed to an above the average number of children living in um, no income households. In fact, around one in five children lived in such, such households, and it was projected that that number would increase by about 20 per cent over the next 25 years. In general, the report found that too many single parents were benefit dependent and far too many children in both single and partnered um, families were living in no income households. Joblessness, as we know, among families is a significant social and economic problem facing this country. Australia has one of the highest proportions of children living in jobless families in the OECD. In February 2011, there were more than 640,000 families in Australia with dependent children where that family was on income support. Some 40 per cent of these were jobless families with no reported incomes in the last 12 months, and around 70 per cent of jobless families were single parents. All of us in our own electorates meet people um, in circumstances such as this. Um, I find when I'm door knocking, I quite frequently find families that are sometimes third and fourth generation jobless. Joblessness is associated with higher rates of poverty, poorer health status and lower education attainment for both the parents and their children. Some parents spend a long time on income support and some spend their whole lives on it. For example, parents spend an average of between five and seven years on parenting payment and then may move to other income support payment, such as New Start allowance. We all know that extended periods of income support reliance are associated with ongoing high levels of disadvantage. If there was ever a time um, to make a move on this, it is now. I should say, of course, that it was also a time in the mining boom part one to move on this, but now as we enter mining boom part two, it's well and do, it's well and truly time for us as a nation to make serious inroads into joblessness among families. We have a comprehensive plan to build Australia's future workforce, and the bill that I'm speaking on tonight is a very important part of that. We have a long way to go. We have a long, long way to go on this. There have been some improvements. Back in 1990, for example, the unemployment the employment rate for mothers was, uh, with the youngest child under six was only about 42 per cent, less than the OECD average of about 48. By 2002, we had increased slightly from 
42 to 45 per cent. That's in nearly 11 years, but the OECD had increased to 59. The OECD has continued to increase, as have we, but we are still well below the OECD average. Now, the previous coalition government made some, um, uh, took some steps to improve the situation in their welfare to work package introduced um, uh, on the 1st of July 2006. But when they introduced that, I have to say they, they wussed it. I don't know whether wussed is parliamentary language, but um, I think they definitely um, wussed it. And they did something that they quite frequently did when they were in government. If they introduced a new set of rules, particularly in the welfare area, they tended to exempt people who were already on it for very, very long periods of time. Their grandfathering clauses, if you like, or their transition arrangements, which you might expect to last a few years, sometimes lasted for much, much longer than that, in fact, for sometimes for the life of the recipient. Um, this is one of those cases, and I'm going to explain the grandfathering um, cases and uh, clauses. And for those um, who haven't heard this before, you might find it difficult to believe because, quite frankly, it is quite unbelievable exactly what they did. Prior to the welfare to work changes, um, parents um, were entitled to parenting payment until their youngest child turned 16. When they introduced the welfare to work changes, which came into effect on the 1st of July 2006, when a parent had their first child and first came into contact with parenting payment, they were eligible for that parenting payment until their child turned six if they were in a couple and eight if they were single. So if I had my first child after the 1st of July 2006 and first came into contact with parenting payment, there was a quite a reasonable period I could have six or eight years on the parenting payment and as my child got older I was expected to move off it. Now, if I had a child before the 1st of July 2006, then I was able to retain the existing arrangement until the child turned 16. So if I had a child already prior to the 1st of Ju June 2006, 1st of July 2006, that new rule didn't apply to me. I was able to keep my parenting payment as my child turned four or five or six or seven or eight, right up till they turned 16. There's some justification for that. But they went further than that because they didn't attach the grandfathering clause to the child. They actually attached it to the parent. If I was receiving a parenting payment before July, 1st of July 2006, no matter how many children I had, even 10 or 15 years into the future, each of those children for each of those children, I would be entitled to keep the parenting payment until they turned 16. So if I'd had my first child in 2005, then I had another one in 2008 and one in 2010, and I presumably if it continued had another one in 2015, I would still be entitled to the parenting payment until that child turned 16. Now that's a grandfathering clause. That's an extraordinary grandfathering clause. And when I first read it, read it I read it three times because it really is quite absurd. Now we are acting in this bill to um, effectively introduce some sanity into this, to introduce some sanity and some equity, but we're not doing it in a way that provides surprises to families. We also, in effect, are grandfathering people on the existing arrangement so they can transition over in a reasonable way with a reasonable expectation of what the rules will look like um, as their child gets a little bit older. So this is what we're doing. Firstly, let's deal with uh, single parents that have claimed support, income support after the 1st of July. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll, start, I'll start that sentence again. Um, the bill really aligns the eligibility of those parents and children that were grandfathered with those who started receiving the parenting payment after the welfare to work changes came into effect on the 1st of July 2006. Now what this means is that a single parent that has a new child after the 1st of July this year, in other words, if you're about to have a child and you have a child after the 1st of July this year, you'll only be able to receive the same parenting payment that other parents received who had their children after the 1st of July 2006. That means that you'll be eligible to receive the parenting payment until the child turns six if you're a partnered couple and eight if you're a single couple. That absolutely brings um, parents 
into line, those grandfathered parents into line with what happens when other parents have children. But that will apply from the 1st of July 2011, so it's not retrospective. That means if you had your first child prior to the 1st of July 2006 and you've had a couple of children since then and you're having another one, that new child, the new parenting payment will apply. So that will expire when the child turns six or eight, depending on your circumstances. We've also dealt in this bill with what happens um, for parents who have uh, children born prior to the 1st of July 2006. We're also bringing those into line over a, a period of years. So what we're doing is that we're giving parents essentially 18 months to get prepared for the change. So a grandfathered parent whose youngest uh, will have their parenting payments cease when their youngest child turns 12 or 13 as of the ch January 2013. That means if you had a child who was, say, six or so on the 1st of July 2006, I know it's very complicated because it was a very silly grandfathering <laughs> clause. It was very silly. Um, if, sorry? I know it is all over the place, and we're try it's, it's actually quite difficult to kind of deal with these, these sort of strange um, hangovers from a, from a quite absurd um, uh, decision back in 2006. But if you had a child back in 2006 who was about six at the time, your parenting payment will cease essentially around um, January 2013 when that child turns 12 or 13. Um, if your child is younger than that, if your child was only two or three at the time, then you've still got a few more years because the parenting payment will continue until your youngest child turns 12 or 13. That means that over what will now be about a 12-year period from 2006 um, to about 2018, all the parents who were grandfathered when the coalition government introduced this absurd grandfathering clause in 2006 will move over to the same set of rules as the other parents. It's going to take us that long to bring equity back into the system, but quite frankly I think you know, we need to give parents um, the uh, lead time to make the decisions in their life and make the adjustments, particularly for parents who've already been out of the workforce for long periods of time because this grandfathering of the parenting payments allowed them to do so. Some of these parents that are coming back into the workforce um, post 2012-13 may have been out of the workforce for quite substantial periods of time. So it's important for us also to provide support in other ways. Um, we are um, doing a number of things that will help them um, get back into the workforce. For a start, we're providing 80 million for additional training places for single and teenage parents so they can get the skills they need to get a good job when they return to the workforce. We're also providing 19 million for additional community-based support for parents like playgroups and mentoring through the Communities for Children program. That playgroup um, idea is a particularly valuable one. I know in my area, wherever there are large numbers um, of single parents, um, we find that the, the local community um, quite often gets together to support these parents through that particular format. It's a very, very useful way for parents to interact, get out of their homes and start the process um, of socialising again and moving back into the broader community. We're also providing four million for access to career counselling through job services providers. This career advice will be available to grandfathered parents in the year before they move on to New Start so that they can plan their return to work and access the training they need. Again, this is very important because this absurd old grandfathering um, process introduced by the previous government has left a lot of parents out of the workforce for many, many years. So I'm, I'm pleased to see this bill introduced to the House. Um, it will um, provide an incentive and assistance for many people to move back into the workforce at a time like this when we're approaching a serious boom, particularly in mining in our economy. We need to make sure that we are providing every opportunity we can for people to benefit from that boom by moving back into the workforce and enjoying the benefits that a boom can bring. And this bill begins that process as part of a much, much larger, larger package to support some of the, the um, more vulnerable people in our community. Order the question is that this bill be now read a second time. I'll call the member for Shortland and the government whip. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
and it's always a pleasure to follow the member for Parramatta. She went to the detail of this bill and described all aspects of it very succinctly. And I must say, after listening to her contribution to the debate, I feel it will be difficult for me to improve upon the information that she's put before the parliament tonight. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think the first thing that I'd like to say in speaking to the Social Security Amendment Parenting Payment Transitional Arrangement Bill 2011 is that we're back here in this House fixing up a mistake made in 2006 by the Howard government. Now, I don't know how many times I've spoken in this parliament revisiting legislation where they've made mistakes that have required immediate action to rectify the problem. Now, this bill limits the application of the parenting payment transitional arrangements or the grandfathering so that only children who were born to or came into the principal care of their parents before the 1st of July 2011, this year, will count towards the grandfathered status of the parenting payment recipient. Now, that shows just how poorly drafted the original legislation was. That shows just the enormous number of problems that uh, existed in the original legislation. The amendments in this bill, the amendment in this bill is the first of a number of changes being made to the eligibility for a certain group of parenting payment recipients. Now this is part of the, the, in the government's welfare to work uh, reforms. There will be quite a tranche of uh, legislation that passes this through this parliament giving greater opportunity to those people that are unemployed or people that are in support of a single parent payment to actually get the skills and the support that they need to re-enter the workforce. This is about creating opportunities for those people who would like to re-enter the workforce who are unable to even contemplate re-entering the workforce because of the barriers that currently exist to prevent them. Now, currently, parents who claim income support after the 1st of July 2006 and are eligible for parent payment until their youngest child turns eight years old, um, if that parent is single or six years old, uh, if the parent is partnered, uh, so they will therefore um, be covered by this um, grandfathering, grandfathering component uh, to the change to the grandfathering co component. The amendment to this bill will limit the grandfathering transitional arrangement so that only children who are born or came into the principal care after July 2011, as opposed to the current situation, which uh, is, leads to an open slather situation. This change will gradually align the rules that apply to different recipients and ensure that the time the same rules will apply to all parenting payment recipients, regardless of when they claim the payment. Very important. It's, it's about equality. It's about ensuring that people are treated the same and it's about creating equity in the system. Other changes to the parenting payment eligibility will further limit the coverage of the grandfather traditional arrangements to provide even more consistent eligibility rules from 1 January 2011. Very important, very important that, we, that this problem that was created by the Howard government is fixed up. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, we all know that uh, the global financial crisis impacted enormously throughout the world, but here in Australia, I think we performed just about the best of any other country, any country. And uh, because of that, we were able to keep our unemployment level at a very low level. And uh, 
the situation now exists where we need to skill up our workforce so as that they are able to uh, fill those jobs in the areas where there's a skills shortage. And uh, joblessness among families is a significant social and economic problem in Australia. And what the government is determined to do is to provide opportunities to those people that are long-term unemployed, those people that uh, have been out of the workforce for a significant number of time, amount of time for a variety of reasons, uh, whether it's for the purpose of uh, child rearing or because they've been unable to access a job because they don't have the skills. Well, a key objective of the government is to, uh, to create opportunity and to equip these people, these, these jobless uh, uh, families with the skills to train and work and then re-enter the workforce. Now, Shortland Electorate's in uh, the southern part of the Hunter and the northern part of the Central Coast. It falls within the Wyan Shire uh, Council local government area, and, it, and Wyan Shire Council is one of the ten areas that has uh, been identified by the government to, um, to trial a program of local solutions. The northern part of the central coast is where there's a lot of very disadvantaged job seekers, um, where people find it difficult to access employment. Uh, there's been a number of really good initiatives that have taken place already. Uh, trade training centres in the high schools uh, in the northern part of the Central Coast, in Shortland Electorate, have created new opportunities for all those students that are attending those trade training schools. They're developing the skills that they need to be able to access jobs rather than being long-term unemployed. And in addition to that, the Australian Technical College that was uh, languishing on a piece of paper has been devolved to those same schools and now is providing training opportunity for those uh, young people living in an area where there's a very high youth unemployment. And this government is about creating opportunity. This government is about assisting people to move from welfare to work. It's about uh, ensuring that long-term parental jobless, uh, people that have been unemployed and, and uh, on parental payments uh, and uh, relying on income support, have the opportunity, have the opportunity to re-enter the workforce, to engage, and by doing that, it ensures not only their own well-being by giving them so many life choices, but also the well-being of their children. It's all about creating opportunity, and this this uh, legislation we have before us today is about equality, equality between those pe people that are receiving uh, paid parental uh, payments and uh, parenting payments, should I say, and um, it's also about creating opportunity. Now, the current situation is that, is, <coughs> as I've mentioned, and the grandfathering really creates an inequity. We're fixing up a problem, an enormous problem that has been caused by the Howard government, a government that didn't put its mind to detail, and because it didn't put its time a mind to the detail, this situation was created. And along with um, changing this, there'll be extra money for training, extra money for community support, extra money to help with career counselling, so as that those people that are unemployed, those people that have been on parental payments will be ready to re-enter the workforce. I commend this piece of legislation to the House and uh, say that the opposition, we fix the problems Order. that you create. It being 9.30 p.m., I propose the question that the House do now adjourn, and I call the honourable member for Herbert. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Magnetic Islands is just off the coast of Townsville. It is a truly wonderful place. It sits within the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Mm -hmm. It is the jewel in Townsville's tourism crown. It is a quick 30-minute, 20-minute ride in a, in, a, uh, in a ferry across to Nelly Bay. 
Can I tell you, Mr. Speaker, that uh, during the campaign leading up to the 2010 election, we came out and we promised a walkway from Nelly Bay around the front of Bright Point, around uh, Jeffrey Bay, through to Alma Bay and Arcadian Surf Life Saving uh, Club. Idea. It would be the most fantastic walk in the world. It would be the walk equivalent of the Great Ocean Road, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. It would be absolutely magnificent. Labor matched our promise. $4.7 million uh, to build this walkway. It has been long needed on, uh, in, in Magnetic Island. And I'll tell you why. To get from Nelly Bay to Arcadia or Alma Bay, you have to come out of Nelly Bay and you go up, up, up over the steepest of hills. Now, it's a backpacker haven, but you have people there carrying great big backpacks with no sidewalk, only a steep, only a rail. Uh, beside the white line, and you'll step out, you can fall all the way down into the ocean. How no one has been killed there is completely and utterly beyond everyone. I actually, my first attempt to get funding for this was actually under black spot legislation, but unfortunately, not enough people have been killed. So, the, for, for, for the big reason of, of being that it's a very, very steep hill, you have backpackers and tourists crossing that hill on foot and on push bike makes it very, very hard. So, we, I won the election. Best, best result ever. Best result ever. Thank you. The member for Denison asked the Prime Minister what would they do with promises they kept, uh, the promises made by Labor candidates in seats where Labor did not win. The Prime Minister stood at the dispatch box, hand on heart, and said, "Our promises were fully costed, every one of them. Of course they will be delivered. Of course they will. We don't go around making promises that we won't fulfil." So I dashed off a letter to which there has still been no reply. Senator Jan McLucas was in town when she was asked about uh, the uh, Magnetic Island walkway, and she said, well, of course the um, candidate made the promise, and not a minister or the prime minister. Oh. Now, it could, it could be a loophole, could be a loophole. So oh. I went back and checked. I went back and checked the Hansard. The prime minister stood at the dispatch box and said that whether, the, whether the promise was made by a candidate, by a minister or by herself, it would be kept. So I don't know, Jan McLucas is calling uh, the Prime Minister out for telling untruths. But now we find that, uh, the, uh, that the Townsend City Council has been told by this government, this government that can't tell the truth, that they, get, that they are now approved to apply to the Regional Development Authority for funding. <laughs> so their promise was that they were allowed to fill out an application form. Jan Lucas needs to do that walk. Jan McLucas needs to do that walk over the, over, the, uh, over the hill, and the good honourable senator would do a wonderful job doing it. Yep. Why is it important? We need to develop our tourism industry. The tourism industry in North Queensland has been decimated since the cyclones and since the floods. It is in a whole world of hurt. We need to get this thing rolling. Yeah. If you could link this walk over to the, to the traditional walks over the hills up to the fort, yep. one of the great walks in the world. And couple that in with an indigenous tourism and all the way down to the tourism sector and tourism section of Horseshoe Bay, uh, it would be one of the great additions to North Queensland. Yeah, yeah. So, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, I'm sitting there, I'm over on Magnetic Island, I'm doing a listing post and some door knocking, and people come up to me and they say, Well, listen, the Prime Minister said she'd fund it. The Prime Minister said she'd fund it. Surely, surely the Prime Minister would be good, or, good for a word, to which I just went, <laughs> oh, come on, come on. The Prime Minister staring at the dispatch box and says the promise made, that a promise made by her prior to the election would be kept after the election. Standing at the dispatch box saying she can keep her word. This is very, very good. I call on this government, I call on this government to finally honour their word deliver the $4.7 million. You can deliver $13 million for a union we website, for a union we website, $13 million for a website, but $4.7 million delivering jobs and tourism to North Queensland, and they can't see their way clear. This government should stand on its hands, stand on its hands and beg for forgiveness and, and say to the people of North Queensland, here's your $4.7 million. And I ask the government to honour their word. Thank you, Mr Speaker. While I'm not quite sure how Hansard's going to record the evocative contribution of the member for Herbert, uh, his time has expired, and I now call the honourable member for Braddon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, unlike those opposite, I like to talk about things positive. Um, I'd like to uh, 
I'd like to recognise and congratulate the small businesses of my electorate, indeed the small businesses of Tasmania and indeed Australia. They do a fantastic job in keeping the engine room of our economy moving, and particularly uh, where I live. And I'd like to pay recognition to the O Group uh, in my electorate who uh, auspice the business and employment um, uh, arm of the group. And they operate three of the business enterprise centres that exist in Tasmania. And the O Group, of course, has its origins uh, in my electorate. Indeed, the CEO is a former student of mine, and I'm very proud to say that. They have uh, over 10,000 interactions with small business, and they have this business and advising and referral service uh, throughout the state. With 356 services, for example, in the past six months on the northwest coast alone, um, they uh, help start up 126 new businesses, which have employed 223 new employees. And I suppose when you drill down small business, it's an interesting uh, fact of life that of the 38,000 businesses, for example, operating across Tasmania, 95% of them are small businesses including 80 per cent making up micro-businesses employ less than five people, yeah. uh, something we forget about because generally the big noise of the economy is in the larger industries, but indeed uh, the economy uh, is generated by smaller businesses. Around 22 per cent of small micro-businesses, or 8,400, are located on the northwest coast and the west coast of my electorate. Now, I've had, unfortunately, over the last two years, um, a number of major manufacturing centres close their doors. For instance, our two paper mills, Tascot Temple, Templeton Carpets and uh, Smithton, uh, where half the vegetable processing plant closed down for a variety of reasons. And so we've had large, large numbers of unemployed. But I'm really pleased to say, with the diversified economy, which is really the only way that regional and rural centres are going to survive, and we've been able to do that in the last 15 years, and I congratulate um, the, both Tasmanian government and governments and also the federal government in allowing this uh, to occur, along with, of course, those enterprises. Many of the unemployed have been reabsorbed into our local economy. For example, of 360 workers lost from our paper mills, for example, 220 have been reemployed, have set up businesses or, indeed, have gone into training and many of the others have indeed retired with a much older uh, workforce. And many of those, of course, have been employed by small businesses. Um, they are indeed, as I mentioned, the engine room uh, of our economy. In terms of Tascot Templeton, which was a very qualitative maker of carpets in my region, uh, they lost about 150 jobs. Approximately 125 of these workers chose to stay in the labour force and sought other employment. 101 of these workers registered uh, with the O Group in terms of Choose Employment, which is another arm along with business and enterprise. Um, and, um, uh, so they were able to accurately track what these people were doing. And I think it's really important, as we've done with the paper mills and the establishment of forest works, <laughs> that we actually go about being able to track what happens to unemployed persons. We just don't leave them to fall in and through the net. And they've been doing this tracking exercise and working with these workers individually. Of the 101 workers, for example, 79 have been now re-employed, mostly through medium-sized manufacturing or processing businesses, but around 30 have been employed by small businesses, and a similar story in Smithton in the far northwest of my electorate. So uh, the uh, other interesting thing that's come out through this, and even at a time of difficult economic circumstances and unemployment, the O Group, as an example in my electorate, um, have signed up 517 apprentices in the last six months, and most of this through this Commonwealth government's apprenticeship programs, skills and training. Uh, 517 along the coast, Five, uh, 358 of these, or 69 per cent, were signed up by small business operators. So I congratulate our small business operators. I congratulate those uh, that support our unemployed and apprentices, 
and I believe Order. that uh, through a diversified economy, that's how regional and rural the Australia will be able to sustain has itself. Well, and truly expired, I now call the honourable member for Wannan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise tonight to speak on the issue of flood insurance, and it brings me no joy to do so because this is not a good news story. The way an insurance company is treating its clients in the town of Carisbrook has to end. Enough is enough. The time has come to treat these people with the respect that they deserve. It is now over four months since the worst floods in 100 years to hit Victoria happened, yet these residents of Carisbrook still do not know if they will get their claims paid and if they will get them paid fully. I stand here tonight to, stay, to say stop the paper shuffling, process the claims and let these people get on with their lives. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, on Tuesday the 19th of April, Senator Gary Humphreys, the Coalition spokesperson for flood recovery, and myself visited the town of Carisbrook. Upon arriving, we were greeted with the front-page newspaper headline of the Carisbrook Mercury, Double AMI Unlucky for Residents. Well, Mr Speaker, after numerous representations to Double AMI and the Insurance Council of Australia, tragically, this headline still rings true. I stand here tonight to call on Double AMI to stop the rot and do the right thing by these residents who have suffered for too long. Dealing with destructive flood waters is bad enough, let alone dealing with what seems to be bureaucracy gone mad. Mr Speaker, on that day, Tuesday the 19th, I had the privilege of calling in to meet Kirsty and Brett May and their children. A young family making their way in a small rural community who had paid their insurance in good faith. Kirsty and Brett showed Senator Humphreys and myself the damage that had been done to their four bedrooms and the mattresses on the floor where their children were now sleeping. They also explained how Brett was on a military pension, having been medically discharged and in need of a knee replacement. Kirsty and Brett had suffered flooding to their wonderful family home and were seeking to see their claim honoured by double AMI. Sadly, they had already been informed that their house had not suffered from stormwater damage, although their shed had. <laughs> as ludicrous as this might sound, it is true. Kirsty and Brett took photos of the flood water in their house that morning, yet they had been told that the flooding that had occurred in their house was a result of riverine flooding that, not, that had not occurred until that afternoon. I saw those photos and also spoke to the Shire chief engineer who was present on the morning the May House was flooded. After seeing this photographic evidence and talking to the chief engineer, I, along with Gary Humphreys, immediately made the Insurance Council of Australia and AAMI aware of these facts. Yet here we are on the last day of May, over six weeks later, and the Mays are still none the wiser as to whether AAMI are going to honour the contract they had with them for stormwater flood insurance. I spoke to Kirsty May today and, remarkably, given the enormous stress that her and her family are under, she retains a sense of humour. How this is the case is beyond me, but her resilience is something which I have seen writ large across flood-affected communities across Victoria, and it never ceases to amaze me. True. But enough is enough. Double AMI need to act and they need to act now. The Mays and all the other Double AMI clients in Carisbrook deserve to know what the company is going to do 
and they need to know immediately. Otherwise, the ICA and its affiliates and their process of dealing with insurance claims in flood-affected areas of Victoria isn't worth the paper it's written Order. on. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. I now call the honourable member for Parramatta. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Over the last couple of days, we've seen uh, Kate Blanchett and Michael Caton, two rather well-known actors, take part in an advertising campaign that was run by a collective of community groups. I have to say some of the responses were rather odd. We saw Kate in particular um, personally attacked because somehow there seemed to be a view that because she had earned a reasonable amount of money, in fact quite a good amount of money in her life, um, she wasn't entitled to call for a better future and a less costly future for her children when there were people that would um, there are people uh, in the community now that would find the costs now difficult to bear. And it highlighted for me an argument which rages in the climate change debate, which is exactly that, that argument between whether we wear some of the cost now or whether we leave the cost for, for later generations. I mean, in, in every community, people individually place a different value on cost depending on where it is. Some of us um, will consider that a cost today um, is far more devastating than, one, than the same cost if it appeared in two or three weeks' time. We vary across the community, and sometimes that's um, a cultural difference or a background difference, and sometimes it comes from circumstances. In my community, there are um, many communities, but there are two distinctly different ones in terms of the way the community operates. In some of the less affluent areas, when you meet the people who go out and do the work for the community, they look into their community and they see that people need assistance in the very basic needs of life. They focus on providing housing, food, clothing, making ends meet, trying to find regular employment for members of the community. The focus for those communities is very much on meet meeting the day-to-day -day needs of their families. In other sections of my community, usually the leafier suburbs, not rich suburbs, but more comfortable suburbs, the, the focus of the community sector tends to be more on arts and environment, longer term issues, building art galleries, dealing with the longer um, planning the future, because they are communities that have the capacity um, to trade off some of the benefits now for a benefit later. So I have one community that is unable to do that, for whom uh, who doesn't have the capacity really to say, OK, let's put something aside now for something in the future, and one community that can do that quite easily. Any path we find through the climate change debate must take account of both of those perspectives of this issue of cost, because both are perfectly relevant. A good parent who is struggling to support her child now and his child now isn't wrong to prioritise the needs of today over the needs of tomorrow, because for some of them that's the only way they can get through the day. But nor is it right for us to put aside the argument that if we don't pay attention to changing things now, if we don't actually act fast, the cost burden on our children and their children will be much, much greater. Both arguments are equally valid. Finding a way through the climate change requires a response that satisfies both. Now, oddly enough, if you decide to do nothing now, and you transfer the costs later, you really are only satisfying one of those arguments. But the path that we have chosen of pricing carbon actually does satisfy both arguments. It recognises that if we as a community don't wear some of the burden now, our children will pay a much, much greater cost. But it also recognises that there are elements in our society that need assistance in bearing some of that cost. So the household assistance package that we are working on that will compensate low and middle income households for the additional costs now um, satisfies um, the need to balance both those arguments. I'm pleased to see my government acting on climate change. Um, I'm one of those people who, for most of my life, life looks forward and actually places considerable um, emphasis on costs and benefits in the long term. I'm a long term planner by nature, and I'm lucky enough. Um, to not have been hit by some of the catastrophes or the disasters or the um, inequities that um, some others have faced. So I have enough capacity in my life to put some aside now to make sure that the future is well taken care of. Um, so I'm pleased to see us act, but I'm also pleased to see that this party 
is concerned with those that don't have the spare capacity to consider the future and to make sure that as we move down this path to ensure a prosperous future for our children, we protect and safeguard um, the uh, circumstances of the um, less well-off in our community through generous household assistance package. The question is that the House do now adjourn. I now give the call to the honourable member for Wright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, tonight I rise to uh, bring to the attention of the Parliament the three basic principles as to why I was elected to the member of, as a member of Parliament. And predominantly, they speak to uh, a reduction in uh, the measures of compliance for our small business uh, sector. And secondly, I, I fought on the principles of uh, I wanted to put more money into the pockets of mums and dads in my electorate. And thirdly, I, I assured my primary industry sector that I would fight for a better price for their product at the farm gate. And, 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 and Mr. Deputy, Mr Speaker, as, as you be aware, I come from the, uh, the, the seat of Wright, which encompasses the Lockyer Valley and the Fassifern Valley, which more recently has been devastated by um, astronomical flood levels uh, and out of proportion devastation. We still have families uh, displaced from their homes. Um, and are doing everything they can, humanly possible, to get their lives back into some type of routine, the routine that you and I in this House take for granted. Mm -hmm. In addition to the devastation that we've received, uh, my, my electorate is predominantly uh, a rural precinct. Uh, so the infrastructure damage that was done to my farming precinct was overwhelming. Uh, the heartache that my farmers had to go through in, in laser levelling town, you know, in, in, in basically taking you know, two and three metres of silt, overburdened silt, off their crop, uh, so that they could get to um, get to any type of reasonable capacity to get a crop in. Um, but they did. You know, we are res a resilient mob. We are a resilient people in the electorate of right, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and we and, and we are doing everything humanly possible. But. Jingoes, it's hard to get motivated when these hurdles are constantly put in front of us, Mr. Speaker. Um, our dairy farmers have just, of which I have 36 throughout my electorate, have just uh, are just going through an incredibly tough time in trying to do their forecast with reference to uh, uh, capital investment programs into their into their uh, into their sector, industry sector. When there's so much indecision on the back of West Farmers, uh, Coles, uh, price warring. Uh, situation at the moment, and I just want to take you to the point of you know, the word you know, West Farmers who own coal. Um, West Farmers actually built their business yep. on the back of farmers, yep. and it is ironic that I actually stand in this house today to defend my very farmers uh, from the me the machine or the mechanism that West Farmers have built in the way of coal. So it has great concern, and I will lobby and fight for my farmers as best I can from the dairy sector. Um, and I bring to your attention just today a meeting held in Brisbane by the uh, Queensland Dairy Organisation, uh, where Brian Tesman, the Queensland Dairy Organisation president, uh, spoke at the Rural Press Club, where I'm sure today he made reference to the supermarkets creating a situation of market failure, which does not, have the ref uh, which does not reflect the current supply of demand situation or the true value of the cost of fresh milk. Um, Predominantly, what he's saying is that as, uh, as, as, as the market leaders on milk push pressure down on, on, on our generic brands, dairy farmers will leave the industry. Yeah. But more importantly, I mean, in my electorate, it just keeps on getting worse. I mean, it's like a Demtel ad in reverse. There's a set of steak knives on this as well. And on the weekend, Mr. Speaker, we were informed that uh, of which 20. 20 per cent of my, my, uh, my growers in the area of which produce all, all of Queensland's uh, beetroot were informed by Golden Circle, a fully subsidiary of Heinz, that no longer would their product be wanted. Now, I, 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 Mr. Mr Speaker, I bring to your attention a simple Golden Circle tin of sliced beetroot. Do yourselves a favour when you get out of here tonight. Go and get yourself one of these, because these are going to be, ladies and gentlemen, a collector's item in Australia. These are going to be a collector's item. No more will the contents of this product be made in Australia or made in Queensland or made in the electorate of right. You are going to be buying beetroot uh, processed in New Zealand from possibly China, Poland, Bulgaria, any of those countries that, that have a lower, lower cost efficiency of getting getting pro uh, uh, product into a tin, I can assure you that the product, um, 
the, the product quality will not be anywhere uh, as good as what, uh, as what we have in the Lockyer Valley. And it brings to the attention of the House as to why these firms are now leaving our shores. Now, why, are these, why is Golden Circle in Queensland now choosing to relocate their Golden Circle chain to New Zealand uh, when, when, when our Prime Minister is telling us, uh, with, with a hand on a heart, that the carbon tax will not have an impact on this industry? Now, uh, the, the increased costs. Order. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that the House do now adjourn. I now give the call to the honourable member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to speak in the House this evening, uh, following on from the member for Wright and the member for Braddon, both who have celebrated this evening the place of small business as the backbone of our economy. Uh, I would like to speak in particular this evening about the building the education revolution impact in my particular electorate. We know that $16.2 billion was invested in the future of schools and young people in this country as part of the economic stimulus plan, $42 billion invested in Australia. And we can see in the time following on from the uh, global financial crisis that Australia's econ economy and our economic management has been widely and wildly applauded. Earlier this evening, the member for Fraser spoke of the, de the decision by the Treasurer to have a timely, temporary and targeted response to the needs of our community and, obviously, the investment, the targeting of the investment in our schools and the building projects that have gone on there are very telling because they actually reveal something quite distinct in the, in, that differentiates us from those on the other side of the chamber, and that is a, re, a, re, a revelation of labour values, a certainty about investing for the future, a certainty about a positive vision for this country, and a belief that our young people have the best days ahead of them, not behind. The other thing about our values that it reveals quite starkly is our deep commitment to jobs. We understand that employment is critical for all Australians and through small businesses that have participated in the building of our local schools, we have made sure that hundreds and hundreds of local workers in the seat of, uh, the Robert, seat of Robertson have actually been able to continue to work their way through the time when we see all around the world stories of incredibly high unemployment. The flow on to uh, small business local suppliers has also been evident in my area. I want to speak to two particular projects. One is at Chertsey Primary School and the other at Greenpoint Christian College. I'd like to applaud the principal, John Anderson, who very, very carefully monitored and managed the delivery of $2.125 million worth of investment in that local school. And uh, I'm very happy to say that in that school uh, where uh, they have a class for deaf students and also a class for uh, autistic students, that those students with special needs had for 14 years been uh, attending class in a very, very old demountable building. Uh, one of the uh, assets that that school knew now has, in addition to the covered outdoor learning area, which provides a space for the entire community to gather, is new classrooms new classrooms that allow the their hearing impaired to do their learning and those autistic children to have a place in which they are truly delighted to gather each morning. I want to commend also Nada Potter, who runs the after-school uh, service for Chertsey Primary School and who uh, was responsible for the wonderful celebration we had on the day. In the time that remains, Mr, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I would like to acknowledge also the amazing work that has been undertaken by the school community and the architect and the companies, and there were companies that were involved in completing the, the works, $3 million worth of works at Greenpoint Christian College. Mr Wayne Parks offered wonderful leadership as the principal of the school, along with the Ellis family, who were significantly uh, drove the board to ensure that great value for the dollar was gained at this school. Now, as a result of our investment in education, in addition to 300 jobs that were, were uh, provided by this project, 
300 local jobs that kept our local people working. There are 1,024 students now who have a performance area in which to undertake drama studies and to share and use drama for a range of subjects. They have breakout rooms. They actually have 10 classrooms. They have an art room and a year 12 senior art room. All of these things achieved by the careful financial management of Jacques Mouton, the business manager, and his team of leaders in the school. What all this reveals is that we have much to acknowledge and celebrate. The workmanship of the construction centre, the vision and forbearance of teachers in the school community, and the leadership of the treasurer, Wayne Swan, who created jobs in our country when very few around the world were unable to do the same thing. Right. The member for Aston. It's an important issue that is affecting thousands of young families in our community, and that is the progressive destruction of three-year-old kinders, which is occurring certainly in Victoria and I believe possibly in other states. Yep. And it's occurring because of a policy of the Gillard government, which, like so many other government policies, has not had its implications properly thought through. The particular policy in question is the government's decision to mandate that by 2013 all four-year-olds must be offered 15 hours of kinder by university-trained staff. Presently, most kinders only offer 10 hours. And in practice, by forcing kinders to increase the hours of their four-year-old classes by 50 per cent, they are finding that they will not have the physical or staffing capacity to run their three-year-old kinder. And the result, according to the president of the Municipal Association of Victoria, Council, Councillor Bill MacArthur, is that we'll have a potential crisis in three-year-old kinder by 2013. The situation, of course, is exacerbated by the mini baby boom from a few years ago, which is already putting pressure on four-year-old kinders. Two-thirds of kinder facilities are owned by councils, and the majority are community-run. There are 1,200 in Victoria alone. In my electorate, I know that the Knox Council, who owns all the kinder facilities, is working through the potential crisis in three-year-old kinder. They predict that it won't have the capacity to meet the federal government's requirements by 2013. So it is left with a choice. It either breaks the law or it axes three-year-old kinder to cater for the extra hours for the four-year-olds. Some choice, Mr Speaker. You would think that the Prime Minister would be aware of this pending crisis. After all, she has been directly advised by the Municipal Association of Victoria that her electorate is one of the most at-risk regions for children to miss yeah, out. It is, it's an education it is time that she acted to fix this mess. So what needs to be done, Mr Speaker? If the government is to continue with this policy and force the hand of kinders, then it needs to do two things. Firstly, it should offer infrastructure assistance so that kindergartens can physically cope with the extra demands. And second, it should defer the 2013 start date so that there is adequate time for extra trained staff to come through the pipeline. Longer term, these small parent-run kinders should be given the opportunity to affiliate with local schools to assist them with their administrative burdens. I know that many of them understandably struggle with the financial reporting, the payroll, the legal responsibilities, etc. They should be given the option of being an independent, autonomous entity within the school legal structure so that they can get support for the administrative functions and enable them to focus on their core work. Mr Speaker, this government has overseen too many program failures. Pink bats, green loans, failed border protection policies, amongst others. I fear that its kindergarten policy will be added to the list. Mr. Speaker, there are thousands of young families who are counting on the government to lift its game in this particular area before it is too late. What are the questions? The House to now adjourn. The member for Newcastle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise uh, to correct the latest attempt by the Liberal Party to mislead the public and the constituents of my electorate of Newcastle on the impact of a carbon price. Over the past few months, the Australian public has been subjected to a tirade of false and misleading claims by Mr Abbott over the impact of a carbon price. 
Now it seems Abbott's mindless negativity has infected the ranks of the newly elected New South Wales Liberal government. Yesterday afternoon, the newly elected state member for Newcastle, Tim Owen, made a number of exaggerated and deceptive claims about the impact of a price on carbon in the Hunter region. It's not my, usually my habit to respond to every untruth peddled by the coalition um, in this important debate, but this latest attempt at fear-mongering cannot go unchallenged. Quoting Premier O'Farrell, Mr Owen repeated four times the fallacious claim that up to 13,000 people in the Hunter would lose their jobs if a price on carbon was introduced. Beside being misleading, this claim is at best alarming and at worst insulting to the intelligence of the people of Newcastle. To make this claim, Mr Owen relied on a discredited and outdated piece of research by the Liberal Party's favoured consultants, Frontier Economics. The same research relied upon, I note, several times by the member of Pat for Patterson in this House. The costings and assumptions underlying that particular piece of research have long been disputed. For example, the report assumes a carbon price of around $46 per tonne, uh, per tonne well above what anyone anticipates will be the price on carbon set here. But nowhere does the report assert that existing jobs in the Hunter will be lost if such a price on carbon is introduced. What the report does say is that jobs growth will continue in the Hunter, even modelled on the highly exaggerated carbon price of $46 per tonne. Yet Mr Owen repeated four times the false claim that jobs will be lost. In doing so, he used uh, his privilege as an MP to make exaggerated claims based on a report of questionable credentials to try to panic his constituents into believing 13,000 people in our region will soon be out of work. Well, I simply say to Mr Owen, that's not leadership. It's just fear-mongering, plain and simple. This is not what the people of Newcastle expect when they entrust an individual to represent and speak for their interests in the parliaments of this nation. That the New South Wales Liberals have turned to the divisive tactics of Mr Abbott, described recently, I note, by John Hewson, a former leader of the Liberal Party, as the master of the negative, may not surprise everyone, but it will certainly disappoint many. The facts in this debate are simple. Climate change is real. The evidence is overwhelming. We are already seeing the impacts of a changing climate. Human activities are triggering the changes we are witnessing in the global climate. As the Newcastle Herald noted today, the International Energy Agency has found that last year greenhouse gas emissions increased by a record amount and that an estimated 30.6 gigatons of carbon were released worldwide. The IEA advised that to avoid the worst effects of global warming, we must stop short of 32 gigatons a year by 2020. As the Herald noted, even this target is starting to seem impossibly optimistic. Rather than supporting a scare campaign over a carbon price based on questionable modelling, perhaps Mr Owen should focus his attention on assisting the many, uh, the more immediate concerns of his constituents. For example, the New South Wales Liberal government's decision to tear up its contracts with 120,000 households under the solar bonus scheme, households acting on climate change. But putting this episode aside, I restate my willingness to work with Mr Owen on areas of common concern to the people we both represent. Newcastle has a number of pressing needs that would benefit from our cooperation, in particular infrastructure priorities and encouraging the early rollout of the national broadband network. True leadership involves recognising when to put petty politicking aside for the sake of the public good, rather than perpetuating the mindless, incessant and negative fear-mongering that has become the hallmark of the federal opposition. The member for Kuyong. Hey, hey, hey. Mr Speaker, um, the purpose of rising tonight is for two reasons. First, I would like to seek your leave to table a petition. In accordance with Standing Order 207, I I rise to present a petition to you and to members of this House. This petition of concerned citizens draws to the attention of the House the closure of the Baldwin Post Office in Whitehorse Road, Baldwin, Victoria. The petition notes that Baldwin Post Office was located within a retail, commercial and banking precinct where businesses relied on its services. Baldwin Post Office provided a range of postal services to a large number of local residents and traders, including many senior and elderly citizens, 
and the closure of the Baldwin Post Office has caused enormous inconvenience to many in the community and caused economic loss to Whitehorse Road shopping strip. Shine. Mr Speaker, the 5,354 petitioners signatory to this petition therefore asked the House to urge the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy and the Minister assisting the Prime Minister on digital productivity to consult with the Board of Australia Post about re-establishing a post office in Borwin. I must take this opportunity Mr. Speaker, to also thank um, the Mayor of Burundara, Mr Nicholas Tragus, uh, his fellow councillor Dick Menting, the head of the Borwin Traders Association, Ian Bird, and um, my parliamentary colleague at a state level, Mr Robert Clark, the member for Box Hill. Yeah, yeah. This issue has been a critical issue in the electorate. I've received hundreds of pieces of correspondence, met with many locals who have been um, inconvenienced by the decision of Australia Post to close their post office in Whitehorse Road, Borwin. They have told me that this is not part of a rationalisation of their post offices, because I know many in this House, in their own electorates, have, have seen uh, community post offices suffer, uh, suffer a similar fate. But that being said, we really do need in this bustling post in this bustling shopping strip a post office that will stand alone. Mm -hmm. And therefore, while the news agency in Whitehorse Road Borwin has been turned into a community post office and it is providing some services, this is not enough. And we will bring every pressure to bear on Australia Post to actually open a new standalone post office. And I think this is a critical issue to the people of Kuyong. Mr Speaker, the other issue I wanted to briefly raise in the time allowed to me is the issue of the future of school funding under this government, in particular funding for, um, non, for non government and Catholic schools. Kuyong is an educational metropolis. We have over 50 schools, we, both public and non public alike. Over 30,000 school students every day go to school in Kuyong. It's our biggest industry and our biggest asset. It is, to draw an analogy, what the um, car industry is to Geelong or what the wine industry is to the Hunter Valley. Therefore, I'm particularly concerned about this government's ideological preoccupation with cutting funding for non-government and Catholic schools. Shame. This is not a new preoccupation. This is not the new, new Julia. This is, in fact, the old Julia. Because we don't have to think far um, and hard to the time when Julia Gillard was the soul mate of Mark Latham, when in 2004 he took to an election a hit list of schools, schools that would have been um, cut under, under this program in my own electorate, Camberwell Grammar School, Kerry Baptist Grammar School, Fintana Girls School, Methodist Ladies College, Wrighton Girls School, Scotch College, Trinity Grammar School. May I say, each of these schools are great educational institutions and are the home, and are the home for aspirational um, parents who send their kids. So this government's decision to not um, guarantee funding maintain, the funding maintained principle will see over 1,000 schools in Australia um, have their funding in real terms cut. This includes 13 schools in Kuyong, Bialik, Erasmus, Genazano, A Lady of Good Counsel, St Bede's Parish, Our Holy Redeemer, Sacred Heart St Anne's, St Dominic, Siena, St Joseph, St Bridget's and All Hallows School. Thirteen schools. Double the number of schools in Laylaw. No wonder the Prime Minister doesn't, doesn't, doesn't care. And when now that they're in partnership with the Greens, Mr Speaker, we can only express, ex expect a harsher school funding proposal and principles from this, from this government, which will be the disadvantage of all school students in Victoria and Australia. Order. The member for Chifley. Mr Speaker, my father's quipped that he was lucky to land in the lucky country. An immigrant from the former Yugoslavia, back then a multi-ethnic country, comprised of different religions and cultural traditions, friends who cared little if you called yourself Croat, Serb, Bosnian, it just mattered you were friends. Sadly, three decades later, this wasn't the case for much of our extended family and countless others throughout Bosnia and the former Yugoslavia. Between 1992 and 1995, the war in Bosnia saw more than 100,000 people perish, with about 1.3 million displaced. In a continent that had hoped it had closed off its darkest chapters, it witnessed new ones being written. 
bloody chapters scarred by haunted terms few imagined would be associated with a modern Europe, genocide, human shields, ethnic cleansing. One particularly heart-wrenching story is that of Srebrenica. On 16 April 1993, the United Nations carried Resolution 819 deeming all parties and others concerned treat Srebrenica and its surroundings as a safe area which should be free from any armed attack or any hostile act. Days later, the first United Nations Protection Forces troops arrived ahead of the demilitarisation of Srebrenica in early May, but by 1995 the enclave was under siege and the humanitarian situation on the ground was a catastrophe. Resources were so depleted even UN forces ran low on food, medicine, ammunition and fuel, and in early 1995 the mayor of Srebrenica reported that residents had started dying of starvation. Within days of the announcement, the army of Republika Subska's General Radko Mladic led the offensive that took the town. Images of the general taking a triumphant walk through the empty streets of Srebrenica will be forever seared into minds. The general knew what would happen next, Mr Speaker. Over five days in July, 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys were rounded up and massacred. It was Europe's worst atrocity since World War II. Mevlodin Oric is one of the few men who survived the massacre. In his words, we came out, they blindfolded us, and we were taken to a field to be executed. Get out and stand in line, they were shouting. Then I heard gunshots and I fell to the ground. How can a man not burst into tears? Why did this happen? In May 1992, Fetenet Alhirimoj and her then teenage children witnessed the execution of her husband in Srebrenica. She later saw her brothers and her father killed. According to her, they killed us like animals. So we hid in the forest during the day and went out to our homes at night for shelter. In 1995, Ratko Mladic was indicted by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia for genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. As the top military general with command responsibility, he was accused of being responsible for the Srebrenica massacre. But, Mr Speaker, the important thing to note here is that the ICTY indictment against Ratko Mladic also accuses him of genocide in nine other municipalities in addition to Srebrenica. Mr Speaker, I'm advised that the Department of Immigration and Citizenship figures for the period 1992-95 put refugee numbers from the former Yugoslavia at just over 23,500. Survivors from Srebrenica are also largest in numbers in New South Wales and Victoria. At this time, my thoughts are with them. Last week's arrest of Radko Mladic is a small step in the healing process for the families of his victims. It is an important step forward in the pursuit of international justice. It sends a signal to everyone in the entire world war crimes are unacceptable, and if you commit acts of genocide, if you engage in these sort of atrocities, you will be held to account. In closing, I'd like to reflect on the, on the words of Menira Shubashic, the president of Mothers of Srebrenica. Her words were picked up in the Walkley Award-winning SBS program Echoes of Srebrenica, first broadcast in July 2010 to commemorate the 15th anniversary of the massacre. The program was also a finalist in the United Nations Association of Australia Media Peace Awards and has been shortlisted for the Amnesty International Award for Human Rights Programs. In that program, Munira says, After I die, I want my granddaughter Sara to have friends who are Serbs, Croats, Muslims, Jews, Roman Catholic and everyone else. If we do not do this, if we don't give testimony, if we don't prove who the criminals are and who the good people are, and if the good people do not speak up against the criminals, then this will not happen. But to live in a ghetto, to live with someone and to hate them, and all for them to hate you, that brings no joy, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but everywhere in the world. I thank the member for Chifley for his contribution. The member for Barker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the comments of the previous speaker, the member for Chifley. I think they were very well-spoken words. Mr Speaker, it is vital that I raise the issue of the possibility of Asian bee destruction of the Australian honey industry, but also what effect that would have on the whole agricultural and horticultural industry in Australia. Presently, it is estimated that European bees, which are the basis of the honey industry in Australia, value add over $5 billion to our agricultural and horticultural industries. 
European bees have probably been the greatest import into Australia that we have made in the last 200 years plus. Conversely, Asian bees could be the worst import into Australia if they are allowed to take hold and destroy the, the European beehives that have given so much to Australia. Asian bees have come into Australia in a relatively small area around Cairns, and it is essential that action be taken quickly and taken strongly to eradicate Asian bees. For an industry that value adds more than $5 billion, then it's a no-brainer to spend $5 million a year for two years to eradicate the threat. There is a draft containment program ready to go. It has been designed scientifically and is supported and has the imprimatur of the Queensland Government. To give credit, the South Australian Government has been supportive of action from the start and other state governments are slowly coming on board. But it needs the federal government to commit to at least a Category 2 action but immensely preferably a Category 1 commitment, where an Australian integrated management system is used to eradicate the, the Asian bee incursion. Not only will the Asian bees, if allowed, have a destructive effect on European beehives, they will almost certainly transport two varroa mites into Australia. Australia would then become the only country in the world with all these bad insects and a poor pollination ability. I know how important bees are for pollination. Before I had the honour of becoming a, uh, their member for Barker as a farmer, I paid for beehives to help pollinate lucent for seed production. The lucent seed industry is a very important industry, and the yields are improved greatly by the use of European bees to help pollinate the lucent flowers and this makes the, loose, uh, the lucent seed industry profitable. Unfortunately, other industries will suffer the same fate. Virtually every grain crop and horticultural crop will suffer from the same fate, and we risk the $5 billion value adding that the European bee adds to our agricultural and horticultural industry in Australia. I also refer to the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Prime Industries and Resources report of the inquiry into the future development of the Australian honeybee industry tabled in May 2008. This inquiry transversed over the 41st and 42nd parliaments and is well worth reading. In that report, the committee in, recommend, in recommendations said that the Australian government commit $50 million annually in pursuit of biosecurity measures and research in support of the Australian bee industry and nothing has been done. At least 10 per cent of that figure should be committed over the next two years to eradicate the Asian bee incursion around Cairns. It also recommended that the Australian government, in conjunction with state and territory governments, establish and fund a national endemic bee pest and disease control program. It hasn't happened. This report made many more recommendations concerning biosecurity that haven't been acted upon, and we have seen the result with the Asian bee incursion. I call on the federal government to act and to act now before it's too late and we destroy our agricultural and horticultural industries in Australia, which we rely on so much in this country. We need to support the honeybee industry and make sure it's not ruined by inaction by this government. The member for Holt. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'll just start by also uh, commending the member for Chifley for that uh, moving, eloquent um, contribution to the adjournment uh, debate tonight. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, wish to speak here tonight about um, a particularly special organisation as a starting point called Christians Helping in Primary Schools. During Education Week, which ran between the 15th and 21st of March of May, sorry, um, I was pleased to visit uh, Chips, and this is funded under the government's Family Support Program. And the actual organisation itself is run by a very special individual called Eric Whiteman. 
Now, this is funded, as I said, under the particular um, government family support program, and uh, CHIPS is funded for about $84,000 um, over a particular period of time. And part of that funding, and the funding will be to assist a significant number of local families. Now, the funding is for continuation of programs run by CHIPS until the 30th of June 2014. Through the family support program, the government funds community organisations to deliver services like parenting skills training, playgroups, relationship counselling and post-separation uh, support. Um, CHIPS it also provides seminars for students, teachers and parents, counselling for children in crisis, programs for disadvantaged children in places like Listerfield Lake. It runs innovative programs such as Life Gets Better camps for children and their carers who have experienced major grief, divorce or loss. And there are many ways in which um, this organisation uses props, even like uh, bright and whippy, uh, uh, bright and witty puppets, I should say, as part of their program in conveying messages to the participants in a fun and understandable way. Um, it's all well and good to, I think, uh, Mr. Speaker, talk about these sorts of programs, but just to experience them just drives home the value of them. Um, I went down to visit. Um, uh, Captain Eric, as he's known, uh, down at his facility in, in Berwick, and just to see the programs that are running and the profound effects that it has on the children that they're dealing with really drives home the importance of uh, government funding to organisations like this and continued government funding to ensure these organisations exist and continue to provide these, these services that basically words can't really describe. And just as an example for, in terms of the number of kids who need the help of CHIPS and some of the examples of the work that's been done, we could talk about a boy that basically attended one of the programs whose family, whose family had forgotten his birthday. So basically one of the programs that was run, one of the exercises, was to actually have a birthday with this young man, who's a young boy, whose family had actually forgotten his birthday. Or, for example, a, a young man whose family life had been so abusive and so terrible that they, to give him an experience of what it was like to just behave normally as a child, he was taken to a farm just to sort of get his inhibitions out of his system and just to be able to communicate and feel safe. It's seeing these sorts of programs and hearing about these sorts of programs and the transformational effect that these programs are actually having on our children, our disadvantaged children in our areas, that makes the work that Captain Eric does, just an incredible um, tribute to him and the organisation that he actually runs. And in particular, I was, uh, brought, it was brought to my attention when I went to see Eric about a program that was being run called Life Gets Better in Action. And I actually was invited to visit the Hampton Park Primary School. And I was actually invited to visit a program that's been run by, young, uh, sorry, by this organisation uh, with a young lady called Ellie and a dog called Bailey's, who is a Groodle. And for uh, the education of this, this Groodle is a cross between a Golden Retriever and a Poodle. Now, this dog and Ellie were visiting Hampton Park Primary School, again, as part of this experiential program for young children in this um, particular region. And the incredible work that's been done through this program, and they said the transformational effect of the work that's been done in this program, is just the dog actually goes into the classroom, can discern children who are experiencing anxiety, depression, grief, loss, etc., and just spend time with them. And I had the incredible fortune of spending some time with one of the young men that was, uh, had been through a, a particular uh, grief experience and just seen how he's interacting with the dog. And it was just incredible, given some of the difficulties that I was aware that he experienced, about the changes that occurred. So to Eric and the program Run Through Chips, it's a great example of fantastic Order. funding going Order to the program. Honourable Very worthwhile well time. Time. By the member for Riverina. In 1945, Australia suffered its worst military training accident. An explosion at Wagga Wagga's Kapuka Army Base killed 26 brave men. For many years, this event was considered a forgotten tragedy, but now a memorial near the site of the explosion ensures families, the military and members of the public can pass by and remember what happened on that fateful day, May 21, 1945. Current Commandant Colonel David Hay has vowed that each year the memory of these soldiers will be honoured with a special service at the memorial site at 2.30pm, the time of the explosion. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order it being 10:30 p.m. The debate is interrupted. Order the House stands adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow.